Welcome to the Phillip Island Grand Prix circuit. It's a bit of a hidden gem in southern southwestern Australia, but boy, what a track it is. And today it plays host to the Ivor Endurance Series, the second round for the four hours of Phillip Island here. And what a stunning race it should be. Some proper, brilliant multi-class action is on your way. My name is Samuel Roda and I'm going to be joined by Arjuna Kankipati and Jonathan Burke in the commentary box. And firstly, Jonathan, what kind of a circuit is Phillip Island? I mean, it's something of a track that's a bit hidden in the iRacing service, not as many people use it. But man, when you come to drive on it, it's quite fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, Phillip Island mainly built as a motocross circuit and a sports car circuit, but really has not had an endurance race here, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the cars react. Should be very interesting indeed. Of course, Phillip Island is a very tight, twisty, narrow circuit, not what one would consider as the classic endurance racing circuit, but nevertheless, it is stunning. Here's a look at our schedule that we've got for this championship. Of course, we have the 12 hours of Spa around a month ago. That was the first round of the series. And then, of course, after this one at Phillip Island, we moved to Barber Motorsports Park, another personal favorite of mine. Then at Mid Ohio, then VIR, Imola, and Motegi. So it's a very diverse calendar spread across the globe. And the thing of it, Jonathan, in a way, it kind of goes to show that on the iRacing service, we've got such a diverse list of circuits, such a diverse category of circuits as well. And we just have all sorts of them. And Phillip Island is the best example of the same. It's not what one would consider to be the classic Grand Prix car racing circuit. No, it's very, very unique. Uh, compared to some of the other tracks, like you know, we said in October, we were at Spa, which is a four mile big track. What we think of as endurance racing, but Phillip Island's a little bit different. Again, built as a motocross circuit. So it's very unique and it's a very interesting thing to have on the schedule. Indeed, of course, regular fans of MotoGP may know a lot about this place. It's got corners named after the biggest names. Dune Corner, Stoner Corner as well, Lukey Heights. It's all, it's all in the history. And now we take a look at our standings because qualifying for the GTE Am has begun. And these guys are competing quite fiercely. And fiercely, speaking of competing fiercely, it's got fiercely forward at the top of the table with 127 points. Winning, of course, the last time out over here. But of course, at Spa, because it was a race longer than six hours, they had halfway points as well, which will not be a factor here today. But nevertheless, just look at the gap at the top, Jonathan. It's just going to be so close, and it will be the same throughout the season. Yeah, and again, you mentioned those halfway points being key. A lot of those guys that picked up big halfway points at Spa didn't seem to get a good amount of points at the end. So some of those big races are going to be key here and for guys that didn't do well at spa this is a good chance to try and make up some early points it is indeed it's a seven round championship of course we're done with spa we're here at phillip island and we are seeing the gte cars on the grid right now of course it's a, a challenging circuit to say the least it's got multiple undulation changes it's got fast flowing corners it's not the widest circuit in the world by any means whatsoever, but speaking of the GTE AMs and the qualifying session that we are in right now, what would be your, let's say, tips for a good lap around here? For the GTE, it's going to be, you know, making sure you don't overcook some of these fast corners. You have the southern loop, you have that wide final corner of 11 and 12. So it's, it's about going to be conserving the tires and then making sure that you're still going to stay on track. And then also, turn 7 and 8 going into Lukey Heights, it's a fast complex. And for the GT cars, they don't have much downforce. Exactly. So it's going to be hard for them to stay on track and keep... Exactly. It's going to be something very, very tricky for all these guys. Of course, you can see the timing tower on the top left-hand corner. Just giving you a good idea about where everyone is. And just coming back to the rules as well, 15 minutes for each class and we've got four classes here here today so we've got the gte am who's on screen then of course the gte pros then the lmp ams and then the lmp pro so that's going to be your four classes here today all of course gte cars so no gd3s in this series it's going to be mostly endurance racing ones so that's why we've got these bad boys bad machines right here 
And of course, the car that we are seeing on screen right now, the Fisher Motorsport 385, with the timing of 1 minute 24.583. Heading into the start of the session, Benjamin Fisher, of course, behind the wheel of this machine, but there is still a long way to go for this qualifying to end. 15 minutes to be precise. Oh, well, and the key thing as well, the, the Yimser regulations, every regulations state that once you head out on the track, you are not allowed hmm. to exit the pit again. So for many drivers that are already out on the track, this is their attempt, this is it. There might be some that are staying in the pits. We'll see uh, as the lap times go who's out and who isn't. But it looks like a lot of guys are out there right now trying to get as quick of a lap down as possible. Absolutely. absolutely. That's a very good point that you mentioned around here about drivers and teams not allowed to go back in the pit lane. So once they're out there, that is it. They've got to put their hot laps in one go. If you go back in the pit lane, you're not allowed to come back to qualify. And that's the one thing that is characteristic of quite a few of the Ivra championships that we've got here. And the club sport as well in the Ivra GT Sprint Series too. So they are trying to maintain this to be very, very consistent in all their championships. And that is exactly what we see here. And this is that complex, the Lukey Heights section. It's a blind upper corner driving downhill. And look at these lockups, Jonathan. How often are we going to see these in the races? And of course, in qualifying, the drivers are pushing extremely hard. But nevertheless... This could be a significant factor in the race as well. I think going up into turn four and then the last turn in Lukey Heights turn 10, you're going to see a lot of lockups, especially from the GT cars. But then the other thing to think about when we think about the LMP2 cars, we saw in Spa, in the, particularly in the bus stop, those slower corners, the LMP2 struggled to put the power down. Hmm. And with those sharp corners again, it, it's going to be a challenge, I think, for all the GTs. We see a GT car going off a little bit into the gravel, maybe trying to explore the little. <laughs> <laughs> and what's not to explore about the circuit? Of course, it is built, I think, southwest of the beautiful city of Melbourne. And nearby, you've got a lovely national park, quite a few wildlife animals and birds to watch out for. So I'm not quite sure that the Porsche was checking out that, but certainly having a look at the greenery around here, and there is quite a few, even if it's virtually. Coming across to the mid part of this qualifying session, still nice and calm on track. Of course, as we mentioned, drivers are not allowed to go back in the pit lane and come back for a lap because we've only got one shot. And what's happening to 385 here? Are they cooling down and getting prepared for another run, I suppose? I think they're trying to get a good draft, trying to, you know, warm up those tires. Because again, we have this long front straightaway, which is when we get into the racing action, might be the only place where passing is going to be good for traffic. So just warming up those tires, getting a good run, and uh, looking to make a huge charge. The 385 did all right at Spa, definitely wanted to perform better, but mm. it'll, be, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see. They're currently third in the championship. They were far down in the points towards the end of the race, but they got good halfway points. So yeah. well, hopefully this car will be able to put on a podium as we see it coming to the pit lane. Yep, 66 halfway points for Fisher Motorsport the last time out, finishing in P5 in the GTE AM category. But these guys were the big ones, the number 334 Fiercely Forward car, the AM machine. And Fiercely Forward on the whole had a brilliant weekend. One in class in the GTE AM and also in the LMP AM as well. So having a lovely day out there at Spa the last time out. But what's in store for them right here? Josh Clogg, the driver driving right now, well, He's a man who's done quite a few things on the iRacing service. It's quite impressive on the Formula 3 car, but from the looks of things, Jonathan, he does seem to be doing a decent enough job right here as well with qualifying in P3. Yeah, and I think one of the, I think one of the cool things about PLC Ford is it has a very good variety of uh, drivers. Jack Crawford is going to be in their LMP2 hmm. Pro machine, and he was also really fun to watch in the club sport. And for a team that started just this year, right before the pandemic, in January, they've, they've really made a name for themselves these past few weeks. They've won, you know, the, the AM categories in both LMP2 and GT at Spa, and then they have a club sport class victory as well to their names. Uh, actually, an overall victory after Road America, the 2.4 hours just a few weeks ago. So, exactly. this is a team that's really doing well right now in the Ivor series, and they're showing that they're going to be, you know, big dogs to beat in all the categories. Absolutely. Of course, the Ivra, the 2.4 hours of Road America race comes into mind recently, and that, that was a bit dramatic. 
quite a fun thing to watch out for, as are every single one of the Ivory races that we've got here. It's a lovely, lovely organization, the way they plan things up for multi-class racing. We've got the Ivory GT Sprint Series here on Racepot TV. We've got the Ivory Club Sport Championships, the Ivory Club, 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 Cup as well, I beg your pardon. And then the big one, the Ivory Enjoins that we are watching right now. So, multiple championships and they do... They do intend to create a big IMSA-like organization for sim racing when we've got great endurance racing series, of course. That is their intention and from the looks of things, they are doing a superb job at that. Coming back to Team Fiercely Forward, the last time out the team behind them was AOD Racing, the Ferrari 488 GTE. And interestingly enough, Jonathan, we've got quite a diverse field right here. We've got quite a few Porsches, a couple of Ferraris here and there, a couple of BMWs too, and more importantly, three Corvettes as well. So it's not like the teams have just concentrated their attention on only one particular car. They're all far-fetched out in this case. Yeah, I think that's something that makes some of this racing really, really awesome to see here in the Ivor uh, series is that there is such a variety of cars and it really no one showed at Spa. No one manufacturer really showed the pace. I think Corvettes were impressive. There was a Ford GT that was in mm. GT that finished in the top five, who I was really, really impressed with. We were all kind of rooting for in the pay box because it was the only Ford GT in the field. But it, it just go to show that, you know, the different manufacturers, you can run, you know, different things. And while exactly. the Porsches took the wins in both GT categories, the BMWs weren't far behind, the Ferraris weren't far behind, the Corvettes were really impressive throughout the day. And really, here, it's another track where the balance of power is going to be all right. We have a few slower corners, but we also have some long straights. A little bit of sections where downforce is going to be important. So, really, I think it's going to be an interesting race to see which car and which team prevails. Absolutely. That's the one fascinating element of GT racing that I love the most. Because if, when you come to think of all these cars, oh, as this machine right here has a bit of a spin. I think that was the EOD 322, if I'm not mistaken. No, that was... The German simracing.de car that had a bit of an offing right there. We shall quickly come back to you with a replay of that. But the one thing that really fascinates me about GT racing is the fact that we've got all these cars with different design philosophies, some mid-engine, some front engine, some rear engine as well. And the way they run and eventually just how close they race is just a testament to the way BOP works in the real world, the endurance racing categories. And they have replicated that to quite a good extent here on iRacing too and critically enough Jonathan from the looks of things officially there are no BOP adjustments it's just that the fuel capacity for the GT cars has been cut down to 90% but otherwise all the cars are just as they are essentially yeah there was an update before the season began reducing the BMW's horsepower just by a little bit and I think that that's honestly really really helped I'm a big fan of the BMW M8. It's such a fun car to drive, and it's such a very easy car to learn if you're getting into GT racing, which is one of the reasons why at first it was a D-class car that people were, hmm. you know, kept back into in a fixed series. But I think that this is going to be a really interesting tell to see who's going to be up top. And we see on the timing screen only one lap time officially completed, unless that is just a little bit of a disconnect there. But it'll be interesting to see like the various lap times from each of the teams. Absolutely, it's a long qualifying, 15 minutes for each category. Of course, right now we are focusing on GTE Am. Fisher Motorsport remain at the very top, the 385 car with a 1, two, one minute 24.583. And the last time that this championship was racing at Spa around a month ago, Fisher Racing, Fisher Motorsport were in fact in B number 5 in the Porsche 911 RSR. Had a decent enough race, I mean, there was a feeling that they could have done better, but this, of course, is another opportunity for them to come out and sh go all guns blazing. Live timing, of course, on racepot.tv slash timing2. We shall be posting the link in the comments so that you can get it a lot more easier. Now we shall just take a couple of minutes, I guess, and ride on board with Josh Clark. I think that'll be a good idea. Just take a listen and enjoy the flat six noise of this 911 Porsche.
So the cars are back in the pit lane for the GTE AM qualifying. Of course, this just means that they're done with it. Of course, drivers and teams cannot return from the pit lane to put in another lap because of the regulations. It just means that when you go out, you've got one clean run to put in your qualifying lap times. And look from the looks of things, the GTE AM qualifying is done. Once again, folks, welcome back to Phillip Island. It's time for the Ivra and John series round number two. The four hours of Phillip Island, southwest of the beautiful city of Melbourne. And this track, a bit of an underrated gem. Next up, we're going to have the GTE Pro qualifying coming up on track. And Jonathan, what are your expectations from this grid? Well, last time out, it was Team 11 that really dominated at Spa. But there were some... Good teams, like towards the beginning, Team Heischkefeld was leading away for a, quite a bit. That was towards the front, and there were some, like, no-name teams, like, down the order that were moving up. Quasar Sim Racing again in their 4GT was moving up the field and being very, very impressive. So, I think it's going to be a very, very open race. These standings are a little bit of a weird thing to see, just because Team 11 was so dominant. Exactly. From the looks of things, Team 11, the runaway leaders in this category. But if there's one thing that we can learn from every single Ivra series, is that there is no dominant force per se. I mean, every single team is just so closely competitive to each other. I mean, they're, they're all so close in terms of the gap. And what really fascinates me more is the fact that because it's an endurance race, and because we've got seven rounds of it, it's not over and done already. No, especially with those halfway points at some of the key events. The last race at Well Montegi, there's going to be halfway points. So mm. no team, I don't think, is going to be actually out of it. And no team is going to be, you know, struggling right now. And we're going to, like, I think we're going to see, like, some of the teams that are going to do well compared to some of the teams that maybe towards, like, the midfield as we're riding with the 211 of Team 11, who won out at Spa, who got the halfway points as well. So we got the full 150 and unfortunately for them, Club Sport did not go to their way. They finished down in the order there, but hoping to put on a good endurance show here. Absolutely. Team 11, as Jonathan mentioned, doing an incredibly good job in the last Ivra endurance round at Spa. And if there's one takeaway from this, this dominant Team 11 team that we are riding on board with right now, Jonathan, from that last round, what would it be? What? Why were they so good last time out? It was just being mistaken being consistent you know calm and nailing some of those key points you know I mentioned it at the first half of that broadcast that some of the key points were going to be the restarts after safety car periods the in and out laps coming uh, in and out of the pit road which were where some teams you know struggled we saw in the LMP2 uh, Pro category the 62 spin twice in the source after a restart and you're not gonna be able to do that especially here when it's the race is only four hours you're not going to be able to afford those little mistakes. And the little mistakes can come by so easily here, can't they? Because Phillip Island as a circuit, it's a classic old school one. It's, it's unlike Spa in many ways, or even Motegi for that matter. There is no runoff, there is no escape. I mean, as you can see from these onboards as well, if you go wide, you're in the grass. And from, from what we know from driving here, Jonathan, tyres and grass, not quite the best of combinations, is it? No, and especially those gravel traps as well. It's going to be very hard for drivers to keep control of the car. And you, you mentioned, like, there's there's a lot of tight areas on the way up to Lukey Heights. We'll see on the other side of the track, but it's very, very tight. And even going down here into the turn one in the southern loop, traffic management, I think, is going to be huge for a lot of these teams. We should also point out and note that pro qualifying and am qualifying do mix together. It's just kind of a quirk of the iRacing service, we're not allowed to separate different cars into different categories. So the AMs and Pros in both the LMP2s and the GTs will be qualifying together, which is going to be something key really early on to see if the AMs try and get out of the way or the Pros try and be aggressive early against the AMs. Mm, that's a very good point. That's a very good point because sometimes we do see AM teams, I, I wouldn't exactly say pushing above their ceiling or punching above their weight, but sometimes you start qualifying a couple of pro cars and that for the pro teams can be a bit of an issue because although officially in the classes they are not racing against each other in the overall fact in the overall battle they are of course pitted against each other so that that's going to be something to watch out for 
Riding on board right now with the Fisher Motorsport number 284 car, Pascal Thies is behind the wheel of that machine. And the 284, sadly, last time out, not having the best of days, finishing in P number 9 in class in the GTE Pro. So, clearly, lots of edges that can be sharpened now to get a better result. But in the case of an John Sway, Jonathan, it's pretty, pretty hard to be mistake-free. And even more so when you consider the cars that these guys are driving. Because these GTE machines, they, they don't have, let's say... The kind of sophisticated traction control and ABS systems that a GT3 car would. So naturally, they are a lot more challenging to drive in a way. And especially here when we have a lot of fast corners and the LMP2 cars have a lot, a lot of downforce. Some of these, you know, GT cars do not as we're now riding on board with the RSR eSport machine. Uh, another team that f did not do well, unfortunately, got halfway points, but did not meet the minimum requirements for driving time, retired at mm. Spa, but... The other team we were riding on with was the Fisher Motorsport car. Right now, looking like as it stands, we can't see the times, but we can see the order. Fisher Motorsport it has a 1-2, so it looks like they are bang on with their setups and hopefully log on for a good day. Hey. Absolutely. Fisher Motorsport doing an excellent job at the very top. But there's Maniti Racing behind coming through as well. Of course, it's not been long since the GTE Pro qualifying has begun. Still a long way to go for these guys, but nevertheless, you are seeing the early inklings for these guys coming into perspective. And you mentioned setups right there, Jonathan. And, and Phillip Island is a bit of a peculiar circuit because we it's not really the circuit, a circuit known for straights because the straight is only about 800 odd meters long. But nevertheless, there are multiple fast corners where you seem to need the downforce and then quite a few, few slow ones as well, like Lukey Heights in certain cases, the Honda corner as well. So... What kind of a compromise do you think will work best over here? You know, I think you're going to want to run a decent amount of downforce, but the problem is, you know, since this is a smaller circuit to Spa, we have 60 cars on track almost, that it's going to be really, really hard to manage that if you're right up behind a car and you get some arrow wash or you lose it, and right there, a big moment for the RSR team is it looks like it's a, either abandoning this lap or it's going more exploring in the beaches around here, but... It's going to be really key to see what these teams do for setups. I would run a lot of downforce, but my concern is being up so close to other cars, you're not, not going to get the advantage of it. Exactly. That's going to be a major problem right here today. Because with so many cars, around 60 odd cars competing here, it's such a tight and twisty, such a narrow circuit. Aero wash is definitely going to be a major, major factor for all of them. Especially when you have those LMP2 cars steaming past from behind and saying, Move away, you GTE peasant! That's going to be something very, very fun to watch out for over the course of the four-hour long race. Of course, watching the onboard with Maniti Racing right now. Johnny Wehoff behind the wheel. Coming across to the finish line and sets in a lap time of around 1 minute 24.897. Not bad by any means in P4 currently. But you do get a feeling that the Fisher Motorsports Amcar has done an excellent job right here. And another factor to consider here throughout the races, Jonathan, will be that just the fact that temperatures right here are going to be quite hot because Phillip Island, it's, it's located down under in Australia. And Melbourne is known to be quite a hot city in this time of the year. It's just turning out to be summer for them at this particular time of the year. And so naturally... Even with all the traffic and the aero wash, they're going to be losing our grip anyway. And they really factor in the fact that the track temperatures could end up rising as the race progresses. It's just going to be a problem that compounds for them. Yeah, they, they mentioned in practice uh, a couple teams that the temperatures were really, really bad. And, you know, we only have three tire sets, which I think is going to be really key for this race. So you get one to start out with and then two to change on for the four hours and with the temperatures as hot as they are conserving tires and maintaining that is going to be key another thing is this might be the only race in the southern hemisphere oh uh, if i'm correct yes yeah. Yeah, so it's the only race yes. in the southern hemisphere so it's the only race that this is going to be an issue with that with the hot temperatures <laughs> exactly. exactly because for all the other ones we are going by the real life calendar and for them November, December, yeah, it's going to be fairly cold, but in Australia, oh boy, get your fans out, get your cold drinks out. This is the time to chill and relax in the summer. 
And that's why for these guys, tire temperatures are going to be a significant issue. But it's going to be like hell for those tires right here. And speaking of hell, we've got the Hell Racers team on the circuit right now at P number 7. I think they are out here for their outlap and that's going to be just warming up their tires rather putting them in optimal temperature because you don't want them to be a bit too hot and now they're going to be going for their quick qualifying lap time right here through this fast fast first corner it's an incredibly quick one this the do one corner then for the long looping southern loop and Jonas Borden does have quite a challenge behind the wheel of that BMW MA GTE we saw in the club sport that the Hell Racers were a team to be reckoned with, but over here in the Endurance, they were just kind of in the midfield, and I think they're hoping for a much better result here. Uh, Jonas Bonden, the all-Swedish team, currently behind the wheel as he heads into Siberia now. Slow corner, and Siberia seems like a, a very narrow corner, but it's actually very, very wide. You have to be really yeah. careful on the throttle. And as we head on the run down to Luki Heights, the track swerves back and forth going up the hill and then this is going to be a key area right here you're going to uphill and then downhill into turn 10. turn 10 of course after lukey heights and then for the quick left hander at 11 and the long long run back up for turn 12 which will lead you on to the very very short garden straight live timing of course back up on the timing pylon on the left hand side and you can see the gaps and boy look at this look at this team Hersingwell the 28248 is at the top of the lap time of 1 minute 24.118 but yes I know we are speaking about the GTE Pro qualifying right here but what have Fisher Motorsport done because that Amcar only 3.36 tenths of a second behind which I think is quite an achievement to be honest Oh boy, that's the RSR Esports car. Ah, facing a bit of trouble with that sudden loop again for the second time. That's going to be a key area for a lot of these GT cars, that southern loop. For the LMP2 cars, it, it's going to be a very easy, easy corner. For the GT cars, you need to hold as much as possible. So qualifying for the GT Pros appears to be on the way out. Only a few cars remaining on the track. Again, 15 minutes of qualifying for each category once you're out you cannot return again we're here at the phillip island circuit the lmp2 cars are going to start making their way to the end of pit road and start thinking about their hot laps yep that should be a lot of fun lmp2s a lot more aerodynamically assisted in comparison to these gte cars completely different in their design philosophy they are born as race cars Prototypes, that's what they're called, LMP2, the Le Mans Prototype 2s, and man, such incredible cars, and what an addition it is it, to the iRacing service, isn't it? And ever since the LMP2, the, the Delara LMP2 car has come onto the service, it has just exploded, Jonathan. People are loving the car, and that's why in so many championships, like the Ivor Endurance Championship, we're just seeing so much of this car, and people just love it. I think it's a really big, as well, to the endurance racing and the GT multi-class style racing that we're seeing uh, having that LMP2 car out you can run it it's now an official in the IMSA series it's now official in the Le Mans series we're, we're seeing sports car and endurance series really exploding in popularity and really becoming very very popular and I think that that's great for the iRacing service I know like in some cases the GT series like at IMSA you know they only have six cars in some of their classes but here we have a full field of 13 and both am and pro it's a very interesting field and so many different cars and even the lmp2s we have so many of them so it's it's really interesting and cool to see such a popular car make this type of racing so popular and for for all the viewers who haven't quite got the chance to drive the lmp2 car jonathan what's it like behind the wheel yes in comparison to a gte there's naturally going to be a lot more confidence in the car with all the downforce but surely, there, there must be something special about this machine. The brakes are fantastic. You could probably make a dead stop going at full speed. Wow. You can really, really be brave going down into the corners, uh, especially in some of those sharp corners we saw at Spa, like going into the bus stop, almost last second braking decisions to try and get as much speed as possible. The traction control is useful. However, in a lot of these slower corners we saw again at Spa, it might catch a few drivers out. 
Um, so once you put the throttle down, the traction control kicks in, the back end might go around. But it, it's really an awesome piece of machinery, and it's so fun and easy to drive as well. It's very light, but it has so much power in the rear force. Like, you can stick to some of these wide corners. And, of course, the main area that comes to mind for that being a problem has to be the Honda corner, turn number four. It's a small, it's, it's a tiny, slow right-hand hairpin where in the MotoGP world you see a lot of the overtakes being made and that's going to be a key, key place for these LMP2s. But how much of an issue is tire management going to be here, Jonathan? With all the traffic, with all the dirty air coming into perspective, uh, and, and, for, and for the LMP2s that are specifically, how much of an issue is it going to be for them to conserve their tires right here? It's, I think it's going to be a huge issue. We saw only really double stint at Spa, and Spa was a much cooler, mm. easier day. And I think you're going to have to double stint here. You only have two to change on for the LMP2 category. So you're going to have to double stint, and you're going to have to be very really, really careful especially in the early going to avoid trouble and to avoid you know marking up those tires in any way again we do have live safety car which i think is something that, that yes it's definitely throwing a wrench strategy making right now is since this is such a tight circuit it is a much smaller circuit than spa some people are, are maybe doing the math and saying look there may be a decent amount of safety cars because the circuit isn't wide we will we'll have to see and honestly, that just throws every single idea that we all had about strategy up in the air. Because normally for the GTEs, they take around, say, an hour to pit. Then that's their pit window, around an hour, basically. But for the LMP2s, it's around 33 to 35 odd minutes, depending on how well you can manage your fuel. But now, when you consider safety cars, and that's another, that's another piece of information that you have to look at the regulations it's a very very complicated piece of appendix that one which we shall try to explain at best if a safety car does come out but nevertheless it's going to be quite challenging for them because if a safety car comes in at the wrong time and if it basically cuts the fuel windows or tire windows short that's going to be major major trouble for each of the teams and drivers to try and calculate the right strategy again looking at the LMP AM standings up on the screen it is team fiercely forward yet again leading this championship but the rusty spatulas right behind seven points away and then the lap sat racing team who we know can do quite a good job in gte cars as well but primarily jonathan if you had to describe the chaos of the safety car and what it can do to each team how would you put it what kind of an impact can it have right here it really depends on where it falls the stint as well it, it can really mess up and create chaos honestly in terms of the running order as we see the LMP2 AMs go out full endurance pit being used here so the pit road will come out into turn one but it can really jumble up the order and there'll be a lot of teams that have you know maybe some benefit to it maybe they'll have hmm. it's gonna be really really key to see how teams react to a safety car as well because what what are you going to do? Are you going to go into the pit lane and sacrifice positions on track? Maybe think about a new stint strategy? Or are you going to stay out and risk being overtaken by a bunch of guys in your class? Exactly. That's a major, major issue. That's going to be something to consider when we come to the race. It's a serious point of discussion strategy. And we shall come, that, come down to that. And what the safety car can do when, of course, we end up seeing that in the race as it comes and there's surely going to be quite a bit of that considering the nature of this track should be a fun one to watch out for once again lmp2 am category the qualifying for them is on 15 minutes for each category the gte ams and pros are done it's time to see what these guys can do right here of course it's myself Tom Harora here in the commentary box with jonathan burke alongside with me providing some excellent insights and arjuna kankipati will be coming in in around five to seven odd minutes he's doing something else and so we shall have a three-man commentary booth for the four uh endurance race but right now let's take a look at what philip island is like from the fiercely forward team's perspective it's time for a quick onboard lap of the philip island circuit let's take a listen this should be excellent
Isn't that a superb camera angle? Taking a look at a couple of onboard laps from the perspective of the Faisley Forward AM team. The winners of the last round at the 12 hours of Spa. And Jonathan, how good was their performance at Spa the last time out? They were so good. They were running up with the pros for a lot of the race. And it was kind of funny to see that the, the AM car was placed higher up overall in the pro car. So it was really, really good showing from the Faisley Forward AM team. And it looks like, again, they're having a good showing. Is look, they're all going fast as they're tens faster. They're on pole. The laps at iRacing team not too far behind. Unfortunately, it looks like a paint scheme here for them. Usually they have that yellow and black livery, but right now, just the, the default Ivor livery as we look back here. The 112, the Rusty Spatulas, who came in second further down the order, unfortunately, for them. Hoping for a better lap time, hoping that they don't struggle this weekend. They'd like to keep that second place in points. Yep, that spatula is nice and was nice and rusty back at Spa, but let's see, under the hot weather of Phillip Island, it's all that it just stays just about as rusty because from the looks of things, the rusty spatula is a fast spatula as it was in Spa Francorchamps, but right now, yeah, it's just not working for them in qualifying or they just haven't put in a competitive proper lap time yet. They do seem to be on a decent one in the AM category, Troma to almost Seppler at the back of that car. The LMP2 machine and tell you what, honestly, that look like that looks like a beggar pardon, an excellent livery. Very, very well built. And here they are coming to the third sector of the circuit. A tricky one down to Lukey Heights and for the final couple of corners. And then look at this lovely onboard camera. Look at how smooth the surface is here at Phillip Island. And th that surely, surely must send the drivers off big time right here. Especially in the zlmp 2s coming in, in these last few corners, you're just going to put the power down and just enjoy the ride. <laughs> Spatula is able to move up the timing screen, fortunately for them. Really early, early on in Spa as well, they weren't competitive, they weren't at that high up the order at all. This is going to be the Nomad Sim Racing, a team that struggled a little bit, had a few incidents at Spa, look currently running in... P2 with laps at, at racing and fiercely Ford sandwiching him. So, looking for a good race for Nomads in racing right now as well. They, again, they struggled really at Spa. They had a few incidents for the all British team. Exactly. Finishing in P number eight the last time out at Spa, the Nomad Sim Racing team and the Nomads, well, they've been moving about quite a bit. And here they are then at Phillip Island, finally arriving at a good destination and currently second in qualifying. But nevertheless, Representative lap times will keep on coming. Remember, 15 minutes for each class. We're done with GDE AMs, we're done with GDE Pros, and now the LMP2s are taking center stage. Simon Underhill behind the wheel of that Nomad Sim Racing car, and he's gone and put in another lap time. Nomad Sim Racing still currently in second place, but it is the fiercely forward team with the, let's say, generic Ivor livery. They are the ones still leading this category at the very top. Clearly, Jonathan, the gaps are not that big because we can quite clearly see the Lapsat Racing team only, uh, what, only around two tenths of a second behind the first default team and still in third place. This, this sort of competition, these sort of gaps, that's what gets you pumped up for a big endurance race, doesn't it? Yeah, and those LMP2 machines were very close and very competitive at Spa. There were several good battles to watch throughout the day, and even in the AM and the Pro category. But here we are at, at Phillip Island, at a very different track from Spa, and the gaps are still very low. So you see a slower car going there. The HD SimSport team had a bit of a scare, a bit of a scare. The 107 looking like he's going to put in a nice fast lap, but he's only three tenths off fiercely forward, and Really, the gaps are not that big until you get down to the eye liveries, pineapple racing, and rusty spatulas teams that seem to be struggling right now. Yep, not going well for rusty spatulas as it stands currently in P number 13. Not really putting in the best of lap time so far, 1.14 seconds. And yes, you might be the first to pick out and say, but hey, sometimes one second is not the biggest gap in the world considering how far fetched out certain championships can be in terms of endurance racing but at Ivra oh well things are a lot different here in the Ivra endurance series all the teams are so closely pitched up to each other that a second feels like an eternity and for the rusty spatulas team that will be feeling like an eternity 
And for the BND Racing team to look at it, four tenths behind from the leaders and nine positions away. Th this kind of competition is just insane, isn't it? It, it just is brilliant, to say the least. And some key thing to note here is that, again, it's a four-hour race. We're talking about just 15 minutes of hot laps right now. And I don't think the Rusty Specialist qualified well at Spa either. As we, ooh, <laughs> the PND racing machine getting a little little tail happy right there. He's trying to use as much speed as possible. So now we look at Pineapple Racing. We've moved up two or three places right now. Moved up into 11th. But also finished, you know, all right for this team. So I think qualifying is going to be key for track position, but... I think when the, the racing action kicks in, maybe some of these teams move up the field. Again, Rusty Spatulas finished second, and they, I don't think, qualified well at Spa either, so it's going to be, you know, all about managing the race. Exactly. With Spa, of course, a very, very different circuit in terms of the way it is built out. A lot wider, a lot more open. An FIA grade one circuit, that is, but at Phillip Island, those passing opportunities are just going to be that hard, and that just means this qualifying session that is going on right now means all the more for each of these teams and each of these drivers again lmp2 is the far too fast the categories in all the cars that we have here today they will have to negotiate with the slow gte pros and am machines but nevertheless for them they are fighting a battle within each other too and this battle just seems to be oh so close from the looks of things the eye livery is yeah after you so another thing to note here, remember, the pros and the AMs are mixed together when it comes to qualifying, so it'll be interesting to see yeah. where some of these faster teams end up. Exactly. And what, what do you expect in this case, Jonathan? Do you, do you reckon that we could see a few AM teams, just like we saw in the GTE category, just pushing hard and perhaps out qualifying a few pro cars? And that, that could lead to a few a grumpy pro cars saying, hey, I mean, you're technically not in my class and you're still disrupting my race. There was a bit of argument and disagreement on the Discord. They, they do have an official Discord for this team as we see the AMs pulling in and ending their qualifying session. But if those AMs get mixed in with the pros, they've been told the AMs need to get out of the way. So it'll be interesting to see, especially early on when they're all mixed together. Absolutely. Should be fun. Should be incredibly fun to see how things pan out. Again, multi-class racing, that is why we love endurance racing. It's not just one single category of car just pounding around the circuit again and again and again. Four different categories. So many different types of cars, so many different teams. And just the challenge of endurance racing. And yes, you might be the first person to say that, yeah, for sure, Endurance racing has just changed a lot. All the drivers are always pushing. It's become like a long sprint race. But no, on iRacing, things are a lot more different. Now that the LMP2 AM qualifying is done, I think it's about time that we take a couple of minutes worth of breaks. And we shall be back with the LMP2 Pro qualifying right here on RaceSport TV in a couple of minutes. See <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Phillip Island for the four hours of Phillip Island here for the Ivra Injorn Series. It's the second round of this championship. We had a lovely, lovely race, the 12 hours of Spa, around a month ago. And here we are back again to do things once more. 
Of course, we just got done with qualifying for all the categories and we shall be starting out with the LMP2 Pro qualifying right about now. And joining us in the commentary booth along with Jonathan Burke is Arjuna Kankipati. Arjuna, firstly, how are you, mate? And how's it going for you? I'm delighted to be back on Ivra commentary duties. I had another broadcast that I was just wrapping up earlier in qualifying, but I could not miss another Ivra race. I, I've, I've been on the commentary for about 70% of Ivra action just this season alone, so could not miss it, wanted to be here, and uh, delighted that we're here at Phillip Island. And I'm not sure exactly what you guys have all talked about so far, but LMP2 is about to roll out for their own qualifying in the pro category. There's a lot of intrigue around this one. There is indeed. Should be a fun one. We saw all these three categories go out there against each other. Have a fun one. But Jonathan, what, what do you expect from the pros? These guys are supposed to be the flag bearers, the big ones. Well, last time out we saw the geodesic racing team really dominate early on, but a couple key mistakes put them behind the eight ball a little bit during the race, but, not, but a safety car was able to get them back into the conversation, the Alpine Stars geodesic racing team. But there were a couple pro teams that were up there that were in the conversation. So I'm expecting a very competitive, very racy field. And this sort of racy action is what we like about the Ivor and John Championship. And we get to see this in so many different forms. I mean, we saw that in Spa and even in previous series and championships, even in the club sport category as well. That's the one characteristic thing about Ivor. That's the one thing I love. Although it's multi-class racing, it's always close, it's always competitive to each other. That's the one thing we like about it the most. But nevertheless, the cars are on the track. Should be an interesting one. And Jonathan, how do you put a good lap here at Phillip Island? How do you get things done properly? It's a tricky one for sure. But there surely has to be a way to just extract the maximum from the circuit. And it looks quite challenging. It's going to be maintaining as much of that top speed as possible through some of these fast bits. The southern loop, go the run down in Lukey Heights 7 and 8. You know, the final few corners 10 and 11 and 12. Right now, it, it, it's just going to be all about maintaining as much speed as you can to really nail a fast lap. When the actual racing starts, however, it's going to be about traffic management as now. The LMP2 Pros are released. They're taking the long pit exit down into the entrance of turn 1. And they'll begin their fast laps. Alpine Stars Geodesic already getting uh, a bit wide through that pit exit. And I'm not sure if you guys have talked about this yet, but that pit exit, all cars are required to use that longer pit exit. So it will be interesting to see uh, if we have any issues arising due to that. We see these cars making their way down. Guys, one thing that I'm not sure, again, if you've talked about this, but one thing I wanted to highlight as we start this next part of qualifying is the fact but last time out at Spa, we had the interesting proposition of the Pro and Am cars all being mixed together and, and the speeds being very closely matched across the classes. Now, especially in the LMP category, I think this time around it's going to be a bit more difficult because I think the speed deltas might be a little bit more obvious at a tidier, tighter and twistier track like this one is. And I think navigating through the lap traffic and for the AM cars, remembering that they don't need to fight the pro cars as they make their way through, I think it's going to be crucial and something that everyone has to watch out for. Yep, absolutely. That's going to be something. And even setups that Jonathan spoke about early on in the broadcast, that's going to be a critical one too, because we saw in the GTEs quite a few cars overlapping against each other. And we saw a couple of teams here and there just having an outstanding setup in both the GTE Pro and AM category as well. So that could be something to watch out for with the LMPs as well. So I tell you, you're just joining us, Arjuna. But in the GTE category, the Fisher Motorsport AM car, it was on pace with the Pro. So the, there's even more mixing in the GTE than the last time out at Spa. So I would not be surprised to see the LMP2 cars almost completely mixed together. And that's what I was actually just about to bring up, Jonathan. I'm looking at these GTE times. You've got the top two cars in GT are the pro uh, machines. But then third place, you've got the GTE AM. You've got fifth place in class. You've also got another GTE AM machine. So you've got a few of them mixed around. Be interesting to see what happens. Lap times are starting to come on the board from 
these LMP2 Pro cars. Take a look on the left-hand side of your screen. And a reminder for those who are new to Ivor competitions, in our Pro and Am categories, you can see first from the team name, they'll have a P or an A, depending on if they are Pro and Am. But if you need an easier way to follow along, take a look at the car numbers. 0 to 99, or that will be your Pro runners in LMP2 uh, Pro. 100 to 199, that's going to be LMP Am. 200 to 299, that will be your GTE Pro cars. Before 300 to 399, those will be your GTE AM machines. And a reminder, live timing and scoring is available for this event through our wonderful partners at Timing 71. Head over there to follow along with your favorite team and drivers throughout the next four hours of racing action. And look at those provisional times that have already been put down on the board. Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, we're watching them right now as Miguel Vigo works through turn number four at Honda. Just one hundredth of a second behind the provisional pole position time set by one of your LMP AM runners. Fiercely forward, 134 on that provisional pole position. Their teammate, the number 34 car, currently lying in spot number four. And they're about two tenths of a second off right now. So the number 34 ha has a little bit of time to find. But we must also say, guys, that once you head off of the pit road and start your qualifying run, you cannot come back down onto the lane and start... Uh, maybe take some tires, maybe take some service and get back out there. So it really is up on the pressure for these guys, Jonathan. One run and that's it. So one, one, one opportunity to really get your qualifying lap down. Yeah, we talked about it early on that it was only really one attempt and one shot to go as now Alpine Stars Geodesic leaps over the fiercely forward AM car to take provisional pole. And now we're starting to see the pros really set these lap times. Delta Sport U4K, who was a factor early on at Spa, didn't really get the result they wanted now closer to the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, but this was a team that had little mistakes at Spa, and the luck kind of fell away at the end with a lucky safety car that they were able to fight back, but this is a team that, you know, there was two spins in the source on the restarts, there was a few issues on the in and out laps, it's those little things that are going to make and break days, especially here when Look, it's only four hours, we, and we only have, you know, so many stints. And let's take a look then, as we work our way through this portion of qualifying, let's take a look at the format details once again then, because, well, a four-hour race, but a three-tire set limit across all of the classes, and with t uh, track temperatures soaring in the Australian summer, I have a feeling that each of those tires is going to get used and abused. So three tires, and that includes the set, the set that you start the race on. So especially in those GTE machines, as we see, I think that's the Pure Sims Esports car, finally heading out onto track for qualifying in front of the Alpine Stars car. Especially in those GTE machines, which no longer are going to be able to get to the top of the hour, that fuel strategy, especially with the safety cars, guys, is going to be valuable. And, and, and Sumo, we cannot underestimate how important it's going to be getting lucky because I, I think it's going to be... Uh, there's no way, let's put it simply, there's no way that we don't have at least one safety car throughout the four hours of racing action here. You cannot afford to be caught out by that safety car. You can't afford to be caught out already a lap down, having come down on pit lane. You also cannot afford, as we saw last time out in the 12 hours of Spa, you can't afford to get caught out on the last hour of the race when the safety car comes out when you're coming down onto pit road and a couple of teams, Pure Sims, the Delta Sport U4K team, for example, both got pit lane penalties as a result of being on pit road when that last safety car came out and exiting a, a closed pit lane. So I think the strategy here cannot be underestimated. And it's something that's so fluid and dynamic that I'm sure a lot of these teams have been trying to plan. But as we see Kinetic Racing getting very squirrely as they come towards the last corner, it's going to be very tough to actually execute on any of the plans that you've devised. That safety car just puts a spanner, throws a spanner rather into the works, doesn't it? It can just change things around at the earliest instant. And as you mentioned, Arjuna, especially in the last hour, at a race like Spa, when you've put 11 hours worth of effort down in, the 12th hour is the one we just want to close the books, come back home with a safe, beautiful car and take home that result. But then, then that's when you get the safety car and that can change everything. And yes, getting lucky as we see one of the LMP2 cars running wild and exploring the Australian wildlife in the background. Getting lucky is going to be a significant factor. And 
where exactly do you catch the safety car in your stint? Say, for instance, that you're not hitting your fuel numbers in the LMP2s, for instance, if you're only going around 30 minutes instead of 33 or 35, as you would normally expect them to be, and the safety car comes in right around that time. So although you are having a bad day in terms of meeting your fuel numbers, you could just, things would just play out in your hands. You could essentially get a free pit stop and you could be the one cycling back up into the lead. And the safety cars, the way things are administered here in Ivra is that drivers and teams often do not read the safety car regulations properly and end up making major administrative mistakes. And that can be an equally important factor too. So yes, it can throw Spanner into the works for every single one of those teams out there. They've just got to be lucky, A, and read the regulations properly, B. Well, we jump on board then with Talk Freak Racing as they come around the last corner to set their first qualifying time. There has already been race control verdicts, by the way. We've got a brand new graphic that I'm sure is going to get a lot of use in today's broadcast. There you can see the 107 machine has already got a penalty due to an infringement in warm-up and a tier 5 penalty, a drive-through. Jonathan, I mean, again, this was not even happening in the qualifying. So unfortunately for the 107, the HD SimSport LMP2 AM car, well, first few laps of the race, they already got a penalty to serve. Yeah, and they were pretty decently high up the order. They were fifth in their class, I believe, when the AMs ended, so that's going to be unfortunate. However, it might be nice for them if they just serve that drive through almost right away and avoid a little bit of the chaos, but they'll be back with the GTE cars when they come out of the pit lane, so that's... Oh, yeah. It, it, it's that, that, that one's going to hurt a lot more than, you know, on the track than it does on paper, because the drive through it's like, oh, well, okay, we'll just drive through and get back out, but especially early on, all those GT cars are going to be fighting early. Yeah, I think that battle on the first few laps is going to be crazy. I remember a, a GT3 multi-class race uh, that I was competing in once in the GT3 class with uh, some slower classes. I remember on the race start there, uh, too wide into turn number one sometimes works out, but it doesn't work out when the car on the outside decides to chop the nose of the car on the inside. That was the mistake that I made about a year and a half ago. We'll be hoping to have a slightly cleaner start here. No car is going to get shoved off in between the void that lies between turns one and three you got this long 180 degree left hand corner which is turn number two that brings you towards stoner corner and honda and this really is a very old school track not much runoff at all we're riding on board with the number one torque freak racing car currently sits 13th in qualifiers but just getting up to speed that was their first time lap that we got to witness and a few more cars still waiting to set some really competitive times. We've got the likes of Team RSO, which actually, one of the last cars to come out on track has already put themselves up into P number two. Look at that Delta as well. It shows on the graphic as being the identical time. I can confirm there is about a one hundredth of a second difference between those times as things stand. So Niels Benedict driving the number 97 right now. Qualifying, I think, is going to be important here, Jonathan, because when the starts are so chaotic and when traffic management is so crucial, you, you do need to make sure you have some decent starting position. Otherwise, you just lose a lot of time at the start of the race, even if you have the possibility of making that time back up with the safety cars. Yeah, being towards the front of the field is definitely going to be key. Although one thing I'm worried about is that since the AMs are mixed together in both categories, you know, the AMs are, and GTE are very, very mixed, but here in... The LMP2s, it looks like the pros will have these top five, maybe top six spots on track. These AM cars are going to be mixed in down the field. So it's going to be really key to see, like, how they start and how they really race each other. Like, I know they were discussing in the Discord and in Spa last week that the AM and the pros should not be racing each other. But early on, do they really have a choice? Well, a lot of strategic decisions then to make as... Three minutes to go until the race does kick off. And lots of action on RaceBot TV to be following along with, not just today, but over the next coming months as well. Excited to announce that all broadcasts done by RaceBot TV coming back to our own broadcast channel. So please go ahead. If you're watching this one on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell to keep up to date with RaceBot TV and all of our broadcasting adventures. Also go follow us on Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook. We do multi-stream a lot of our events, and that's something that we look to continue doing as we continue to grow the RaceBot TV channel. We're watching the number 14 for RLR, Abruzzi Esports, making their way 
around the second to last corner as they dive down then into turn number 13. They're all the way down in 25th as things stand, so not what the pro team would have wanted, but not the slowest pro team as well. We must point out that WS, uh, OSR iZone performance currently 27th in this class, 1.3 seconds off the leader, so there is a big gulf of performance, and it's good to see the pros and ams getting intermingled, and Sumo, we must say as well that these driver rankings that determine which class a lot of these teams are in are not final and will be updated come the end of this year going into the second half of the championship. So there is a possibility that some of these teams' lineups are going to change very slightly throughout the course of this season. Yep, quite a few things to consider when you, uh, when you decide how the drivers are ranked and categorized in this one. So we've got four different categories We've got Amber, Emerald, Sapphire, not four, but five rather. Amber, Emerald, Sapphire, uh, Amethyst, and Onyx. So technically, for each team, they've got to have a different mix. So this is essentially like their gold, silver drivers, like you have in endurance racing in the real world. And for each class, I mean, in the pro categories for both LMPs and the GTEs, you can have everything. You can have all Onyx drivers as well. And the Onyx ones are guys with I rating of over 4,000. The Amethysts are the ones between 3,000 and 4,000. Sapphire between 2,500 and 3,000. Emerald between 2,000 and 2,500. And Amber are all below 2,000 I rating points. Now, in the pro categories, you can have any rating, any drivers with any ratings, any combination that you want to. But in the AMs, for the LMP AM that we just had early on, a maximum of one Onyx driver and then a mix of either one Emerald or one Sapphire. That is the case for each of them. And there's something very similar for the GTE AMs as well. So quite a few things to consider. And yes, with the drivers changing their R ratings consistently, it's the thing is, drivers grow as the series goes on. And it's a long championship. It's not getting wrapped up in around two or three weeks. It goes on for a long, long time. And at that period, some drivers, they gain I rating, they lose I rating by a significant amount, and they can end up shifting in those brackets. So what Ivor has done very kindly is make sure that they're updated constantly so that there is no inherent advantage or disadvantage for each team as we go throughout the championship. And I, I think that's only for the better. Just keeping it clean, keeping it updated. And there is a little bit of, uh, not controversy, I would say, but one of the teams in GTM has unfortunately had to make some late, uh, last minute driver changes as a result of various uh, events that have unfolded over the last week. So for, I think that's the Fiercely Forward 334, they're actually running a driver who technically would not be permitted under the current Ivor regulations. But as he registered when his I rating was of a certain value, that does mean that he will be eligible for today's race. Checkered flag flies on qualifying then. Cars are allowed to complete the lap that they are on. So we're watching the number 61, Torque Freak Racing. Joshua Wolf behind the wheel of the Dallara LMP2 car as he works through turn number seven. He's actually going to abandon this lap. So I think that might mean all of the cars have left the track. So just a few minutes left. We do have a countdown timer before we can show you the grid. So grid about to be set but about to kick off four hours of racing action then jonathan let's get some predictions from you four hours of racing let's go with, let's go with an over under here number of cautions four over or under <laughs> i want to be generous and say under but i feel like maybe over maybe over maybe five it, it, it this is a tight circuit there's so many cars there's so many variables that can go wrong and we saw at spa there's so many little errors that could happen. The LMP2s could spin in some of these slower corners and cause a huge collision. It, it, it's really going to depend on how good these teams are at maintaining, you know, being on track and maintaining good pace and maintaining their car in traffic. Barney the Flagman vigorously flying that checkered flag with just 10 seconds to go before we show you the grid. Then Sumo. Quick question then for you. Over or under four cautions, what do you think? I'm going to say over. I'm going to go for six. And honestly, in the first hour, we're easily going to see around a couple. That's what I think. The way the way I've seen recent Philip Island, it's going to be crazy. That is a bold prediction indeed. But grid about to get set then. Let's go ahead and take a look then. At the starting grid, you can see we do have a full pace lap actually. So we'll have some time to scroll through all of the cars. And we'll start with the LMP 
class then. So for LMP Pro, Alpine Stars, Geodesic Racing, after taking home the win at the 12 hours of Spa, Miguel Vigo puts it on pole position for the 116.660. Niels Benedict just one hundredth of a second behind for Team RSO with Delta Sport U4K and TNT Racing completing row number two. Row number three, Pure Sims Esports, the number two car, and Paolo Munoz with Fiercely Forward, the number 34, lining up next to them. First car in LMPM then, the sister car for Fiercely Forward, the 134. Their LMPM entry starts from seventh overall with Hell Racers number 19 next to them. The second Hell Racers car going to line up in ninth position with RSR Esport by G Performance and Boris Evando on the edge of the top 10. Team Hoisingvelt, the number 48, going to line up in 11th with Nomad Sim Racing, an LMP Am car, lining up in 12th. Torque Freak Racing, the number 1, down in 13th with Kinetic Racing and Gabriel Roos next to them. Torque Freak Racing and Lapsup Racing Team going to line up on row number 8. With RSR Esport by G Performance, this one is the amateur entry in 17th with HD Simsport next to them. Do remember, the 107 does have a drive through penalty to serve at the start of this race. Team Vikings then and High Caliber Autosport going to be on the edge of the top 20 with Adequate Racing, N Race Esports, PND Racing and Pineapple Racing from 20th through 24th. A few more cars then to scroll through RLR Abruzzi Esports and iLiveries Vibe Sports 25th and 26th respectively with WOSR iZone Performance in 27th. And one of my favorite team names across all of sim racing, the Rusty, Sp Rusty Spatulas, lining up in 28th place and last in the LMP class. We'll take a look at the GT runners. And for the 248 Team Hoisingvelt, Jan Sentakowski will be hoping not to jump the start this time around as cars begin to start rolling from the start finish line with Fisher Motorsports next to them. The Fisher Motorsport GT Air Machine with a monster job in qualifying to line up in third position in this GT class. Maniti Racing going to line up next to them. Fuck Autotech Sim Racing in fifth. Another LMP Am car. Sorry, GT Am car. So good to see these Ams in GT really mixing up the order. RSR Esport by G Performance in sixth. Hell Racers in seventh with Team 11. Last time out, the race winner next to them. There is the Fiercely Forward 334 that's had a driver change. They'll be lining up in ninth with the Quasar Sim Racing team next to them in the only 4GT in today's field. No Luck EM Sport will be lining up in 11th with L1 Esports next to them. A second Quasar Sim Racing car going to line up in 13th on row 7 with VEC Sim Racing next to them. The Samba Racing team, number 15th with Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing and the Twitch streamer Jack Anderdeck at the wheel on the start. AOD Racing in 17th, VEC Sim Racing in 18th, Virtual Motorsport in 19th, a pro car starting well down the order. AOD Racing, the number 321, going to round out the field. German Sim Racing, the 301 in 21st place. Vector Sim Racing in 22nd with Usagi Racing and Torque Freak Racing on row number 12. Final few cars then, Phoenix Racing Esport. And then two cars that didn't set times, or at least one car, it looks as though that 26th place car... Uh, might not be the car that we expected from Fiercely Forward. That might be a registration mix-up. But Kinetic Racing, the 283, did not set a lap time in qualifying. They'll be starting at the very end of the field. As you see, the GT cars working their way through Siberia Corner. Tight and twisty circuit here. And it should be an exciting race ahead of us. See, LMP cars are making their way through Turn 9. Luki Sumo. I'll come to you for just a quick second. Miguel Vigo starts on the pole position here. Is he going to spin it at turn number one this time around? <laughs> hopefully not, hopefully not. That can be a real challenge with these cars, but well, we've got a quality field out here. If there's one thing we can hope for is not any spins, but it's for some good, hard racing. Pace car down and off into pit lane, leaves the field in control of the number 62 and Miguel Vigo. There is a start zone, so they don't go. On the iRacing.com green flag, they wait for the pace sitter, Miguel Vigo, to take the start. And away we go. Vigo with a good jump. RSO straight away slotting behind him as they fan out full wide in the background. That's the number 14 machine, I think. One of the virtual motorsport machines down into turn number one. They go. Vigo with a nice healthy gout up front. RSO as well fanning themselves out through turn number two. Let's look at... 
the GTE start as well because the team hoisting belt 248 going to get a rocket start. And Fisher Motorsports, the AM car, now has to defend as Maniti, the Maniti Racing GT Pro machine tries to look to the outside. They're going to leave the AM car to have the position, but around the outside potentially now for Maniti Racing. GT AM and GT Pro, two different categories, but they're sharing the same real estate on track as they make their way around turn number two. Back to the battle for LMP race lead. They managed to string themselves out single file as they work through the tricky infield section, and they've managed to get through the first half of this lap clean lead. You see them going two, three, four wide once again in the background. Absolute craziness. As we we switch back to the GT battle. Maniti Racing have managed to get around Fisher Motorsport in the GTM machine. And now that 385 looks to defend from RSR by G Performance. Absolute craziness here on lap number one. Seemingly, though, it's absolutely incredible, Sumo. We managed to have gotten through this first lap without any cars off into the gravel. As we now see Delta Sport, U4K, and TNT racing side by side. TNT racing around the outside of the last quarter. What a fantastic move from Paul Darling in the 81 car. This is the kind of racing that we all expected. Look at this, another move down the inside line at turn number one. But what's going on for Team Hersingwell? The number 48 machine, Peter Kema behind the wheel of that already seems to be slowing down. Was that a slowdown penalty that he got there on the final corner? Wow. Not, we'll take a look in just a few moments time. Battle for the race lead continues to rage on. Look at Team RSO applying the pressure to Miguel Vigo out front. TNT Racing going side by side with Delta Sport U4K. Christopher Hobinio with a fantastic move to get the position back down into Honda Corner as they look into Siberia. The fiercely forward 34 trying to get in the action as well. Lots and lots of action up and down your field as more cars seem to have had some issues. Let's see if we can try and take a look at some replays on the start then. And let's take a look at the race spot TV replay. So on the start, the first thing we're going to look at here is Yoni Waters in the Quasar Sim Racing Corvette getting pushed wide through Honda Corner. Easy to do and has to rejoin safely. Loses a whole heap of time. Let's take a look at what happened to the Team Hoisting Velt number 48 through the last corner. This is going to be pushing wide all by themselves just trying to keep their foot in it and they're followed through the grass by the Kinetic Racing car behind who is hard into the wall. Gabriel oh. Ruse was driving that car. Let's take a look at that one on board. But Jonathan, it kicked off at the end of lap number one rather than at the start like we expected. Yeah, it looked like he was he was trying to follow the recommended line that <laughs> the car Ed was putting down and just followed it too closely, not able to keep it out of the wall. It's going to be a lot of damage, unfortunately. Maybe even bent steering going to be really hard for the Kinetic Racing team. And they were all ready towards the end of the field. For the pro team, as we have another. Oh, the pure sims. Oh, watch the rejoin, going, boys. Cutting the daces. Oh. Oh, and an AM car going wide as well. Let's take a look at this one. I think that's actually the 34 that you're going to see getting pushed off the track when they see the number two coming back. So, no, you're right. That is, I think, the 107 potentially. The 134. No, so it's a, it is a fiercely forward car. It is an LMP AM car. Paolo Munoz off into the grass and forces fiercely forward to take the long way around. Let's see if there's any more replays to take a look at. One more. Racebot TV replay, Elvis Banello down into, ooh, down into Honda Corner, getting it very wrong under braking in the Porsche 911 RSR car, loses a whole heap of positions. And this was another one of those AM runners with a very impressive qualifying performance. Now slips to the back of the GT field. Let's jump back to live pictures though, because look at the gap out front, still only half a second. LMP AM, sorry, LMP Pro, the battle here is really kicking off as there's another car off in the background. Let's try and take a look at this one it's the vec sim racing porsche to get back onto track lots of action one more race bot tv replay to look at and this one is down into honda corner and deep under braking all by themselves and you can see their sister car the vec porsche in front of them as well getting that one wrong so we'll finally be able to take a breath now as we take a look at this replay once again sumo it's all kicked off and i'm glad that at least we managed to get through these first few moments without any safety cars coming out Yep, we expect a drama at the very top of the race, and we did get quite a bit of that in all categories, mind you. GTEs, LMP2s, everywhere. And you see a few battles going on as well with the RSR Esports machine following the strain of LMP2 cars. And where do they find themselves? Well, they currently are P number 14, the number 156. And that is P14 overall in their class, I would imagine. They are third. What's happened right here then? There seems to be another replay and oh my goodness me. Oh my goodness me. The 205, the pro machine running off wide at the Honda corner after a collision with another machine. 
So that's Dennis Rap uh, Rapakick and Yoni Walters getting together. So Yoni Walters in that Quasar Corvette getting involved in another incident. Jonathan, you noticed something. The 51 down onto pit lane, and I can confirm our first penalty has been handed out. Qualifying drive through penalty. The number 51 left pit lane on multiple occasions, and as a result, drive through penalty in the first few laps of the race. It's a shame for that team. They really did not have a good outing at Spa at all. And they were probably hoping for a much better outing here as the Battle RSO, you know, seemingly being able to keep in touch with the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing team. Last time out at Spa, the 62 car was the car to beat and pretty much gaffed the field, but this 97 is not letting them get away. Well, let's, uh, let's tell the full story of the 12 hours, of, 12 hours of Spa. What an eventful race it was for Miguel Vigo. Uh, led and dominated the opening portions of the race. Two safety car restarts, though, and two different occasions on which Vigo lost it from the race lead down into last source. So two separate spins for Vigo on caution restarts from the race lead. Is he going to be able to hold on to it this time around? As uh, I don't know if you guys watched much of the second half of the race, guys, because we were on the call for the first six hours. But the only reason why that number 62 took the race win last time out was... A late race safety car. Right now looking much better though for Vigo Sumil as he works the opening 10 minutes of the race. He does have RSO right behind him, but they managed to pull out a 1.9 second advantage right now to the Delta Sport U4K car behind. Yeah, a bit of a bit of a torrid weekend for Miguel Vigo the last time out, but now seems to be going well for them right here. Of course, that battle for the lead is closing up and Vigo is under pressure from Nils Benedict in be from behind in that RSO 97 machine. And that's the one thing that I love about these guys. That even at this stage of the race, they are pushing hard, pushing the limits. And the same, well, the same can be said in the GTE category for one of the cars. Because the team Hersing 12 Pro Machine, the 248, has just created an outrageous gap early on. 2.8 seconds at the very beginning of Arjuna and that yes we did see Team Hersingwell do an incredible job in the 24 hours of Spa as well that was organized by Mulder Motorsport a couple of moments a couple of weeks ago but nevertheless they are doing an epic job right here absolutely and doing a good job not to jump the start this time around and get a drive through penalty right off the bat battle for the race league continues to rage on though it's not to say there aren't battles up and down through this field right now they haven't started intermingling with traffic just yet but you can see here two of the hell racers cars lying in sixth and seventh in a in a row right now boris Vando for rsr by g performance looking to apply some pressure and move his way up in towards the top five you can see other battles as well here got the torque freak racing number 61 trying to get past laps at racing team this is a pro trying to get past an am car and this is one of those difficulties that we talked about where these cars aren't fighting for points they are just fighting for track position i wonder if 61 car may be looking to try and get past the 169 at some point more battles going on it must also be said milo limford has just been passed uh on a few laps ago by uh, the N-Race Esport and the PND car that are now doing battle for 16th and 17th place. And PND Racing, obviously one of those AM teams that had a very strong run last time out at Spa. This is where the AM drivers maybe struggle a bit at the more technical circuits where sometimes setup can be more of a challenge to actually get right. But they work their way in towards Lukey Heights just three tenths of a second separating these two drivers right now. There are lots of close battle packs here with the LMP class right now. And then we saw, on the, uh, when we were watching the leaders for the pros, though, that traffic is coming, and it's coming quickly. And oh, and here it they're is. They're already in it, as it looks like the RSO car is going to go down the inside into turn one. Who is going to be braver oh. going down to the oh, first three corner? Wide. Dude, like there's a Porsche on the outside, <laughs> and they're still side by side. RSO going to try and hang it around the outside, get the run down into Honda Corner, but on the inside, that shorter distance from Miguel Vigo able to work out. They almost managed to make contact as they went three wide through turn number one. That was risky, but right now, Benedict with all sorts of pace behind Vigo. Vigo down the inside of the Kinetic Racing GTE trying to put a lapped car between him and the number 97 as they work towards Siberia Corner. This is this is cambered in, but also cambers off on the exit, so it's difficult to get the power down as there's been a crash. Boris, Boris Evando around at Honda Corner. What has happened here? You can see one of the Hell Racers car also involved, and Boris Evando is stopped and stationary, waiting to get back out on track. 
All hell has broken loose, hasn't it, at the Honda corner for the LMB2 machine right here. We take a look at this replay that's come up on screen here. So all beautiful, lovely, clean action between the traffic until the 55 just comes in through. Okay, still all right. Ooh. Boop from behind, lost his braking and that could just come down to the track temperatures. The grip is just running out and these guys under the pressure of all the traffic and racing against each other while you have slower cars around you, track temperatures are hot and you could just end up losing your braking point and this happens. And that was the Hell Racers number 29, Marcus Simonson in front that got collected and had to also make his way back onto the track. Fortunately, he was able to rejoin a much more expedited fashion than the number 55 who had to wait for an eternal age to get back onto the track at Honda. Let's jump back to live pictures because they're still in traffic for the race lead and we want to try and focus on other battles that are happening as well but right now this battle for the race lead through traffic is really heating up. Down the inside one of the BMWs as they work in towards Lukey Heights around the outside RSO is going to have to go and set themselves up for this long left hand sweeping corner. And Jonathan, we actually commentated on a race here together uh, a few months ago now as the caution flag is out. Caution flag has flown within 10 minutes. So a very early caution here. Trying to figure out exactly who that is on my timing screen. But we talked about early race cautions and Sumo, you may have been right. We may see two of these in the first hour. I think I might have identified what has brought out the caution. Let's take a look at the RaceBot TV replay then for... The number 48, Team Hoisingveld. As they head down in... Oh, no, there's a car oh. on its roof. There, that is a disaster for one of the LMPM cars, I think. We'll try and get another look at this one, but I can't figure out who that is right now. I think it's the 182. 182, the PND machine. We were just talking about them. So we'll take another look at this one. You can see, yes, you're right. That is the 182. Trying to go around the outside as the N-Race Esports... Machine looks to the inside of the corner, and that's an unfortunate one. We'll take another look at this one in maybe slow motion, try and ride on board with PND Racing. As we can see, last time out, they won, I'm pretty sure, LMPM. And now, well, on their roofs, the safety car is out, but not looking like it's going to be the same result. Here we go. Take a look at the replay. N-Race Esport down the inside and just turns. Team Hoisting Velt 48 and... Stefano Conte now up and on his roof. He's had to reset down on the pit lane. And, well, safety car is out for the first time today. Yeah, it's unfortunately not a very good place to sunbathe right there. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Oh, well. Yeah, no, that is amazing indeed. And, um... Uh, oh, no, don't... Don't tell me this has happened again. Don't tell me this has happened again. Come on. Well, watch, oh the, boy. watch the graphic up on your screen right there. You'll see 248 Tier 2 warning. Jan Sentkowski in the Team Hoisting Velt 248 has once again been given a warning for misunderstanding the start zone rules. And Sumil, he'll just be very, very glad that that is not another drive through penalty and maybe a bit of leniency coming in from race control here. They saw what happened last time, maybe some confusion across some of the drivers further back in your field as well. That 248 car, very, very lucky to not put themselves in a hole early on in this one. Exactly. We know for a fact the team Hersingwell has potential. We know they can do big things and they can be a major flying the ointment for all the other teams around them. But penalties like this, small incidents like this and just missing out on your marks and not doing things correctly in the administrative things can be a major issue for them as now the crucial thing is the pit lane is closed and i think arjuna this is the perfect time to go on explaining the wonderful safety car procedures that we've got here it's a long appendix this in the regulations it is a long appendix and i tell you what sumo you volunteered very kindly to uh to run us through that before we take a look at that let's take a look at another replay as we are under safety car this was for the 131, Milo Limford for High Caliber Autosports around the outside of turn number two. He loses it by himself, but let's watch the rejoin here because it takes him a long time to get this one figured out and pointed back in the right direction. You'll see him as he uh, comes to a stop for a second there and not sure exactly what he's waiting for. A nice sunbathe, like you were saying, Jonathan, in these warm temperatures, but spinning up the tires, trying to get back onto track. Fortunate not 
to a beach that car as you see some technical issues and Limford finally struggles back onto track. But Sumil, explain for us then these rules. Okay then, this is going to be fun. This is going to put all my reading that, that's happened early on this afternoon into test. So, what happens is, when we get a safety car, the pit lane is essentially, and not essentially, it actually is closed. Right, now normally in this case, we have two caution laps, and for the first one, the pit lane will be closed by eye racing. But, when the lights on the safety car that you can see right now go out, eye racing opens up the pit lane. Now, the thing with this is, the iRacing regulations and the Ivra regulations are slightly different. Ivra wants to make sure that, essentially, because we have multi-class multi racing that nobody gets caught out, the iRacing regulations are fine when it comes to one category. So, what happens is, the Ivra live stewards will be administrating this, and they'll be opening up the pit lane with one lap to go, and if, if everyone is not gridded up properly, if, if all the cars are, let's say, between each other, because the safety car is supposed to lead the overall leader. And say if there's a GTE car or an MP2 AM category driver that's between them, then those cars will be given a wave off. So they'll be told to rejoin the back of the pack and they'll be led away. And then once all the cars are in the train properly, that is when the pit lane opens. So as you can see right now, this is not when they can pit. They can only pit when everyone is back on track in the line and then race control, not eye racing, not the iRacing notifications that come up on the top left-hand corner, but only when the race control tells them to pit. And well, when the pit entry is closed, and if the drivers do pit, oh boy, you could expect, let's say, a bit of a hefty penalty coming through, just like an elephant falling on your back, essentially. And that's what happened to the Pure Sims and Delta Sport U4K teams last time out in the 12 hours of Spa, with just 30 minutes to go or so, safety car came out, Fortunately, those cars did have to dive down onto the lane. Didn't have enough fuel to make it an additional lap. Had to take an end-of-line penalty drop to the back of the safety car queue on the restart. And that put a uh, put the uh, the pin in the balloon for their chances of taking the race win. Uh, Delta Sport U4K, by the way, still running in third right now. So, much better this time around. They'll be hoping not to make the mistake off of pit lane, which they did in the first round of safety cars last time out, and, and leave a closed pit lane. More difficulties that befell the number 33 last time out. We're riding on board then with the iRacing.com pace car. A great backwards look at this, at this entire field as they trundle around as a very pedestrian 100 kilometers an hour sumo. And the thing with the safety car regulations is as well that thankfully it has come pretty early. It's not really impacting anyone's strategy per se because it's not come between the pit window for any of these cars. But just to clear this off early on as well, in case that does happen and in case somebody is in the pit lane, well, if, if you're actually doing your service, the pit exit will be open so you'll be allowed to leave. But if you're diving towards the pit lane and if you, if you haven't taken your service yet, then... You, don't, you are not supposed to take your service. You only have to do a drive-through and then take your service the next time out when you're actually allowed to enter. Thankfully, that hasn't happened. But remember, this could seriously impact the race big time. Well, and it also shakes up strategy that much, that much more because three tire sets throughout this entire four hours of racing, that includes... The four tires that they start this race with. So only two tire changes going to be permitted in today's race. Let's take a look at the track conditions as things stand under caution. There you can see it's a very cool 18 degrees in terms of the air temperature, guys. But Jonathan, that track temperature, 42 degrees Celsius. We are in the middle of the virtual Australian summer, as it were. But that is going to be something that these teams are concerned about. And I've, I've seen some projections. I'm not going to disclose numbers because... We do appreciate the team sending us uh, strategy details and things like that. It very much helps us here in the booth. But a lot of teams have been doing practice runs, trying to understand the tire fall off in the second and third stints. And I have a feeling we are unlikely to really see too many teams trying to attempt a triple stint on tires here. No, and I think these safety cars are really helpful in terms of conserving that tire wear. Because again, you mentioned 42 degrees Celsius, like you can... That's a very, very toasty track, and it's a beautiful day outside, obviously, in this lovely summer here at Phillip Island. But on the track, it is uh, hot as can be. 
So it's going to come down to like just conserving the tire wear and conserving, you know, when you take those tire changes as well. What's happened under caution here? I see a car has gone off the track. A 322. Oh. That is AOD racing in their BMW. Fortunately, guys, I was about to say, um, we've been on commentary duties, uh, the three of us now, for a total of about, I would say, 12 hours of Ivor competitions. We started with the six hours. First six hours of the 12 hours of Spa. We also broadcast the first round of the Ivor Club and Club Sports Series. And in both of those series, we saw instances of cars managing to wreck themselves. Not just lose it like the AOD BMW does here, but wreck themselves into the tire barrier under caution. Fortunately here for Albert Jones, his slight mix up there and slight lapse of concentration hasn't cost uh, any type of damage that needs to be repaired in the pit lane. I, I mean, it's just so basic. I, I don't want to sound negative again, but this is something unique to Ivory Series, something that a lot of these drivers haven't had to deal with before. And I think as a result, we are seeing a few of these mistakes under caution that we don't usually expect to be seeing. Yes, sometimes it can just be the pressure coming up to you. I mean, I, I know that I've made silly mistakes while under caution in I racing. Just, just making a mistake, losing the breaking point, because sometimes, I mean, who knows, your focus is somewhere else. You're trying to grab a sip of water at times in this period because you know that all hell is going to break loose when you go green. And, well, the next thing you know, you're on the grass, your car is spinning wide. And, yeah, I mean, you can't do a Kimi Raikkonen and rush off to that luxury yacht in the background like Monaco but nevertheless you could end up compromising a race just with a slight lapse of concentration even if you're under the safety limits of the safety car speed limits I beg your pardon well safety limits as well I mean uh who can forget that very very scary and dangerous clip of, of Lance Stroll in that last safety car period at the uh oh, yeah. Emilio Romagna Grand Prix which I'm sure I butchered the name but lights off on the pace car then we're about to get racing once again here at Phillip Island Field, once again will be in control of the number 62 and Miguel Vigo. As they come through the last corner. When is Vigo going to decide to go? You can see all of these LMP cars in a long queue of cars. We await the arrival then of the field. On the start finish line, Vigo goes very early in the background as well. You can see one car going wide. That's Pure Sims on the inside going slow as we thunder down into turn number one as well. They're fanning out two, three wide across the start finish line as the GT cars as well in the background get going once again down into turn two then. The top three cars all strung out single file. Let's take a look at GTE as they make their way into turn one. Sentakowski for 248. Once again, trying to build up that lead from the Fisher Motorsport GT Pro. The Fisher Motorsport GTM machine, by the way, is having to fight it out with the Team 11 GT car down in sixth place in this overall class, but leading GTM for the number 385 Fisher Motorsports. They've got the Fiercely Forward team right behind them, though, so they might not want to let the Team 11 Porsche through in any sort of hurry. We'll jump back then to the LMP cars because they managed to get through here. I'm just taking a look at my timing screen as well here, Sumo. It does look as though somehow PND Racing and Stefano Conte, after being upside down, are back out on track and looking to make up a few positions. Well, this must be quite the recovery in that case if they are coming back oh so quickly. Remember, nobody going to the pit lane in that particular case, but nevertheless, for them, it has worked out quite well, but we do seem to have one car on the lane. It's the number 83 of Gabriel Roos, the Kinetic Racing Velocity team, who does seem to be on the pit lane. So that's going to be one thing to watch out for. But nevertheless, gaps are closing. And now look at this battle coming up towards the sudden loop. Isn't that an alluring sight? Cars coming up from the Dewan corner straight into the sudden loop. And look at them, how viciously they change direction. That is why we have LMP2s. That's why we love them. Just the sheer amount of speed. And now the GTE machines coming through. And the team hosting Bell car, well, still a bit of a gap. But nevertheless, that impending penalty still looms large. Well, the good thing is it's been confirmed. Not a penalty for the 248. Just a warning. And Sentakowski mm. will be very, very grateful that that has not resulted in another issue. An issue, by the way, for that kinetic racing velocity car, Gabriel Roos, something has happened to him down into Honda Corner. He's all the way back at the end of his class, already down a lap from the leaders. Let's take a look then at the Race Spot TV replay. What happened on this incident? They're fighting with the 107 car in front. That's the HD Sim Sport around the outside. Looks kinetic racing. 
just go a bit deep under breaking, trying to squeeze HD Simspot. And you see behind them as well, lucky to not get collected there in that one. As we jump back to the live pictures and we jump back to the battle for the race lead because that gap between the top two cars has hold, held fairly firm. But interesting thing here is you watch the number 34 behind closing in as well. There's four cars now in a, with a shout of the race lead. All right, so getting a big draft down that front straightaway, and he's looking to the outside, looking inside, trying to find a way around the Geodesa car before they hit traffic, because that's really where things got dicey for both of these two. I think it's going to be key. Whoever gets the lead before traffic, I think, is to be the leader for at least getting through that traffic. So LMP2 leaders down into the Honda corner then, while the GTE car is going through turn number one for the first time. An issue in that class seems to have happened for Ryan Littlemore. Trying to see exactly where he is on track. He was stopped for a period of time. One of the Team Vikings cars has had an issue as well. Let's take a look at that RaceBot TV replay and they, as we try and just ascertain exactly what's happened out on track. Here you can see the tail end of that incident as Aralara Bootsy oh, Esports gets sent oh. around from behind and you can see another car mounting the inside of the track there. Let's take a look further back in Sumo. Let's try and unco uh, uncover what happened here. Nasty, nasty incident for the Abruzzi car. We take a look at the replay once again. So this has to be something a bit serious. Right, so that's the final corner. Right, they go pretty clean out there. And does he tag? Oh, he gets tagged from behind. He gets tagged from behind by that is that the fiercely forward car with uh, with the ivory livery right there? I think it has to be. And just that final corner can be perilous at times because you can take so many different lines through there. And the fiercely forward car must be carrying in so much more speed. Take a look at their onboard. There's the P&D racing car. My apologies. They look a bit similar here today. Now, that's just some technical issues we're having oh, up right. here in the booth. It was Team Vikings, the 102. You can see the checkup in front of them. And Martin Thielgaard, nothing he could do, as you see. Jumping over that little bit of terrain there. That won't have helped the underside of his car. And unfortunately for both of those cars, they've fallen through the field. We'll jump back to live pictures, though, as... We see that car struggling because they're working their way up towards traffic now through Lukey Heights and turn 11 they go. Coming to uh, finish another lap, the GTE leaders just funneling their way down through Honda Corner. So give it about three laps time here, Jonathan. And like you say, I think whoever's in front come that traffic will need to be defending hard from behind because we did see the RSO team having a few opportunistic looks there through traffic the last time around. Yeah, that's going to be key for, I think, to see, you know, if they can gap the field when getting through traffic. And I think something that we haven't really talked much about here, like the GT cars are not going to go as fast as these LMP2s around here because there's so many wide corners and there's so many places where the LMP2 car can be flat out and the GT is going to be dancing on the edge of the racetrack. So they're going to catch this traffic quick and it's going to be a matter of where they catch them. As we look at here at the Fisher Motorsport car, gap to Pineapple Racing. The Fisher Motorsport is in that second position in class, the Heiskopfeld car still a little bit ahead, and he's going to have to defend from the Mantini racing machine right behind. Yeah, you see gap to Team Heusingveld, 248, 1.8 seconds as things stand. So Jan Sentikowski putting that potential penalty in the back of his mind and getting back to the business at hand. You can see this battle then on screen for second and third as Mini-T Racing in the 278 closes down the Porsche 911 RSR for second place in this class. Still waiting for the traffic to become a factor, though. As the LMP leaders coming around the last corner once again as we follow the second place car in class. So give it about three laps time. That's what the estimate up here is. We should point out as well, guys, there were a few cars that did come down the pit lane on that caution. And what does that mean? Well, it just puts them in a position, potentially, of being on a slightly different fuel strategy. The cars that we're talking about, the 105, Pineapple Racing, the only car in LMP to come down the pit lane. But in GT, we've got a few cars. German Sim Racing, the 301, down onto pit lane. The Quasar Sim Racing car, the Ford, down onto pit lane. The 225, also down onto pit lane. VEC Sim Racing and Phoenix Racing Esports. So, Sumo, there are a few cars trying something different out there, and I wonder how that's going to play out. They're probably banking, I would have to assume, on more cautions coming out later on in this race. Absolutely, they have to. They can't be out of cycle for far too long because eventually... It just won't pan out for them. They'll just be a bit too irregular. And yes, it's an interesting idea to think that, yeah, perhaps we could go different as we see the virtual motorsport car 
have a bit of an issue right there. But nevertheless, being on cue, being on time is something that really helps out for them. So they'll, we have to be banking on the caution as we see them just getting a bit of aero wash. And the virtual motorsport car goes into the virtual grass and virtually loses a lot of time in that case. Let's take a oh look boy. then at this on board. I think they just carry too much momentum in through the first mm. part of the corner. Watch on board as we ride. You can see down the gear trying to oh, stick no, it to the no, left. No, no, no. Just a little bit oh. too much speed. The rear end comes around early and unfortunately you can see here able to get that car back under control. Not going to run into those tire barriers that are waiting on the outside of Lukey Heights. And for that virtual motorsports car back onto the track after losing a bit of time. There's been another issue, by the way, for the Team Hoistingvelt number 48 LMP car. Let's take a look at this race spot replay. This is down into the Siberia corner. They look to the inside and they're going to get squeezed to the curb and more contact made for the number 40. And they get clipped from behind as well as the train of cars tries to make their way through. Who was that second car involved? That's the 112 Rusty Spatulas getting involved there in contact we'll take a look here just a bold move from the 48 to the inside and well the 112 not really potentially leaving that space trying to cut across the nose jonathan and more contact here in lmp2 yeah siberia is not going to be the optimal place to go as you see a little bit of contact there at the end so we're going back to the live and it's going to be a lot of damage on this 48 he almost put himself back into the tire barrier as well trying to get straight so for the hardskinfeld team in the LMP2, it's not going as planned, but in the GT team, it's going all according to plan down there. Going very well for the 248. More race bot TV replays to look at. We expected hectic restarts to this race. What has happened to the 305? Oh, on the curbing, very vicious snap of oversteer trying to get the power down for Stacey Dunigan. We'll take a look at this replay once again, but uh, Sumo, cars getting caught out very early here. And we're only 30 minutes into this one. We've used up a lot of our race spot TV replays here. Oh yeah, it's going wrong again for so many cars. And that's just Philip Island. That's what the circuit is all about. It's a tough, tricky one. And the way it can catch each other out is going to be something fun. And now this is going to be more fun. Talk Freak Racing and Pure Sims Esports going into duel against each other. Coming into the second sector of the track. Of course, to have to be a bit wary about things at this particular part of the circuit because this is where it really gets narrow and serpentine. And with all the other GTE cars around them, it could be a really bad place to make that sort of a move right there. But you've got to have a little bit of guile and you just have to shock your opponent to get that move done. And now riding on board. Who are we riding on board with? This is Team RSO and the Gap Arjuna. Not bad indeed. Not bad indeed, the gap holding fairly constant as they work their way through traffic around the last corner. An over-under attempted for the RSO car as he cuts his way through. What is now a second Ford GT in this field, delighted to see more representation across the GTE class. But now look behind them as well, Delta Sport U4K, just half a second behind. Now the top four separated by just 2.5 seconds as the 97 gets bottled up behind the AOD Racing BMW once again. That's the car that Albert Jones just took off into the gravel during that caution period. But right now, Christopher Herbigno putting all sorts of pressure onto Niels Benedict out front as they work their way through the lap traffic. You can see the flat lights as well that these LMP2s are putting on the GTs. They, they really need and want these GTs to get out of the way. It's going to affect a lot of these fights and a lot of these battles. As you can see around the outside, Fiercely Forward went on that BMW for AOD Racing, trying to cut their way through, not lose too much time. As Miguel Vigo now has a 1.2 second buffer out front. As he now tries to catch the Kinetic Racing Corvette down the inside into turn number 10. That's a risky place as he gets right behind the No Lucky M Sport oh. and he turns. He turns the Corvette. So the race leader involved in contact and now down into third place for Miguel Vigo. I talked about that being a risky place to try and pass. And Paul Van Loan in the No Lucky M Sport car around and still trying to get his way back onto track. Let's take a look then at a Race Bot TV replay. Oh man, and the race leader, the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing Team, just going horribly wrong for them. Turning the Corvette around, and that'll certainly be a penalty once Race Control gets to see this. The protests will be filed right away. And take a look at this from their perspective, the Alpine Stars team. Manuel Vigo comes in at Lukey Height. It's a tough corner, this one. Goes down deep and misjudges it. The gentlest bit of contact and that zebra. Well, it's a spawn zebra now. 
So back to the live pictures as Alpine Star's Geodesic trying to reclaw the race lead now behind Delta Sport U4K as they dive into Siberia, getting really close, trying to put pressure and get back up. The gap to Team RSO now, 1.2 seconds. Niels Benedict has a gap and has that fiercely forward car that he's about to place in between him and the chasing pack. There's been a lot of replays to look at now and it's starting to calm down, but just as we talk about it starting to calm down, well, the race leader gets involved in contact and disaster for the number 62 car. Jonathan, I mean, we talk about the protests filling up. I'm now taking a look at my protest sheet. There's been a few things that have come down and well, the one penalty that we can confirm for the 321, a stop and go penalty for them, unable to slow down for a corner, forcing the pro class car off the track and we're waiting for more investigations to be completed and more penalties to come down. Yeah, the Ivor Race Control, a busy place right now. There's gonna be a lot of different protests and specifically, that's going to be a big one, the 62 and the No Luck Esport car. And fortunately for the No Luck Esport car, they, they just did not have any luck in that situation. But that will be a big decision that could affect, really, the outcome of this race. The Geodesic car has been up front. It has been one of the fastest cars that qualified on pole. And, oh, there's a BMW. Well, it looks like the virtual lawn care service will not have to take <laughs> care of the lawn this weekend. Well, lots of cars out there in the grass. Clearly a very popular place to be. This looks to be an issue with another LMP car getting very, very aggressive into turn two. That was one of the Torque Freak racing cars trying to stick their nose down into the inside and spinning the 221 off into the gravel on the outside of turn number two. An aggressive passing opportunity. And I think a few of these LMP2 cars have to just calm down a little bit now, guys, as we jump back to live pictures. You see there the gap between... Miguel Vigo in the Delta Sport U4K car now up to 1.2 seconds as we close in on 40 minutes done in our first hour of the race here. But they now have a three second buffer behind Nils Benedict. So that RSO car, you just got to keep your nose clean now if you are Nils Benedict in the 97, right, Zumo? Yeah, you have to. You have to indeed. And it's easier said than done. And I think that's going to be a commentator's favorite phrase here today. Easier said than done, considering how tricky the challenges are here at Philip Island for sure. But nevertheless, it is a real challenge for them because the GTE machines as well, they're pretty sure of holding their line. And now, let's take a look at what the Team 11 machine had to oh, go through. No. They had to go through a proper, proper frolicking on the outside of the circuit, just got pushed wide. And, well, I hope Lewis Ward has done a bit of rallycross practice because that was a nasty, nasty bump. And you can there. see here, confused, I think, about how to get back onto the track. Lu exactly. Lewis Ward loses a lot of time. We'll take a look one more time at this replay as he tries to make his way through on the Fisher Motorsport car that leads GTM and Lewis Ward gets hip checked off into the grass and Lewis Ward who won the first round of the season now unfortunately down in 24th place and that wasn't contact with one of our LMP cars that was contact with a fellow GT competitor so traffic is proving to be crucial throughout this field we jump back to another battle that's raging on now between fourth and fifth held races and the TNT Racing number 81, Paul Darling, has already made some impressive moves at the start of this race, now trying to get back up into the top four on track. It's going to have a huge draft here going down into Duhon as they now clear the GT traffic. GTs are fighting hard. They're fighting for the lead back there, but now with some bit of clear track, the TNT Racing, Darling looks to the outside. The Hellracers of Valstrom, a little bit braver, going into Duhon. And now it's just going to be a matter of trying to set up this move. There's not that many good passing opportunities you know for on class battles like this so it really comes down to setting up a perfect move into some of these big corners and that's a big off that is a big off for torque freak racing the number one dirk van tolden into the tire barrier on the outside of turn number two and that might be another safety car as he tries to rejoin i wonder how much damage has been done to the front end of that Dallara LMP2 car. Let's try and take a look at this replay. But my god, guys, these guys aren't letting us breathe for a second. So much action is happening. Yeah, thankfully, we haven't really got a safety car in this case. So what's happened to the Talk Freak Racing car? We saw them in a bit of a battle early on. So they are still in there. Oh, they get do turned. they get punted? Oh, yeah. They do, get, they do get pushed out onto the gravel. And yes... They do hit the wall as well, and that was finally the fiercely forward car. Tom Walsh stood behind the wheel of that one. So, still should be having a quick look at that one as we take a look at this replay from their perspective. Go down the inside and say, uh, do you mind if we go down the inside, sir? They hold their line, come back out, and then the car in the background, well, 
if this were in real life, they would be taking up the brooms and scraping out a whole lot of gravel while wiping off their tears. I don't think this is going to be a penalty. Look at this one. They go outside. So the ah. 34 car almost forces the Torque Freak Racing car to look to the outside. I'm not sure if that's going to be a penalty that comes down, but that will be a tough call for race control. And fortunately, we're not in race control for this one. Let's jump back to live pictures because there's been another issue. And it's one another Hell Racers car off into the gravel. This time, I think, at Siberia Corner as they try and rejoin onto the track. All sorts of chaos here in the first 40 minutes of action here. Yeah, and he's trying to find a good place to rejoin but right now with the traffic. It's kind of hard. He gets around Team Eiskenfeld leader and he's just wide all by himself. Again, this track is not wide, so trying to clear all this traffic and trying to, you know, find good places to pass, it's just very, very difficult, especially for these LMP2s. They are, they're so fast and have so much aero. Let's jump back to live pictures then and to the number 62 car who we do expect a penalty to come down for at some time. Now one second behind Delta Sport U4K as they've cleared the traffic and worked to now set sail once again. Out front though, Team RSO and Niels Benedict coming out of turn number two. They've got a three second buffer on the rest of the field. So looking good for the number 97 car as Benedict works to try and extend the gap as we head towards the top of the first hour here in the Ivory Endurance Series, second round from Phillip Island. There you'll see the No Luck EM Sport Car, who's had a few difficulties since that contact with the number 62. And more, more contact for the No Luck EM Sport Car. Absolutely oh. no luck. And this time getting caught up with the RSO car. What is happening right now for No Luck EM Sport? Let's take a look at that replay, but almost getting scared out of the way by the flashing lights of the Team RSO car behind. We'll take a look at an onboard look and see if there was contact or if that was just the psychological pressure getting to Paul Van Loan. You saw the flashing lights. It looked like there was a bit of contact on the front. There was going to be a lot of damage. You can see he has the rear view camera. He can see the 97 coming. The lights come on. 97 goes to the inside and just a little bit of contact it looks like from the front but the 90s the no monkey sport card did not like saw the lmp2 but maybe did not give him enough room down on the inside and watching that one back i have to think that both of those incidents for that no luck em sport car are no fault of their own so that corvette down in 25th and second to last place right now the only car behind them is that car that had to take that drive through penalty the 321 that we just mentioned a few moments ago as Van Loan continues to struggle now on the exit of turn number one. He's going to rejoin the track potentially as an LMP2 car comes around turn number two. Fortunately, the 313 doesn't slide back onto the racing surface. So Paul Van Loan has to get back up to racing speed and set all of that disappointment into the back of his mind. Let's take a and, look at... And that's, and that's a good point that you mentioned there, Arjuna. Said you're putting it back into your mind, I think... Uh, we can discuss that in depth later on, I guess. No, 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 go ahead. Make your point now. We'll take a look at this GT battle that's starting to develop between second and third. But, you know, this is a, it's only a four-hour race, Sumo. Maximum drive time, we're looking at under two hours for these drivers. So you don't have much time to get out there and make a difference. And it's important to maximize your time out on track. It is indeed. And more importantly, in this case, because you've got such a limited amount of time, at least in comparison to the other races in this championship, You've got to put incidents like that behind your mind, and that was an excellent term that he used there, Arjuna, because so often that it happens that whenever you're involved in an incident of that sort, you end up cussing a couple of times, you end up, perhaps if you're total wolf, bashing the table, and then it just sticks in your mind. And a good driver can put this incident behind them and take only around a couple of minutes and say, OK, right, now that's done, let me move on to the target in front of me. Not get weighed down by all the setbacks. And in this case, because we've got such a limited amount of time and now that we're also getting towards the very end of the stints of each of these teams and drivers, they have to do that instantly. And those pit stops, at least for the LMP2s right now, that's going to help. But for the GTEs, still around 15 odd minutes left to go. Well, you see a few divers down onto pit lane already. The 141 and the 51 have committed to pit lane this time around. That safety car did extend the window for all of these cars, but clearly pit window is starting to open. We'll jump back to the battle for second place because through traffic once again, that's the Vector Sim Racing 305 car as they go through turn number 10. Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing going to look for the over-under and set up the run down that last corner onto the back straight. In fact, no, 62 Vigo down onto the pit lane this time around. What's it going to be? 
No penalty has come down just yet for the 62 car, so just uh, just service. And we're not expecting tires, as you see. Benedict Sorry, also right down. Them. Benedict down onto the pit lane as well. Oh, it's a busy, busy place down here now. You see tons of drivers coming in. So most of the LMP and uh -oh. pro field, as we see Team 11, ah, when it goes from bad to worse, doesn't it? It really does, and they've got a LMP2 car entered in today's race as well, but Lewis Ward, more issues. What's happened here, Jonathan? Take a look at the replay. Oh, the car already has damage. It looks oh, like no. all, all by himself. I'm wondering if the steering is just completely busted from earlier going over that curve, and now he hits the wall too. A car that dominated out at Spa is really, really struggling. This is something you really don't want to see. And... and and the reason we're watching this, guys, this might be another safety car. There you see, it's a hardware failure. Wheel snaps to the left. Nothing Ward can do as he tries to now reset his wheel and get back up to racing speed. Jump back to the live pictures. Where is Ward? As he tries to crawl his way back to pit lane. There you can see, stopped. Stopped in the last corner is Lewis Ward. This will be an inevitable safety car. And two safety cars in the first hour is the inevitable result of an incident for the 211 car. Well, there are designated tow zones as they go through in the driver's briefing, so maybe Ward has gotten himself into that. It doesn't need a tow zone for no safety car to come out. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see as now there's a rush down to pit road, Delta Sport, TNT. I think all those that remained out, RSR. There it is. Yep, there's the safety car. And, and this is disaster, just, guys. This, oh, boy. This is a big game changer. Some of these cars aren't going to be able to exit the pit lane now. So Delta Sport U4K. Managed to get in safely, but you'll see some of the cars behind you are also on their way down. They will not be able to stop unless they want oh. to take a penalty. So, safety car out once again, and let's take a look at exactly why, what happened to Lewis Ward in the Team 11 car. No, I think, Arjuna, the pit lane is open. The pit lane exit is open, so they can exit if they were already in, but they can't service if the pit, uh, once the safety car is deployed. And bang, there he goes with the hardware failure, Lewis Ward. He will be gutted. In fact, he'll be smashing his steering wheel saying, oh man, what's happened right here? And you can already see him wobbling up a little bit. Snap of the finger. Where is he going? Yep, there it is. Straight in the grass and into the pits. Now, coming back to the point about the cars. The pit exit is open, at least from iRacing standards. At least that's what they say. Uh, but the, the key question is, when did the car spit? Because if they're in the lane and they haven't really done, gone to their box already, and if, it, if the safety car gets deployed between that time, then they are not supposed to service. They're only supposed to drive through and join the queue behind. And this is a big shakeup in the running order. We're looking at right now your net race leader, Torque Freak Racing, the number one for Dirk Van Tolden. They will have to come down to pit lane though, so despite the fact that they're leading this race, not the ideal position for them. As we now wait for a number of other cars to head down the lane. What else has happened? Something else has happened under caution, guys. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay under safety car. And this is for RLR Abruzzi Esports. You'll see they scored his first position, and that's because they've had to reset as well back to pit lane. Don't tell me another hardware failure. You see them going straight on here. What's happening on the steering wheel? There you can see them finally shifting down the gears, but... Oh, the revs have fallen. The revs have fallen, that's for sure. Potentially then, guys, we've got two of these cars out, and there's been another incident under caution as well. One more replay to look at here on the RaceBot TV uh, commentary, and... Oh boy, don't do this under caution, guys. Remember, you gotta get the car safely. Uh, back to the safety car line for Martin Tiergaard, the 102, having some issues and off-road excursions uh, as he works his way back onto track there. But under caution once again, Jonathan. Well, we called it right. More than two cautions in the first hour of the race here. Well, the Vikings right there having a hard time conquering Australia. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be... It's a real hard one for me. This is going to actually be heartbreaking, actually, for Torque Freak Racing. They're going to have to pit under caution, and they're going to end up at the very end of the LMP2 field. And for RR, looks like they, again, lost revs. It may have been an engine failure or something like that. They look had significant rear damage as well. So this first hour has just been so chaotic. And it, it's all about surviving and putting your car in the right place. And right now, the, the team that's done it the best is RSO. And it's, I can't express just how crazy this is for us to try and follow up here in the race bot booth as well, guys. Because, well, we only have one... 
view of the track, right? We have the view that all the viewers are seeing as well. That's all that the three of us are seeing. And there is so much fighting up and down the field, not just the ba battles that we've been focusing on, mainly for the class lead in both class. We've taken a look at some of the battles for 9th, 10th, also 16th and 17th play, uh, battles on track for LMP as well. And, and this has been one of the most craziest starts to a race. I can remember for any endurance race, let alone here in the Ivor series, and two safety cars are really going to shake things up a lot, I think. It is. It's going to throw strategy into the mix now. Uh... The safety car, now, uh, we will potentially see GT cars pit once the pit window opens. So that'll play out well into their hands. But then remember, because they pit at this stage, right, they might have to do a little bit more of fuel saving towards the end of the next one because they are, of course, spinning in early. And, of course, thankfully for them, it just helps out the fact that because we've got two stints in, in the safety car instead of only one, they can do a bit of fuel saving behind the safety car as well. But on the track too, they'll be running heavier fuel loads. So they won't be as nimble as they would normally be at that stage. And just not having that sort of kind of confidence in the way that your car changes direction could be a major point in terms of traffic. And yes, traffic has been a major issue here today. It has been, but pit entrance is now open. So there you'll see Torque Freak racing down onto the lane, followed by our GT machines. The pit window is now open for GT cars, so I have a feeling we'll see most of them down onto the pit lane to take their service under caution rather than lose all that time under green flag. And indeed, we're watching most of them coming down. The one car that has decided not to come down, though, as far as I can tell, is the Maniti Racing 278. So... Split strategy here for Johnny Verhoff and an interesting strategy call because um, I'm trying to think about how this is going to work out for them here, Jonathan. They're going to come out after the safety car restarts. They're going to have to come down onto pit lane. They'll come, they'll come out all the way at the back of the field, basically, once you consider the time they're going to lose. But maybe, just maybe, they're trying to eliminate a pit stop at the end of the race now. We must remember 90% is the fuel restriction here in GTE. Yeah, we did have already one safety car, and we don't know how much fuel Mantini has been able to save under that. But it's saving a lot of fuel now. And here's the other thing also, is that now he's got this huge buffer of LMP2 cars in between him and the rest of his class. So it, it might be an interesting strategy call, and he might have to pit under green, but now he doesn't have to worry about classmates behind him trying to fight him for a position. He's basically all by himself among a bunch of LMP2s, which may frustrate the LMP2s, though. I'm sure it will as they make their way around him currently behind. I think that's the pineapple racing potentially car in front yeah, of They've inherited the lead of LMPM, actually. I think they, they timed pit road perfectly. No. Nope. Yeah. They timed pit, roam, pit road well, rather. But take a look at the graphic up on your screen now. They're on the 22nd lap of their stint. So they did come down, I think previously onto pit lane but you can also take a look it was a short stop so just 13 seconds in the box let's take a look at the 105 the 105 team didn't have a penalty to serve so that must have just been a, a splash and dash at some point there is a penalty that we should let you know about that has come down though the number 55 has got a 10 second stop and go penalty for a tier 7 contact down in towards honda corner so race control starting to get busy and with already 16 incidents filed come the first 55 minutes of this race, race control once again going to be busy here, Sumo. Yep, there's going to be a lot for them to work out for. We saw that in the club sport races. We saw that in the GT sprint. And we're getting to see that right here as well. And the thing with Ivra is because it's, I think, the only big endurance series on iRacing that has safety cars, it does bump up their work quite a bit just to arrange everyone in the right order too. But nevertheless, it's a spectacle. And it's a spectacle like none other in sim racing. That's what I'd like to call. But right now, honestly, the spectacle would be far, far better if the drivers made less mistakes. And yes, take another shot. I'm going to say it again. Easier said than done. And cautions, That's number two for the day. <laughs> and cautions breed cautions. I'll say a, a, a yeah. very overused line. You can take another shot if you want. But uh, cautions breed cautions. Two in this first hour. You're, we're tracking for eight cautions in a four-hour race as things stands. As you hear the pit lane alarm go off and more cars peeling off down onto the safety, relative safety, of pit lane. So at least one more lap under caution then. Let's take a look and run through what has happened 
at least in your LMP field, because RSO back to the pointy end of things. You can see there, though, Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing up to second place in the LMP Pro category. They do have the Pineapple Racing car in between them and the RSO car, but interestingly, the car that the number 62 was fighting against, the number 33 Delta Sport U4K team, down into ninth place in class as things stand. There you can see the pits, uh, pit lane time, just under 90 seconds for Christophe Herbigno, and not what they would have wanted here, Jonathan, because you go from being second on the track to now being, well, as a result of being one of the cars that peeled off into the lane a bit later, I think, than everyone else. Uh, they've lost out a little bit of time here and are going to have to make their way through about five or six cars to work their way towards the front of the field once again. There's a few AM cars in between for good measure as well that they're going to have to fight through and... It's going to be really interesting to see how they're going to be able to combat this. They've been having a fast car. The 33 has been in that top three, and it's been fast most of the day. But now they're going to have, as well, look at that TNT racing right behind, who's also had a really good day and had a fast car as well. So they might have to be wary of the attacks from behind, as well as trying to claw their way back up towards the front. TNT racing with an early move for overtake of the day around the outside of the last corner on the Delta Sport U4K team. So... TNT Racing and Paul Darling, also behind in 10th place, will be looking to make their way up through the field once again. As we wait for the lights to go off on the iRacing pace car, at least one more lap under caution then as we watch the cars diving their way down in towards turn number 10 and coming out of that downhill right-hand hairpin. This is a fun track, guys, and it's one that usually gets raced... Um, more in the V8 supercars and, and motorcycles, but not somewhere that endurance racing typically comes to, but in typical Ivra fashion, uh, what most people don't like to do, Ivra enjoys trying out, and well, Ivra has run a full four-class, multi-class race at Belle Isle before. <laughs> Two classes, effectively, of cars on track this time around, proving to be quite difficult for some of the competitors to make their way around, and we've seen a number of issues already with lapped cars and... Uh, and traffic becoming a factor and you know the number 97 and the number 62 both have that looming threat of that penalty coming down both with contact with the no lucky em sport car the number 313 yeah normally no either I, i'd like to compare them to imsa in the real world considering the way the races are organized and everything and uh, c considering how IMSA go about, they would not really race two categories, but because it's high racing, you do have the liberty of doing that. And unfortunately, it's not quite working out right now with all the cars having all these issues and just the nature of the circuit, Arjuna. I, I find it hard to keep it on track personally. Now, that does mean two things. A, it's going to be very hard for drivers to keep it on track. And B, I'm probably a very bad driver, which I am. But nevertheless, even for these guys, when they're driving on their own, it's fine. It's a track that compels you to push harder. You want to explore the limits. You want to go faster. But just doing that with all the traffic on the play can get you to push 110% away. And you know, if you, full, if you try to fill more than what the bottle can hold, it eventually spills over. And that's what's been happening today. Well, we can also say, by the way, race control is very busy, but keeping on top of things, um, can't see the car number there as race control works to update their own spreadsheet, our graphics powered directly by race control's input. Albert Jones in the AOD BMW, a pit lane infraction, did not comply with the three second rule. And this is a, an either wide rule where cars have three seconds to get between the fast and slow lane on pit lane. Uh, uh, one more rule that just reflects the commitment to authenticity that the Ivor organizers are trying to go for. So 50 seconds then to go till the end of hour number one here in the four hours of Phillip Island. Round number two of the Ivor Endurance Series. You're watching coverage live on RaceBot TV. And a reminder, do follow us for more sim racing action on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and Facebook at RaceBot TV. Be multi streaming many of our races over the next few months. In fact, we'll be multi streaming this very series next time around. Unfortunately, this time, uh, a busy day for RaceBot TV. We've got a few other broadcasts going on as well, so unable to perform our multi stream as we would intend. But thank you for tuning in on our YouTube and thank you for keeping engaged through the YouTube chat as well. We do keep an eye out and 
Sumil, I've seen you being active in the chat as well. It's always fun in these sim racing yeah. broadcasts when you have that active engagement from the community and not just community members who are competing in this race who are excited to watch their teams, but great thing about Ivor is we get a lot of people just watching for the racing action out on track. No, I love it. I, I genuinely love it. To, and to each of every, to each person actually listening on the broadcast, thank you. Thank you for communicating with us on the YouTube channel. It really keeps us on our toes as commentators, as sometimes there, is, there are certain pieces of information that you can point out faster than us. That normally happens. And just keeping the conversation going. And in an endurance race like this, we do have the liberty of time. And thankfully, that will be the case when these guys calm down. So you can throw in your questions, ask us anything you want to. And the first question that may be coming into your mind is, what the hell was that kinetic racing car doing? Why is it speeding off? Well, it's just being let off. That's the thing. It's been lapped and that lap is being, they are being allowed to essentially unlap themselves and get to the back of the field. So that is what is happening. And yet again, coming back to the point, do communicate more often. Do type in the chat. Please feel free to. We love it. And that's our thing is the spirit of endurance racing. Everyone just being connected to each other. And having a lovely chat about the one thing we love the most. It's a luxury we get here at Racebot TV that we don't you don't see it like a lot of from TV broadcasts. We have great interaction with our chat and thank for all the streaming services that we can have that luxury. Absolutely. That's been something that's been great to see the radio show limited crew doing more of as they take on some sim racing broadcasts here in partnership with Racebot TV in a lot of occasions, but that YouTube chat interaction is a lot of fun. Last time out, uh, I was on an endurance broadcast. We had a 24-hour race powered by H&R and Molno Motorsports last week. Uh, I was in the graveyard shift, and uh, we spent a lot of the time <laughs> talking about various fantasies. What, what, what classic endurance racing combo would you like to try and devise? So uh, we'll, we'll get into this more in a little bit of time because <laughs> lights are out on the pace car. And we'll have to dive into this topic if they calm down on track just a little bit. But uh, You've opened the Pandora's box, aren't you? And I've opened it. And I'm, my mind can't uh, focus on the race. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you what I was thinking because I think that will blow your mind that much more. How about a uh -huh. multicast race around the streets of Singapore featuring the old Singapore sling chicane? with your IMSA-style car, so LMB2, GTE, and GT3. I think that would be a lot of fun, also a lot of chaos, just like we're witnessing now. But pace car down and off onto pit lane, fielding control of the Team RSO number 97, and on the power for Niels Benedict as we get started once again here at Phillip Island. Second safety car restart. We go racing once again, and Maniti Racing has to watch as all the LMP2 cars thunder their way down the inside, down in towards turn number one. But look at the gap that that Maniti Racing BMW is going to have on the rest of their class <laughs> as they're getting very close down into turn number one. What is happening at the front of this field as we get started once again? Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing has lost a position, I think, to the Hell Racers Gladany car. Crazy Ooh. restart here as we get back to racing action. I did mention that Mancini racing car was not going to be uh, Ooh, very friendly. Oh, more contact. contact! More contact! Oh no, and the 62 and the 30. Five. The 62 and the 34 are around at Honda Corner, causing a traffic jam. They all stack up, going too wide out of the corner, down into Siberia. But once again, on one of these safety car restarts, chaos has ensued, and we're lucky back uh, to not be back under caution right now, as cars still filtering their way out of Siberia down towards Lukey Heights, but contact made and we'll get a replay in just a few moments time but Vigo now down all the way in 15th place man this is as chaotic as putting in Vikings and Roman gladiators into the same room and igniting a fire what's going on here why aren't they so aggressive I'll tell you the answer they want track position at the restart but this this just purely is pandemonium everywhere and I'm not sure this is what we want to see. I mean, that was a lovely bit of defensive driving by the Alpine Stars geodesic racing team at the Duan corner at the beginning, but then they got spun out. Now they are looking to go three wide and goodness me, hold on to your seats. This should be fun. The Hellraisers team go to the inside and so do the Alpine Stars geodesic racing team, but wow, that was some aggressive move, but I have a feeling this could be going much worse here, Arjuna. This, and that this was, could be far worse. And let, let's just 
uh, sing the praises here for the Rusty Spatulas, the 1-1-2 that let both of those pro cars go. Fighting in LMPM, he does not need to get involved in all of this craziness going on in front of him. That is what heads-up driving is in multi-class racing. Time to take a look then at the RaceBot TV replay. What happened? down in towards Honda Corner one lap ago. You see Paolo Munoz going side by side with Fiercely Forward. Fiercely Forward cuts off the Pure Sims car down into the braking zone and, and it's the Fiercely Forward car that actually yeah. kicks off all of that contact. Let's take another look at what happens slightly further in front for Vigo because you'll see Vigo goes deep under braking trying to close in on the car in front of him and then just gets sent from behind here from that Fiercely Forward car as he uh, had to check up there. Yeah, he had, a, he had an issue bit of contact as well with the other car. So it was not all clean. So we take a look at this onboard from Tom Walsh. It was had a bit of a chaotic day, to say the least. And he comes in. Okay, notice. Notice the rear end while you're watching. You'll see it snap from behind. Okay. Oh, that's ambitious, isn't it? And then, bang, he goes. Tries to correct it with the opposite lock. But it's gone away. It's like trying to hold on to sand as it slips away from your palms. Not going to happen, son. Daniel Ricardo-esque move with a, uh, unfortunately, okay. a Max Verstappen lock result. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> so take a look one more time at the replay. You'll see down the inside as Vigo looking around the outside as he tries to avoid the check up in front of him. Vigo gets turned around. Calamity ensues. You see too wide they come out of Honda Corner, which is always a risky proposition in and of itself. But Vigo gets back underway and Vigo still staring down the barrel of that penalty. Potentially incoming. Down in 14th place now. Needs another miracle like he did last time at the 12 hours of Spa. Well, what's happening then at the front of this LMP category? Team RSO running away at the front now. 1.9 seconds is the gap to the LMP AM leader, Pineapple Racing. Pineapple Racing still do have to come down the pit lane, of course. Now 28 laps into their stint. They're trying to extend and maybe run a slightly contra strategy as we work with 2 hours and 53 minutes to go. Lots of chaos, and I'm just scrolling through my timing screen, guys. There is so much more that we didn't even look at as Vigo down to the pit lane. Is that the penalty for Miguel Vigo? That may also be repairs as well. Like, that 62 has been involved in a number of collisions, and he'll slowly make his way down. We'll see if he comes in or not. Yep, he goes in. Yep, stop and go. So there we go. I'm still waiting for this to get updated on my uh, race control decisions. But there you go. Penalty for Miguel Vigo as things appear. Stop and go penalty as he once again gets very, very wide. Coming on that long pit exit around the outside. He sweeps of a BMW. That's something to keep an eye out if we get green flag pit stops later on in this one. Let's look at some battles happening. Because Ru Rusty Spatulas doing a good job here to not get involved with some of the other cars that have been having some issues. They are now, they've just let the team Hoisingveld number 48 go, so they're running in 17th, 6th place in this LMP AM category. Let's take a look at GTE because this interesting strategy that Miniti Racing is trying to go on, well you see there, it's 4 seconds to another car that hasn't come down and pitted, but if you take a look at the gap to the cars that pitted and Samba Racing right now currently leads those cars in their BMW. Well, they are, you can see that 12 seconds behind the leader. So Sumo, this interesting strategy from the Miniti team is going to put them at probably around 40 seconds behind these guys when they come down the pit lane. Yep, yeah, that's going to be an interesting factor. Let's see how they can close up the lap times. And that's going to be a tricky challenge uh, for them with all the traffic. Look at this. You try to stay on your racing line, and straight away an LMP2 car comes from behind and says, uh, Knock, knock, sir. You're not allowed to do that. You have to move out of the way for them. And look at this, the kinetic racing car just being frantic in their approach and trying to get those positions in, and they will. So as a GTE driver, it's a lot about keeping your nerves, keeping your calm in this case, because as much as you would want to hold your ground and try to put in your lap times that you've practiced all in your practice servers, you have to you have to yield you have to be yielding towards those lmp2 drivers and for some drivers who have practiced more than others this can be a major pro this can actually play into their hands and experience in traffic is going to be a major problem and we say this consistently in endurance racing it's not just the driver who can put the best qualifying lap or race the hardest it's the one who can lose the least time in traffic that is the mark of a great endurance driver and we're riding on board then with the 283 Kinetic Racing Chevy C8 Corvette. 
as this is the battle for the net race lead as the 105 team pineapple racing down on pit lane jonathan so they're coming in for their one and only stop they're already slipped though to 18th place in their class they're going to drop i think to 25th as things stand so if we're just extrapolating now and considering what maniti racing did on strategy well maniti racing did something similar they may be looking at a similar fall when they come down onto the lane yeah but i think th this strategy i think might work out more in GTE than it will in the LMP2s. We talk about like the LMP2s can only go about 40 minutes <laughs> as we're getting dicey. Comes in some pros. The Hell Racers in front. Laps at iRacing team and RLR are fighting, and there's a adequate racing pro car there for good measure. And they're going through these twisty bits. He heights, but you're right. Like it might not work for the LMP2 car 105. It's an interesting strategy, but you know you can only go about 50 minutes on fuel for these GT cars. You know saving these 10 20 minutes like they could be able to really change up the strategy and be a huge factor at the end of this race well while we have to think about the end of the race action on track is absolutely feisty right now look at this battle on the edge of the top 10 you've got about five cars scrapping it out now as rsr by g performance to the inside getting past joshua wolf in the torque freak racing number 61 nice. am versus pro and they still side by side around turn number two wolf <laughs> doesn't want to give this one up but the am car around the outside gets the traction off the corner and down into honda the rsr car up into eighth place as now the laps at racing team tries to get in on the action so two amateur cars trying to pass that pro machine down into honda around the outside for the 169 and ibrahim alouette he's gonna get the move done and for that number 61 car two corners two positions lost headlights flashing but unfortunately for joshua wolf nothing he could do to defend those moves there yep the wolf was out there hunting all on his own and he got gobbled up by the pack a brilliant move there by the rsr esports by g performance team nathan block just actually putting up a block pass of sorts around the outside so that was quite the pun in that case but nevertheless ibrahim aluat doing an excellent job finding the opportunity and making his move but one person who has found the opportunity to go wide is Casper Allred in the HD Sim Sport car. What has happened around here? So, high speed corner, as it always is in LMP2s, nothing is slow speed for them essentially. <laughs> well, uh, they should have a big disclaimer warning at the gates of Phillip Island Circuit saying the grass is slipperier than you think it is. And it wasn't just him having issues at that portion. You see there in front as. Aril goes around. Milo Limford has to take avoiding action off into the outside of the track. Fortunate there to not get collected from the cars behind as well, but Linford doing a very, very good job there to avoid the spinning car in front of him. And there's been so much action. Let's jump back to live pictures. Let's talk you through standings as things run because we are just past 10 minutes into a second hour of action here from Phillip Island. Let's give you a top eight rundown then in both LMP and GT. Starting with this LMP class, Team RSO continues to lead the way now with a four second advantage over the number 19 Hell Racers machine. Delta Sport U4K, the number 33 machine, making their way through the field once again. They're just seven tenths of a second behind the number 19, but they do have Pure Sims Esports, the number two right behind them. Fiercely forward. They are the leader in LMP Am right now, the 134, with TNT Racing, Nomad Sim Racing, and RSR by G Performance rounding out the top eight in class. Let's jump to GTE then quickly and run you through this. Maniti Racing, the 278, leads by five seconds, but they are due for a pit stop in a few laps time. Quasar Sim Racing, the 225, and one of the four GTs currently running in second. They've got pressure from Phoenix Racing Esport behind them. Kinetic Racing and Samba Racing, both in a battle as Kinetic Racing has just gotten up into the net race lead, passing the Samba Racing BMW. As Fisher Motorsports also gets in on the action. You can see their fifth and sixth side by side as things stand. Team Oisingveld, pole position, 248, down 15 seconds from the net race leader. And RSR by Esport G Performance, 255, rounds out the top eight. So there are your top eight standings in all over class. And let's go look at the side by side battle that has been raging on as they go down in towards Lukey Heights, the Porsche 911 on the inside. As Samba Racing looks around the outside, which will switch back to the inside now as we work through turns 11 and 12. Samba Racing with enough of a gap now. I think that Fisher Motorsports car is going to have to tuck into line. And now watch as Corvette, that Corvette behind also gets in on the action. As Team Hoisingveld looks to get back up into a podium position. Yeah, Samba Racing team did not have a good outing, you know, at Spa. They had a few incidents, a few collisions, but right now they're really showing that they're 
They're here to be actor today. They're holding up the Fisher Motorsport car, and the Heischfeld team right behind that menacing-looking Corvette is getting closer and closer. The Fisher Motorsport team looking inside, looking outside. There's really not much you can do. You're going to have a good run down into Honda, I think. They're side-by-side -side. again. Heischfeld watching Fisher Motorsport and Sommer go side-by-side. -side. Sommer's going to have the inside line. Is there anything that Porsche can do on the outside late on? On the brakes they go. He tries to stick it around the outside. Not going to work. And here comes the 248 and sent, uh, not Sentikowski anywhere. Matt Thors Hutzfeld has taken over in the 248, taking over from Sentikowski. That Porsche going to hold on to the position. And now the pressure from Os Oscar T. Coper behind in the 255. So this is the battle then for fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Kinetic Racing has pulled out about a three second buffer out front. I think Mantini as well have I was, hit it. I do not see I was, them on, on the top of the screen. I was just about to say Maniti Racing rolling off the pit lane now, and there you can see them taking that long pit lane exit as they rejoin turn number one right in front of an LMP2 car. I'm sure I had to check up as the Maniti Racing car rejoined the racing surface. There you can see the total stop, though. 59 seconds. So I think Maniti Racing took tires in that pit stop as well, unlike everybody else who came down under caution. So a big chunk of time lost for Miniti Racing. They've also done a driver change. They're all the way down in 25th now. And take a look at the graphic up on your screen, Jonathan. I mean, the gap there, 75 seconds. So they really must be thinking about some alternate strategy that we're missing up here in the booth right now. I'm loving the idea, though. Like, this is, this is a good... This is a good outside-the-box thinking. They're the only ones really trying to get off strategy. We see all the LMP2 guys go down together. So the adequate racing team, and it looks like the Fiercely Forward team fighting hard right here for position. Due traffic, there's a slower car in the background coming out of turn five. But there's so much fighting going on. And here's an Am and a Pro going at it right here. The Hell Racer car who has some damage. He's gotten, you know, been to hell and back so far for the Hell Racers. Let's take a look then at a few more race spot replays of things that have been happening on this second safety car restart. What's happened then to Torque Freak oh, Racing no. in that second forward? And they're going to have a hard contact potentially with the tire barriers, except Ben Kuiper's doing a fantastic job to get that one under control, except the, the slight rejoin at the very, very end. Let's take a look at a race spot TV replay. But Sumil, that was a very close, in, that was a very, very close call for Torque Freak Racing there. That was a talk freaky save there from them. The only four GT on the grid right now. So once again, we are seeing trouble with so many cars. So they get in from behind, they get pushed rather, bullied away. And uh, Ben Kuipers, mate, do you practice rallycross? Because that was excellent. We, I know we've got rallycross on iRacing, but the way he held it showed signs of extreme composure. Someone like a rallycross driver would have in this scenario and does. If he would be driving this car in real life, he would be feeling a few bumps on the way, for sure, because the Ford, of course, much lower than the others. But nevertheless, excellent save. Holds it through clean. Wow. Top and freaky. I, and I think the car that was involved there, as you can see, another incident for Simon Hunderhill oh, no. in the Nomad Sim Racing car. Let's take a look at this replay. You see, that's the RSR car down the inside, just a hip check to the 122. And he's going to go off into the gravel this time around and going to have to find his way back out onto the track. A few cars then having some issues. More replays to take a look at though as Underhill is going to have to cut the track. I hope he doesn't get a slowdown penalty as he's going to have to hop the gap there as well. Hope he didn't take any damage there. Let's take a look at what happened to one of the world of sim racing cars here. Just goes off by himself going into the grass. Please don't come back out on the track in front of one. Okay. <laughs> A little bit into the Hellraiser too, so a Hellraiser already with rear damage, getting a little bit of contact from the World of Sim Racing team, and then, oof, that, that, that's scary when you're coming out of a corner like Honda, and you just see a slow car coming back on the outside of the track, like there's really nowhere for you to go. And more issues there, L1 Esports wide at turn two, no contact, but maybe feeling the pressure from the LMP cars closing behind, and more, more replays to take a look at here from Phillip Island. What's happened between Kinetic Racing and Quasar Sim Racing Corvette? No, Gabriel Roos already down in 24th. 
It's gone a little uh. bit deep into the corner, and we'll take a look at an onboard replay here. But uh, and there's more issues going on now. Let's jump back to this replay, because this is a big one involving three cars coming down in towards Honda. That's the team hoisting valve number 248 that has just got turned. And you see the end of the contact there as well. A big, big wreck as Dirk Van Tulden is involved in this one as well. Uh, I, I hate to do this, but I'll call it like it is. I hate to see this. I, I'm not enjoying this at all. I mean, and in the Joris race, we love to see clean, hard racing, but maybe it's just the track that's catching people out. Maybe the fact that you can't quite go multi-class racing around here. I don't know. I'm just not enjoying this as much. There's too much garnished for one to enjoy in this particular case. But nevertheless, stick around. There should be a lot of good racing coming in soon. But what happens here in this replay for Talk Freak Racing? All fine at this stage. Calamitous dive. Yeah, just that's not good about that. Sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. He licked the stamp and sent it, and I don't even know where he was sending it to. Exactly. Yeah, that's going to be one for race control to uh, come down on as they see fit. More replays. What happened to NRAC Esport? Don't tell me no luck EM Sport has less luck than they could even think about. Oh, and more contact. That's the third one for the no luck EM Sport car, and they're fortunate as well. Not to come back into the path of the Team Hoisinkvelt 48 car. Oh, all sorts of calamity. As we take a look at some replays, more oh. calamity to look at. What is going on here? Okay, more replays to look at, take a look at, guys. I'm sorry about this, but RSR by G Performance, they've just spun one of the M8s uh, in that GT class. Boris Evando just totally getting it wrong down into Luki Heights. Oh, no, 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 no. And that's what I was just about to say. The rejoin has just caused more chaos. This is absolutely just preposterous right now. I cannot believe what I'm actually seeing in terms of the number of contacts. Race control is going to be a busy place. <laughs> that, that, is, that is one thing guaranteed. Race control is not <laughs> going to be a very fun place. And I'm pretty sure in the, the team discords, there's going to be a few words said. Is, see the Ugazi racing, the Ferrari, and it, like there's just nothing you could do. It just this is an LMP2 car just parks himself in the middle of the corner. There's just nowhere to go. And for those wondering, well, I wish we didn't have to keep watching these replays. I'm sorry, but quite frankly, there is just too much craziness going on to not look at this. Watch Dirk Van Tolden. That left front wheel is completely stuck. He's going to have to come down onto pit lane to get that damage repaired. Going very, very slowly. He has just, just about managed to get that car down onto pit lane. Let's take a look at that incident, though, once again between... Dirk Van Tolden into Honda, as you can see, struggling. Uh, this is just, uh, th th there's just no excuse for this right here, guys. Sumo, I'll yeah. let you take this one once more from an aerial look, but this is meant to be the top level of Ivor competition, but some of these drivers are yet to prove why they are here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would think so. Perhaps it's just them not getting enough traffic with all the lap cars in. I don't know. But we take a look at the oh, Talk Freak Racing car. They just punt the other car, punt the second one through. And if I was in a bowling rink, there would be a big booming voice from the speaker saying, strike. But unfortunately, I'm afraid that's just not the way it works on iRacing. And I, I feel sorry for Dirk Van Tulden because uh, it feels bad to be in that situation when you've caused so many accidents all on your own and it's all piling down on you. But there is more. There is more because RSR Esports by G Performance, who did make a lovely move at the Southern Loop, do get clobbered in this one as well. That, that's what we saw a couple of moments ago too. Oh, and while we were looking at all of this, what's happened to Miguel Vigo? Uh -huh. Something else. And it's with the teammate. You can see in caution back out, and I'm not surprised to see that, but uh... Vigo. Oh, no, Vigo. Don't tell me you're the reason for the caution coming out. He makes a basic, basic mistake there. And the damage is done. I think it's Dirk Van Tolden that might be the car that has brought out the caution. But we'll take a look once more at what happened to Miguel Vigo. This is absolutely disastrous for Vigo. Around the outside of his team car, you can see, with an LMP2 three wide. Just doesn't work. Jonathan, I'm going to let you have an opportunity here because this is just ridiculous, I think. It just comes down to traffic management. We talked about it in qualifying. We talked about it at the top of the race that this traffic and getting through traffic is going to be the key as we see they're coming up on a slower am car here through turn one they really have no one in their class around them it's the rusty spatula is right ahead of them and he's just gonna try and send it to the outside of his own team's car and he just runs wide it, it just was an ambitious move and hard into the barrier there's so much damage now on that car you can see the rear and the front just bent up already out of service and 
I, I'm honestly thankful for the caution. I am thankful for the caution. We can all take a breath and well, and calm down here. What's happened to the Fisher Motorsport car? Oh, this oh, is this is he's under going caution. going for a beach day as well. We must say, oh guys, this me. was the previous. Uh, he's still works. leading GTM. He's not the previous GTM leader. He's currently leading, but under caution, more mistakes being made. That was Benjamin Fisher running wide. Team owner for Fisher Motorsports in that leading GTM machine. You can see retaking his position on track. That shows just how crazy this race is. We're only an hour and a half into this one, guys, but it genuinely feels, and I don't want to sound too critical of the teams here. I'm not trying to do that. Trust me, I, we've saw some fantastic racing from all of these drivers last time at Spa. It was one of the greatest races, endurance races, I've had the privilege to be able to broadcast. Unfortunately, this is proving to be the polar opposite in terms of race quality yeah. right now. Yep, that, absolutely. That's, that's the one thing that came to my mind about how how these teams that put up such an excellent race the last time out are just having such a calamity right here. I mean, this race is turning out to be no less than a pantomime in this particular case. And I don't know, the, the thing that comes closest to my mind is that if you want to watch, if you want to watch out of carnage, pandemonium, drama, you can watch WWE. That, that, that was going on yesterday <laughs> not on TV, but this is not supposed to be that. I, I'm... I don't know. Hopefully, the next two and a half hours bring something better, but uh, I, I'm, I'm wincing at this stage. No, I, 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 I think that reaction is on, honestly fairly warranted. I'm mirroring that right now. I'm trying not to get frustrated by the drivers because there's so much quality up and down this field right now. And I mean, we look at the leader right now, Team RSO, Niels Benedict. I mean, we saw him getting involved in an incident with the No Luck EM Sport car. It's not just smaller, newer teams to endurance racing getting caught out. The big names are having issues here. So under caution for a third time here. 90 minutes gone. Two hours and 30 minutes still to go. Jonathan, I'm going to ask your thoughts on this right now quickly. We've had a few retirements, but not too many retirements as things stand. The only potential retirement I think that's actually going to be retired might be that Dirk Van Tolden driven torque freak racing car so we still have 54 cars out on track right now or 53 if you exclude van tolden who are going to be causing issues in traffic and again we're only 90 minutes into this if we have another 90 minutes of this imagine how many more incidents we're going to have to replay here up on race spot tv it, it it just comes down to just and being patient a lot of these incidents are guys that are just running out of patience there's losing track awareness, losing awareness of what's going on around them. And, you know, to your point, like, we have some guys towards the top of the field that have very good awareness. RSO, unfortunately, has gotten an incident, but we haven't talked about much at the top of the field. The 19 Hellracers car is all of a sudden in second, and they've avoided the trouble, unlike their team car. The Pure Sims Esports car, the number two, it was almost involved in that incident up in the Honda. So it just comes down as we're getting a replay here. Don't tell me something has gone wrong under the safety car. We have a Quarzar Sim Racing Corvette going down in a turn one. Ah, he's just Shucky. <laughs> 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 he's just trying to rejoin the safety car queue, and you can see the AOD BMW also coming to a stop there. So fortunate. I, I think we both had the same fear there for a second, Jonathan. Another crash <laughs> under caution would have been slightly unbelievable, but given how the day's been going, I think pretty standard. And, and also, I think the sad thing is that sim racing always isn't that way. And the, the sad thing is that I, I think that's one thing that was prevalent during the lockdown and all the fun championships that were broadcasted. There were lots of crashes, builds and everything. And the new people who came from casual motorsport into sim racing thought, hey, this is rubbish. This is nonsense. They're just crashing against each other. That's not what sim racing stands for. In fact, that's not what Ivor and John stands for. It's just been an odd day here today. But it's all for the best. Oh, and also, guys, uh, strategy is something to look out for. We totally forgot that amidst all the chaos that just happened here. <laughs> Well, now the pit lane is open. Pit lane is open, and it looks like all the LMP2 cars diving onto the pit lane, except RSR by Jeep Performance, the 156, choosing to stay out, but I'm a little perplexed by that decision because they apparently are 25 laps into their stint. So is WOSR iZone Performance, the number 51 for World of Sim Racing. So there you can see a busy pit lane as all the LMP2 and GT machines dive down into the box. 
And a few driver changes taking place as well. Niels Benedict out of the 97. Angelo Mikel into that car. As Pineapple Racing has also stayed out. Actually, guys, let's while, while all of these changes are shaking up and you can see some teams choosing to take some tires, others not. So Delta Sport and TNT Racing, the two cars who are going to be waiting at the exit of pit lane now as the rest of the field... Oh, this queue. is going to get chaotic. Yeah, look at this queue of cars behind them now. It's just going to be absolutely crazy. That number 62 as well going to merge out in just a few seconds' time. But while they all wait for the pit exit to be open, there you can see a, a beautiful shot of the rear as well as Main Straight is clear, just waiting for the world f word from Race Control. Pineapple Racing. We talk about them doing something slightly different. There you'll see, they're just 14 laps into their stint. They're on a similar strategy to Team Hoisingvelt, the number 48, that's currently 7th in that class. But guys, this is a different strategy than... We're seeing three different strategies here, if you will. We saw all of these LMP2 cars who have just come down onto pit lane. We've seen a few of these seven cars who have been out there for about 26, 27 laps as things stand. So that's one extra strategy that's being played. But then you've got the strategy that Pineapple Racing and the Team Hoisting Belt number 48 are on. 14 laps into their stint. Clearly, they are trying something different on strategy here. And I mentioned it, like, it might not work under green, but now with these safety cars, maybe Pineapple Racing, you know, this is going to be a good idea for them. And, you know, Mantini Racing as well just pitted under green, the opportunity to stay out. So this, this could be key here in determining... You know how this lineup shakes out and the entire lineup is going to be shaken up obviously the, the 156 and the 51 have stayed out i don't know if that's just because they wanted to pit when pit lane was a bit more empty or if they just staying out for the heck of staying out but it's going to be interesting to see how this really shake up shakes up the field so if you're tuning in for the first time today welcome to race bot tv glad you're joining us here <laughs> the second round coverage of the ivor endurance series and the four hours of Phillip Island. Just past 90 minutes then done in this one. And we're on the safety car for the third time today. Talking about the strategy though, look at Maniti Racing. They're only 10th right now as things stand. They've got a bunch of cars in front of them who are also on uh, slightly different strategies. But I think, guys, the team that is in the best possible position right now is Kinetic Racing. The 283 Mark Torres at the wheel for them right now. But there you can see one lap. So they are the leading car that has just come down the pit lane. Once the rest of their field, once the rest of... Oh, oh whoa, there, whoa. there is a crash in the background. That's one of the VEC Porsches. Uh, what has happened? Come on, guys, oh, please. Oh, traffic. Uh, this is just uh, shocking. You can see there that's the VEC 372 that's now nosed itself into the wall with one of the eye liveries cars having turned it, but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a deep, calm breath here and just tell everyone watching, this is not what you should expect, typically, from the Ivra Endurance Series. The, we've seen a number of Ivra broadcasts here on RaceBot TV over the last about six or seven weeks. It all starts with the Ivra GT Sprint Series, which Sumil and I were on the call for the very first round of. Some fantastic scraps between the GT3 machines. Then we had the Ivra Endurance round number one, the 12 Hours of Spa, which was equally exciting to watch as... Um, 12 hours of racing action was decided by one final safety car. Then the Ivor Club Sports Series. Again, some fantastic racing to watch. This, though, has not been so fantastic to watch. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay. As you see the tail end of it, that 372 oh. just pointed the wrong way. I mean, Sumo, this is just... If this is contact between two cars, I mean, I don't know what else you can say other than what are they doing? What do we see now, then? Okay, uh, we'll try to stay as objective as we possibly can. Ooh, there's the Pure Sims Concertina. car. Concertina. Yep, Concertina effect. Pure Sims car. Uh, weaving? Uh, weaving is supposed to be done because you want to warm your tires up, of course. Even though the tight temperature is hot, you want to get your tires up to the right temperature, optimum grip, to make sure that the car goes as fast as possible. That is what the PND car was doing. No, the Pure Sims car was doing, I beg your pardon. But what happened eventually was that the gap was so close that when both the cars were weaving against each other, I mean, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a small overlap cycle between the GTE car and the LMP2 car behind, when they both try to weave against each other and then they meet together. That is when this happened. That, that's all I can say. I'm not going to put any personal judgments over in this case. I'm not going to share my opinion on that because it's quite evident, isn't it? But yep, tried to dodge, weaved, and hit him on the side. And there is 
a rather sorry looking Porsche facing sideways. And, and if we jump back to live picture, something else has just happened. There you see Simon Underhill. He's had to pull off as they run up towards Lukey Heights. So these... Oh, what has happened there? Let's jump on, on board That's there. That's hardware. That's got to be a hardware. Let's see if we can take a look, Jonathan. Walk us through this. It's one of the safety car. Yeah, it looks like the wheel just having an issue or if it just got lost or something. I don't know, but because the wheel keeps turning left and just keeps going left. Well, he doesn't make it back out onto track. So whatever's happened for the Nomad Sim Racing team, not an ideal way. Oh, no, actually, they had to reset back to pit lane. So I think you're right, Jonathan. Looks like a hardware failure for them. Let's jump back to live pictures, though, because the cars are coming out of turn one once again. So we're looking like lights off on the safety car. This might be our third of the safety car restarts. A lot of chaos to unpack over the last 15 minutes or so. And I hope I'm not sounding too disappointed, guys, because I was really looking forward to this race. I came straight over from the qualifying series for the Porsche Esports Super Cup, which I was on the broadcast for. I jumped into this one with just so excited to be here at Phillip Island, which is what I thought might be one of the more interesting endurance races that the iRacing service has seen in some recent history. But unfortunately, I mean, it's interesting more because of all the replays that we get to take a look at and all of the contact that's happening out on track. Yeah, we, we saw, like you and me, Arjun, you know, covered a, an excellent, an excellent uh, Skip Barber race here. And, you know, we, we knew it was going to be a bit chaotic, a bit hectic, but we were hopeful that a lot of these top drivers would be able to get through the field and be able to manage everything all right. But right now we're looking at a field, like, with still more than halfway to go in this race that's battered and bruised. And you can see a lot of damage on the rears of the LMP2s, spoilers out of line, the GTs, the front end damage. It's just, you know, I'm pretty sure all the drivers and teams might be disappointed at themselves as well because they, they, they probably came into this race thinking, all right, it's a tight racetrack. It's going to be intense. We need to manage what we do and manage how we run. And right now, it's just, it's not going to anyone's plans at the moment. Well, lights are still out on the pace car. I'm waiting to see if we get one more lap here. So just wait and see. What does the pace car do this time around? Lights are off. So, done. yep, lights are off. We're going back racing this time around. Pace car down onto the safety of pit lane. Number 51 putting a lot of pressure onto the 156. But the 156, it is the start that he would have wanted for RSR by G Performance. And we go across the line and already stretching out slightly. But there you can see two, three wide as all the cars start to file their way down into turn number one for the first time. Look at Maniti racing as well, having to watch as three or four of these LMP cars try to make their way around. That's not going to work out nicely into turn one. Three wide, they go Hoisingveld <laughs> in the middle. And Hoisingveld has managed to make it work. And now they're going to split another car as they work down into turn number two. That's the Vector Sim Racing Porsche, Ooh. who gets used as a pick by the number 33 Delta Sport U4K team. Delta Sport U4K up to seventh on this restart. Now his team Hoisingveld loses more in contact oh. with the Vector Sim Racing car. So car Carnage on this restart once again and fiercely forward that number 34 up to Hoisingveld once again getting stuck behind a GT machine. They're now down into 10th position and having to fight off the pure Sims car behind them. But still the LMP2 is oh. trying to get past. And, and more, this. more, more contact. Uh, this is coming uh, in through Honda. You can see, sorry Sumo, I didn't mean to cut you off, but there you can see as the cars way. rejoin. Just utter chaos on the restart here. Oh, was we'll that RSO? Is that no, RSO? Is that RSO? That is RSO. What has happened to the Team RSO car? We didn't notice that they had fallen down through the field that much, but the what seems to have happened, I'm taking a look at my timing screen, Jonathan, RSO has taken tires the last time around compared to everyone else in front of them. That's why they're so much further back. So RSO, the number 97 in 18th place, down the inside of Vector Sim Racing on those fresher tires. What can they do now as they work through the last few corners? They were involved in that contact as well. I saw them off track for a brief second. They got held up a little bit so hopefully not much damage on that car but this has been a car that's been out front and almost gets into the rear of the Ford GT out of the last corner. So once again then as we cross the line two hours 21 minutes ago let's start trying to figure out what all happened on that third and most recent safety car restart. Racebot TV replay then as we work down in towards Honda corner that's the contact oh. made with Vector Sim Racing Stacy Dunigan getting forced off the track 
What then happens with the VEC car? This is actually a separate incident, in fact. This is down into turn number one for NRAC Esports, Ooh. and they spin one of the BMWs. That's the L1 Esports with Marco Rinko behind the wheel there. So that's what happens, and Shriten has to cut turn number one and two. That's going to be an iRacing slowdown for him as well. What happens then on the run down into Honda? This is where more carnage took place. So what happens here? The 134, that's the Fiercely Forward Am. LMP car just gets spun oh, and caution oh. flag out once again. So not a quick turnaround there. We're back under caution once again. Well, I think what happened was that Silas Scratch were like, it was excellent in the Formula 3 car. Just maybe, did he tag on the grass a bit? Because I saw one of his wheels up there. Okay, let's take a look at his replay once again. There's the, there's the bumpy 911 in the background. Right, so he comes in. No, he loses it before he gets on the grass. So perhaps... Stamping on the brakes a bit too hard in that case. Maybe the brake bias being a bit of an issue. Sometimes the rear just goes away from you in an instant. Maybe that's what happened to Sudas Crash Roll like. And a couple of drivers had to take avoiding action. Now, the VEC sim racing team just get bullied off. Look at this one. Or, or is that the one after? Yeah, th that's the one after the incident. So they just have to wait, stop again, gain the momentum. And RSO were out wide as well. RSO out wide. Let's take a look at what I think has brought out. This fourth safety car you see here, no luck EM Sport. Oh my, what a torrid day for the 313. And quite frankly, if you are a no luck EM Sport, you have to start questioning if your bad luck of run is due to almost this Ivra series. It's been torrid for them. Let's take a look once more at this one as they go down in towards Lukey Heights. You can see that's the 102 car that makes the contact with them. The Team Vikings car that's been in the wars a little bit today and no luck EM Sport off into the barriers and I think that might be the reason why we have another caution flag out. Let's take a look at another replay though. This might be a bit more telling as to why we're back under caution. Jonathan, walk us through this one. Another LMP2. Oh my oh, no, goodness, my goodness gracious. That just... And oh yeah. no! Yeah, yeah that, that's why we're under caution if anyone was wondering. What in the world? Like, we need another angle of that. that. He just got, like, they tried to launch him all the way across the sea into Tasmania, into number 14, as the Phoenix Racing Esport just minding his own business, gets clobbered from the side, and off into the beach, and towards Tasmania he goes, and there was just nothing, nothing he could do, and now he's just stuck in the barrier. And that is a vicious contact with the wall. Let's take an onboard look. There you can see the car buried in the tire barrier once again. Let's take a look on board then at this angle and see if we can just watch the speed at which the number 205 goes into the wall. There, no, no even inkling that that contact's about to happen and the 205 buried into the tire wall. An unfortunate one there and... Sumil, I, I'm, I don't want to try and play, place the blame now, but we've seen so many of these contacts involving LMP2 cars that are quite frankly doing things which are very, very risky. I'm not saying that they don't have to do them because, again, everyone wants to win the race that they're in. But again, there is a difference between a risky move and uh, an absolute send, if you know what I mean. And I feel like we're on the wrong side of that balance right now. A lot of cars making some very aggressive passes given the speed difference across classes right now. Yeah, th there are. And uh, someone in our YouTube chat, I think that's Craig Jones, has pointed out that impatience is a bit of an issue right here with the LMP2s. And that, that's something that I can fully agree with. Uh, uh, but honestly, speaking for the driver's psychology, being in the faster car, you do feel like you have a bit of authority. And actually, you do. You do have the upper hand in terms of the GTE cars. They are supposed to move aside. And I'm not blaming, blaming the track here, but there isn't enough room always for the GT cars to move aside cleanly. So, in this case, there is a bit of a, let's say, unspoken agreement that you wait. And the LMP Drew driver will definitely be frustrated. They will be angry because I am losing time against the other car, for sure. But it is way better than crashing out or maybe hitting the other person and getting a penalty to just lose time on track. And as outrageous as it may sound, as a racing driver, as a competitor, you don't want to lose time normally, but this is the track. It is what it is. It's like a fixed overhead. You can't get rid of it. This is what you need to function. This is what you need to keep going. This is the track. You either adapt to the conditions, which again, third shot of the day, easier said than done, or 
you just crumble out and burn out just the way that these guys are but folks i urge you please stay tuned on the stream please keep watching there is still lots of time left in this race and with all the incidents going past hopefully the drivers are learning are adapting and that's the one beautiful thing about ivor series that the championship that's very well run and administered so the race control will definitely be enforcing things and hopefully that enforcement brings us back clean so don't leave there is good racing on the way yeah don't leave this was a quickie yellow as well as a result of a short turnaround across those two caution periods so rsr by g performance the number 55 and boris evando does need to come down pit lane very shortly gonna get us back to racing action once again for the fourth time we restart under safety car and look at the cars as they file their way down too wide as well pure sins and hell races as they work across the start finish line into turn one for the first time evando leads by seven tenths of a second from the rest of your field. Let's try and take a look at other battles though. What's happening with the Pure Sims car and the Hell Racers car? Hell Racers using the Fisher Motorsports GT Pro machine as a pick as now the second Hell Racers car around the outside trying to make the move work. Pure Sims number two, they're gonna sweep to the outside down in towards Honda Corner. Looking like a cleaner restart this time around. We'll jump to a battle right in front of them though. Delta Sport U4K up to fourth position already and putting pressure now on HD Simsport out front. The top three cars as things run, RSR by G Performance, High Caliber Autosport in LMPM, and HD Simsport also in LMPM. All three cars do owe us a pit stop though, so it's Delta Sport U4K, fiercely forward, the number 34, and TNT Racing, the number 81, currently leading your LMP category. And TNT Racing and Delta are clearly right now the favorites to do to claim the lead, but they really got to work through this AM traffic and some of the traffic that has stayed out, as you can see, TG Racing. Remember, last time out in Spa had a bit of a bit of an off, bit of a safety car little incident. However, right now they've had a very clean race. Crash, very, very crash, crash, crash in the background. Race. What has happened? This is a big one involving a few cars, I do think. Team oh, 11 no. involved in this one as well. You can see the Team Hoisingvelt 248 down in ninth place. Let's take a look at the race spot replay and see if we can figure out what's happened here as we get back to racing action here. The 248 going through Luki Height. Sumo, talk us through this one. Okay, all clean right here at this stage. Another LMP driver diving down the inside as he should be, but on the exit, oh no, oh no. This is what you hate to see. And yes, at this case, I will pause and say that, yeah, it's a tough corner. It's a tricky corner. And as we mentioned, Arjuna, on the YouTube channel, with a little bit of patience, it can just work out fine. Team 11, I'm not sure that it's completely their fault. They just got caught in and got clobbered in this mess. And they did respectfully let the LMP2 pass. Here they come then, heading downhill. What will you see? You will see a slow down Hersingwell car. Where, where can you go? Nowhere. Do you bump it through? Uh, it's a shame. Uh, I'm so... I feel bad for the Team 11's car, but... Yup, it's a tricky corner. And Vector Sim Racing 2 once again getting on the grass. So perhaps that board I was talking about early on, having a bit disclaimer about uh, the grass being slippery, make that 10 times bigger then. That's what happens right here oh no and someone else finding out the grass is slippery in towards turn number two the fiercely forward 134 don't rejoin boys keep that car safely to the inside of the track a good job there from silas in the 134 to keep that car under control that car was very very wild there was another accident as well so more replays to take a look at now this one involving one of the rsr by g performance cars nathan block behind the wheel of the 156 as we work down into, oh no, Lukey Heights once again, the scene of more drama for the 248 Hoisingveld machine. And then oh, Maniti no, Racing! No, Maniti Racing gets spun as well. Oh. All sorts of carnage coming on here. Let's take a look at more replays. Jonathan, walk us through this one. Well, it's an uphill corner and you go downhill and it's you're, you're running in this corner blind. You see, and there's an LMP2 that tags him, a Porsche that tags him, Geodesic to the outside and thankfully not a lot of contact, but that's that's heartbreaking a little bit rough for a team that had on strategy was probably in position to have a really really good day but you see up the hill right down here and it, 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 he just sees this right in front of him there's nothing he can do to react well what i think is we're starting to get up to the point where race control might need to throw out a caution just to keep some of these guys under control more replays to look at by the way from this extended set of incidents. Watch on board with Carlos Vila in the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing. He also has to stop and get, uh, put the anchors out to stop in front and see all of that carnage. 
It's an unfold in front of him. So there was three or four cars involved there. Let's take a look at some more replays, because once again, like I say, more things to take a look at here. For fact, Auto Tech Sim Racing, this is by themselves, already sideways as well. So something big has happened to the 396. Let's take a look at this one. Losing the rear, coming through Lukey Heights. So that's going to be a solo car incident. Unfortunate there, but... The 396, fortunate in many ways, I guess, Sumo, not to get wrecked up with a lot of the other yep. cars as well. Yep, we, we talk about being lucky in terms of when the safety car comes out. Hell, you need to be lucky in terms of where you are on the track as well, in case you see some drama otherwise. But guys, uh, it's not what Ivra is all about. Uh, so don't, don't, don't just say that, yeah, we should expect a, a drama fest or a crash fest in the next one. This is not what Ivra is about. It's just a, just an unfortunate day that we're having right here. And should be a lot better. We've seen these teams produce absolute gems of races, gems of battles. And just go back and watch any Ivor endurance race, club sport, summer series as well, GT sprint. This is an excellent championship, an excellent organization in the way things are run. But some things, sometimes bad things can happen. Let's hope for good things as Delta Sport UK4, U4K, I beg your pardon, tries to chase up on that battle for second position and they were doing quite a decent job. And Christopher Urban, you I can tell by experience, is a superb driver. I've seen him a bit in the Formula 3 cars and honestly, he's a man who can keep it clean. I don't want to jinx it, but he's got a certain aura of aggression surrounding him. There's a certain charm of this man when he drives. And if he can keep it clean right here, well, he can make it really fun. And we say hello to the entire watch party, indeed, that is going on for the Delta Sport U4K team. Thank you for tuning in. Not maybe what you would have wanted to see in terms of racing action, but good to see the team car up in third place as things stand. Must point out, two cars in front, the number 55 and the 131, both do owe us a pit stop. So... Delta Sport U4K, they've got TNT racing right behind them right now. That's the battle for the net race lead here in your LMP Pro category. So right now looking good for Hobinho as you see a car diving down onto the pit lane. That's a Vando from the race lead in the number 55. So now up into second and now Milo Limford leading LMP Am also leads this race overall, but not for long. Herbinho down the inside into turn number one. Not the fight that Limford needs to pick and Limford's going to lift off the throttle and give first place up to Herbinho. Take a look then at some of the other battles as well, because there you'll see the number 34 pressuring Andreas Olsen in the Hell Racers number 19 car in front of them. More battling going on. Team RSO on their charge back through the field on those new tires. They're up to 10th place and putting pressure on HD Simsport as they work down into Honda as well. So how far is the RSO car behind right now on strategy? About 10 seconds, Jonathan. So those tires, well, they're going to need to find about 10 seconds of pace just from those tires now as around the outside goes the RSO car. I just want to overcook those tires too. Remember, we talked about the track temp being very, very hot here in the summer in Australia. And it's going to go into Siberia, able to get the move done. And now the two AM cars right behind fight it out. And the Heidschke field and the geodesic racing car now held up by the two that are side by side. And it's where a little on the curve laps at iRacing. Able to get the move done. And now Heidschke field moves through. So, and, and the other issue I think is as well is that we have these pro and these AMs that are mixed together through no fault of Ivor's own, it's just the way that the iRacing pro system works. We can't separate the two classes in qualifying and pace and scoring, so because they're being scored and placed together, it, it's caused a few problems, and you can see the AMs and the pros racing each other sometimes very, very hard. We'll take a look then at your GT race leader. We haven't really talked about race leads much because we spent so much of this race under caution. As unfortunately no luck. EM Sport once again. This is at turn number one, I do believe. They've been forced potentially off the track. RaceBot TV replay to look out before we get back to the battle in the GT class. Let's look at this. This is... Oh no, this is with the 33 car who has just made contact with the 313. So the 313 seems to be a magnet right now for every single one of our top running LMP cars. They have been hit by basically the entire field that has led this race at one point or another. Let's take a look on board then with the 33. It's coming around the last corner, Sumo. This is just that difference of speed into turn number one and Herbinho slightly miscalculating it from the race lead. Yeah, I've, I've jinxed it, haven't I? I just have. Okay, I, I'll try. Oh boy. That was a huge hit. He clobbered in. He got bullied. And we say this consistently. LMP2 cars usually bully the cars around, but not this physically. Well, uh, I, I, 
I'm, I know I'm going to be criticized quite a bit for making it seem very funny, but it's going to be actually very, very sad for the 313 car. But, well, if there's one positive, at least their camo livery is doing a good job in making sure that they can't <laughs> be seen. Well, if you're not going to have luck, I guess the best way to do that is maybe camouflage in. More bad luck, by the way, for one of the laps at racing cars. Let's take a look at another RaceBot TV replay. Some of my favorite words today. Don't know the 62 is going to get involved in this one. That's Miguel Vigo who's gotten back into the Alpine Stars geodesic car. Mm. Oh, and that is light contact being made between two cars in different categories. The 169, obviously an LMP Am, Jonathan. And, well, unfortunately, he was trying to hold on to the position there and uh, cut across the nose of the number 62. Yeah, and just, I don't know if he wanted to not concede to the 62 or just not let him buy. And, uh, again, it, it's a tough ask for these AM and these pro teams because they have the same pace, relatively speaking. We saw in qualifying, at least in GTs, the AMs were mixed in with the pros all throughout. As we look back at our leader for Fisher Motorsports, a team that is, you know, in, in qualifying showed really good pace in both pro and AM. They have a three second lead, but, you know, and we saw the only real difference was that the LMP2, the pros at front, there was five or six that were good. And let's talk about strategy very quickly because Fisher Motorsports does lead, but 36 laps into the stint. They'll be due down onto pit lane in just a matter of time. This might actually work out to their benefit, though, here, guys, because while they're pushing the 36th lap of their stint, let's jump back to the first car in class that has pitted then and take a look at kinetic racing speed in the 283 car. There you can see 15 laps is the stint, so about 20 laps difference between these two teams as things stand. But the important thing, you see that gap, 10 seconds. Right now, guys, I think if that Fisher Motorsports car can push the stint for about 10, maybe 15 minutes if possible, that might be pushing it a bit too far. But they may be in a situation where they can cut an entire pit stop relative to their competition right now. So there is some intrigue at the front of this GT field in terms of strategy right now. As they're now watching the battle for second and third between RSR by G Performance and Hell Racers 219. Okay then, this should be interesting. A BMW versus a Porsche. Phillip Island, it's a lovely track to have a race on. So the BMW is... Perhaps looking for something at turn number one at Doohan Corner, quite like Mick Doohan used to do back in the day right here, but yeah, not really working out with that big boy at that turn. Again, using the camera to your advantage, powering out at just about the right moment at this particular corner because you need a good run for Honda. But someone else who needs a good run for Honda is the RSO team with fresh rubber going down the inside at turn one. That is going to be a splendid move. They did get a helping hand by the car losing out the position in that case. But nevertheless, RSO with fresh rubber already moving, what, around 10 places? And their That's own stupid. only five and a half seconds. Watch as that gap continues to get cut as Angelo Mikel puts on some impressive driving performances. One of the quickest cars on track as things stands right now, using that fresh rubber to maximum benefit as they work through Honda in towards Siberia behind the German Sim Racing BMW GTM machine as Team RSO now right behind the 182 for PND Racing. Another class battle, or rather, another battle not for class position, instead for overall track position as they work around the Maniti Racing BMW. Something else has happened in your GT field. It's been a rough day for some of these competitors. Well, we jumped on board with the 305 Vector Sim Racing car for just a second. Let's see what has happened to Stacey Dunegan once again. And coming through turn number two, getting a bit wide, feeling the pressure from Pure Sims behind them. Pure Sims will be happy that that car didn't spin out in front of them. But I think, unfortunately, guys, for that 305 car, they've been... They've been through the wars so many times with LMP2 cars that they really didn't want to get involved this time around. As we're watching three wide down the front straight and RSO up into sixth place now around uh, the PND racing down the inside. RSO cars driving <laughs> with authority and with aggression and he is taking no prisoners right now as it looks going past the geodesic BMW. He looks to go into the inside of the Hell Racers into Honda. He's going to have a huge draft coming into Honda. Big on the brakes. Everyone has to check up to the slower Team 11 car right there. And the R, like now, like the Hell Racers and the R RSR car, that's for track position. Like that RSO could move up into the podium places pretty soon. That RSR car is actually a lap down, so 
RSO are being helped out here because Hellracer's number 29 really getting checked up through the traffic. Looking around the outside potentially for Lukey Heights. He's not going to stick his nose down there. Instead, going to try and set it up. Coming out of turn number 10 on that run down to turn number one. Using that traction of the fresher rubber. Able to take a little bit more of a wide line on the entry to the corner. And that's going to set up a good run here through turn number 12 down the back straightaway. As that RSR car as well is having to make its way around some lap traffic. There you can see the train of cars coming across the start-finish line, Sumo. Yep, here they come. Then you can see them rocketing past. And the RSO eSports car are getting closer as it stands. Remember, fresher rubber playing into their advantage. And now you may be asking the question, uh, what kind of an advantage does RSO have then in this particular case? Well, they're easily chewing out so many tents in comparison to the other cars. And here they are then behind the Hell Racers. Hopefully they are going to make a move that lands them into sim racing heaven, not hell in this case. Gets ever so close. Again, this is where holding your nose plays an advantage. Keep it nice and cool. Could have spilled out, but it stays into perspective here, Arjuna. You know where the next move could happen? Lukey Heights, if they're bold enough. Well, and they're coming up right behind one of the Fords for Torque Freak Racing in that very distinctive livery around the outside for the number 97. That compromises his run in towards Lukey Heights. As they work their way down, there's another car that's off the track right now. That is VEC Sim Racing. That's the Porsche that got spun under caution. Let's take a look at a Racebot TV replay very quickly. What has happened to this Porsche 911 RSR? Just losing the rear end on the entry to Siberia, I do believe. And they're going to make contact with that tire barrier. Not what VE Sim, VEC Sim Racing and that 324 would have wanted. Let's jump back then to live pictures because Team RSO putting on the pressure and looking to get the boot done. They're in the grass though as they look to the inside. Hell Racers number 29 forces them in a very in, in a move reminiscent of Bahrain when Fernando Alonso famously said, you must always leave the space. Shut the door with yellow flag. authority. Did and the yellow racers. flag up. Caution is out. And this is for the laps at racing car, I do believe. So we just saw the Team RSO car having to go off into the grass. Let's take a look then at what's happened to bring out the caution flag. The 169 car, David Manaurit at the wheel. And they've just made contact with the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing BMW. And oh, that's a big one. And fortunate that... Oh my oh, goodness gracious. I was just about to say fortunate that they didn't get collected by anyone. But Samba Racing in their BMW... Nowhere to go and contact made and unfortunately the 169 took that toe back to pit lane in almost immediate fashion. I think much he could have done there. He was, he was out of control at a really opportune area of the track. That's when you're full throttle trying to get the power down for this long straight. But here we go. A kinetic racing car head tries to get underneath the geodesic car. Geodesic thinks there's a gap there. So does laps at iRacing. Huge hit there. From the I, the Iver paint scheme car right there, didn't see who that was, and another hit from the somber BMW and into the wall. That's going to be a very lengthy repair. And not just uh, into the wall, you could hear the engine blow for the 169 as we're under caution now for I believe the fifth time today. We'll watch here then as Samba Racing on board with the 258 from the roof cam. Coming through the last corner, you can see the contact as it's unfolding in front of them. The Kinetic Racing LMP2 car down the inside as Watch all of that tire smoke. Watch nowhere really to go for the 258. He tried to avoid going off into the grass sumo, but unfortunately, not much room and contact made once again. Front end's gone on that BMW, and that there was a Ford GT there, the Quasar Sim Racing Machine. He needs to change the tires and maybe a change of pants because yeah. he has to avoid the LMP2, and then oh, I think there's a Porsche that comes back onto the track there shortly. It, it's just, it's just horrible. Uh, this crash. I mean, it, it, I dare say it was a bit of a racing incident because the geodesic racing team. Well, they had to yield out the position, but they were in that particular part of the final corner where they couldn't exactly do that. And even the LMP2 machine, yeah, of course, a bit of patience, try, impatience rather, try to get that position early on, and it just did not work out for anyone, did it? Just clob and knock at each other. Look at this. So, yeah. I understand the LMP2's urge, because that's what you do as an LMP2 driver. You have to get the positions without losing time. And all that you see right here, I don't even need to comment on that. It's just pure pandemonium. Look at this. The geodesic BMW car, I think he just could have gone slightly wider, but well, not much. Look at the... 
Uh, yeah, he's flashing his headlights. I I'm going to cut in here because I think this is another risky move from a LMP2 car. Because, I mean, yes, sure. Uh, let I tell you what, give me a few seconds and I'll get a an onboard look then with the geodesic racing car. But at the end of the day, if the geodesic racing car continues on that line that... Laps are understeer off. Exactly. That's the problem. The way that car, the corner cambers in, the 201 for geodesic racing is always going to end up in the gravel. So let's watch here. Let's watch from the rear shot. You'll see one car is going to force its way down the inside. Okay, that, that 61 car makes it work just about. But you'll see here, car on the inside is going to commit. And then the RS, uh, sorry, the no. Alpine Stars car just tries to turn down to get to the apex of the corner, which is where he wants to be. To not run wide off the track and as a result yeah. well contact made you can see samba racing unfortunately taking the brunt of the damage in that one as well front end completely gone from their bmw m8 but we'll jump back to the live pictures then and uh sumo uh, just just talk to us about that incident very quickly then now uh, I mean, there's something interesting that's come up on the youtube chat and it's a it's a lovely lovely comment by jeremy ff1 who says uh Drivers or gardeners, I'm not quite sure. Well, the interesting thing is, Jeremy, that's something that we are confused about here today as well. But nevertheless, coincidentally, the home stretch is called the Gardener Straight. And Team 11, sadly, again, as you mentioned, Arjuna, if you don't go down the inside there, you, if you do not use the camber, this is what will happen. This is a clear visual evidence of what could have happened to the geodesic team had they not did what they did eventually uh, at that particular corner and the final one. So, yeah, the Team 11 sadly losing position as well. So, another incident inside caution. And the one thing that really comes to mind right now is uh, yoga, I guess. Just keep, <laughs> keep, keep calm, keep patient, keep, count your breaths, get deep breathing. It's not working out this way. I mean, we've got two Indians in the commentary booth, so uh, stereotypically that should help out. But no, honestly, just need to be patient at this stage. Absolutely. So we just ticked over then. Two hours done, an hour and 53 minutes to go. Um, this has been such a hectic race that usually we have some race spot fan immersions that would take uh, a, a few moments uh, to give us a breather here. But Jonathan, I'm just going to let you reflect on what we've seen so far today then, because I'm trying not to be too negative. Again, I don't want to be negative because I love this series. I love a lot of the regulations around it, and I love the racing that it tends to produce. However, today, it's hard to be upbeat about the racing action that we've seen, because while every time we get into a phase of the race where things are about to happen, things are about to get interesting, Caution Flag comes back up and mixes things up once again. Yeah, it's just super, super chaotic, and again, a lot of these incidents, we have, you know, LMP2s and GTs getting together, you have AM and Pros getting together, and it's just, it is just a bit chaotic, and I'm sure, you know, the race control is on the Discord or on the the, the speak in the iRacing service right now, and, and going, guys, hang on, you know, take a moment, you know, everyone needs to relax and, and try to calm down a bit here. Again, and it's, it, it's everyone so far that has had some sort of contact. I'd be hard-pressed to find a few cars that haven't had contact. Maybe the TNT <laughs> racing car has been pretty clean. And Fisher Motorsport has really had an okay day. They've gone off once or twice, but yeah. I think a lot of these guys have gotten into each other a little bit, Sumo. Yep, <laughs> it's a bit interesting. Some people, thankfully, coming out cleanly. That is what we want to see eventually. Drivers racing cleanly against each other. This is, this is the kind of thing that we normally expect with either competition. And it's something that I love very much. I mean, personally, I look forward to every single one of the Ivor races just because of the quality of the racing. But yeah, hopefully the next one hour and 52 minutes can show us just more of that. Of course, you might notice, folks, that there are a couple of GTE cars sandwiched between the LMP2s. And uh, Jonathan, we saw we saw the last time out that Maniti Racing and a couple of others were in this very particular position. But thankfully, we've seen some GTE teams just keep it clean, even in this situation at the restart. We saw it like last time going on going down into one. However, the the uh, Maniti racing car flashing his headlights at the LMP2s. I think, you know, I, I understand, like, the GT cars are not that fast off the line compared to, say, these LMP2s, but it's uh, it's definitely rough. <laughs> rough is rough is a bit of an understatement, isn't it, Arjuna? Uh, just a bit rough. As, um, 
Thank you for again. Reminder, you're joining us here live on RaceBot TV for second round coverage of the Ivra Endurance Series. We're just working, I believe, our fifth safety car of this race so far. And we have an interview that we'll get to right now, actually. I tell you what, we've got at least one more lap under caution that we have in front of us. And Jonathan, why don't you talk to Bernd Schmidt, driver from the 205? Unfortunately, Burnt, your, your guys' day ended pretty early. It was a hard contact with the 14. Talk us through that happened a little bit right there. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's really unfortunate. I mean, um, I mean the, the traffic was quite close after the restart, um, as it was before the other restarts as well. And uh, until there, we had a really good race, um, pretty good strategy. Um, we have used the safety cars in the best way we could. And um, yeah, what actually happened was that another GTE car was in front of us and uh, the LMP2 stuck a bit behind. And I think he lost patience then at some point. And instead of just driving uh, near of a straight line through because there was a big enough gap, he just decided to turn maximum to the right, hit us quite heavily, sent us into the wall. And that's really unfortunate. I mean, uh, at Spa, the sister car of this team actually crashed us out in the Antion and Rouge. And yeah, now this is yeah, really unfortunate and really sad for us. And we, we've seen a lot of chaos and a little bit of, you know, calamity with some of the, the LMP2s and the GTs in traffic. Like, like, talk us through, like, how intense is it, you know, obviously, be, not only being behind the wheel, but as a team, just watching your drivers and your car going through, like, all this traffic? Um, actually, I was close to uh, uh, unrhythm nearly all the time um, <laughs> because it gets so close and at every freaking corner. Um, so my driver sat me. It was quite hard, but it was okayish. So for him, uh, during the drive it was definitely nice. For me as a spotter, it was such a hard work because um, the LMP2 are closing the gap quite faster than you really think they do. And um, I had to look so many times where they are, how many of them are in line um, to give all these informations to my driver as well uh, compared to the other GTE cars so um, that he could set the car on the right side of the track to not block an LMP2 when fighting for position and some stuff. So yeah, I think all the spotters which are working today to get their GTEs or as well LMP2 through the field, they have a really hard work to do. And um, for the drivers, it's not too easy, but I think, or at least that's what I can say, easier as than uh, for us in the um, yeah, spotting part of the race. All right, well, thank you so much for talking with us. Unfortunately, it was very sad to see that 205 get stuck in the barriers, and we're hoping next time out in a month's time that you guys will be able to, to pull on a performance you guys are proud of. I know Spot it was also a bit of a struggle, so you know, thank you for talking with us so much. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the great broadcast. Good luck to all the other competitors. Thank you. So that was right, that was Bernd Schmidt, one of the drivers of the 205 Phoenix Racing Team that brought out one of the cautions earlier today, and it yeah, it's been a it's been a bit of a chaotic one for them, unfortunately. Uh, and you could tell the the frustration there uh, in that entire camp. Uh, almost used some some fruity language until he caught himself and uh, didn't make our broadcast an R-rated broadcast. So uh, clearly some frustration. And as I look in the um, series Discord chat right now, a lot of the teams are a bit frustrated by what they are seeing out on track and requesting a bit more patience from the rest of the competitors. So one hour and 47 minutes still to go then. We're under caution for the fifth time today. We'll get back going in maybe one or two laps time. Thank you for tuning into this broadcast live on RaceBot TV. As of this week, all of our broadcasts are going to be back on our own channels for the most part. So do follow us for more sim racing action. We've got YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Unfortunately, my boss Hugo Luis forgot that we also have a Twitter, uh, sorry, a Twitch channel. So uh, do go follow us at twitch.tv slash RaceBot TV. Most of our races are going to be simulcast across many of our channels and can choose the one that you choose to engage with the most. I know we have some active chat both on YouTube and on Twitch, and it's good to see our Facebook audience continuing to grow as well. So 
Go give us a follow. If you're not subscribed on YouTube already, go do that. Hit the bell icon to keep up to date with RaceBot TV and all the broadcasts that we have. More Ivor coverage coming up in a few weeks' time as well as the Ivor Club Sports Series returns as uh, so does the Club Club Series as well. I was just trying to remember. We have a... I don't remember which track it's at, but we have a four-hour Club Sport race coming up, so we're going to have a almost seven- or eight-hour broadcast here live on RaceBot TV. You do not want to miss that one. We also have the Ivor GT Sprint Series, which Sumil, you and I are part of, so... Yeah. It's always fun, and Ivor competitions are fun. That's what we want to reiterate here, because you're talking to the team that broadca is going to be broadcasting most of the Ivor Endurance Series from now till the end of the at, at, uh, end of the year. You're also talking to the team that's going to be broadcasting the Club Sports Series from now till the end of the year, and Sumil and myself are the team that broadcasts the GT Sprint Series. So Sumil, we've got a full slate of Ivor competitions, and like we say, a little bit disappointed here, but excited about the possibilities for Ivor this winter. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that really pumps me up. I mean, the moment I saw the opportunity for commentating on Ivra, I, I just jumped on and I couldn't resist because the quality of racing, the quality of drivers that we have here is amazing. Yes, you will come back at me and say, but it's not been the case today, Samuel. But yeah, some, sometimes uh, things happen and things have been happening here today. But on the whole, it has been fantastic with Ivra in every single one of the series that we've had right here. So lot more to come should be very interesting but first time for the safety car to peel in not just that yet time. unfortunately not Sumo. just yet you yeah. just no, jinxed i missed it. the lights you <laughs> just jinxed it i think because until about three seconds ago it was about to be a safety car restart so i tell you what then we haven't had much <laughs> opportunity to run down the standings because we spend more time under safety car than we do the actual race but let's take a look then at the standings and let's run you through them Fiercely forward, the number 34 car leads this race. They do have to come down pit lane in just a few moments time, though. They're 26 laps on the stint. But, of course, with the number of safety cars that we've had, they are able to extend the stint. We'll see when they dive down onto the pit lane. Second place, Hell Races, the number 29 car. You see there's a car in between. That's one of the lapped RSR by G Performance cars. They will have to clear the number 55 before they can challenge the number 34. However, they'll be looking behind more than they will be in front because Team RSO on those brand new tires looking to get to the race lead. All of these cars, by the way, in the top eight do owe us a pit stop. Everyone from about 11th on back has come down pit lane recently, so split strategies starting to develop. Let's run you through the rest of the LMP cars, though, because PND Racing leads once again here in the LMP AM category. It's not been the easiest race in terms of pace, but playing the strategy game well to be in a good position as things stands. Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, the number 62, five seconds behind. Once you account for some of the cars, RLR Abruzzi Esports, the number 14, they'll be in sixth place. Then you got the rest of the LMP AM podium. Fiercely forward, the number 134 is going to be in second step off the podium with our favorite team name, the Rusty Spatulas, in 8th. And currently at the wheel for the Rusty, spa uh, rusty Spatulas, Mika Takala, who is uh, a Finnish driver, who also helps design the SimuCube wheelbases. So you see those SimuCube logo, uh, logos on that car? Well, that's because one of the designers and indeed uh, business owners of Granite Devices currently behind the wheel. Let's take a look quickly then at GT because we might go back racing this time around. Kinetic Racing, the 283, leads this class. By 1.2 seconds over Quasar Sim Racing in the 225. Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, the 201, wraps up the podium. Despite that contact that we saw them get involved with that brought out this co uh, contact, there is a 4 GT in second, as Jonathan Burke has very happily just noticed. Miniti Racing, 278 in fourth. L1 Esports, fifth. Team Hoisingvelt, the 248 in sixth. Hell Racers, the 219 in seventh. Fisher Motorsports in eighth. So none of... GTM cars currently at the front. So let's take a look then. Are we going back to racing this time around? Lights are back on the pace car. So not just yet. So I tell you what, let's run you through then your GTM podium as things stand because they're all in a queue of cars. The AOD Racing BMW currently leads in the 322. But right behind him, his teammate, the 321 Ferrari with Kyle Clements currently driving that one. Third place in class, right behind them, fiercely forward. Josh Clogg at the wheel for the 334. However, the two AOD racing cars 25 laps into their stint, fiercely forward, seven laps into theirs. So they will jump over 
those two cars in just a few moments time. Weren't those AOD cars both off in the grass at some point today? <laughs> it's it's been that chaotic for somehow we've been they've been off into the grass and exploring the Australian wilderness and now they're still leading their class, which is good for them and man, I'm really happy to see this four GT so far up the field. They're right behind Kinetic Racing as well, so this is a really good showing for them. Yeah, absolutely. And the we it's hard for us to show you the graphic now up on the screen, but you can see here about four or five cars in a queue. You got the L1 Esports. Number 221 at the rear. That's the last car that hasn't come down the pit lane. But if we put up this graphic there, you'll see Hell Racers. They are the first car that pitted under this caution period. And they are 14, about 12 seconds now, behind the top five in the class. So once we get back to green flag racing, a lot of pressure on the 219 to get out of the traffic and put in some good lap times and close the gap to these cars out front. It's not just one Ford that we have in this field, by the way this time around, Jonathan. It's great to see the 225 up in the field for Quasar Sim Racing. However, I talked about the incredible livery on this car. Torque Freak Racing, not running their traditional colors, but I, I must say, I really like the look of this car. And the 361 currently being driven by Casper Valentin. It's not had the smoothest start to the race, if we're going to call it a start to the race now that we're more than halfway in. But, you know, at the end of the day, Jonathan, we've got an hour and 40 minutes left, and I think really it's going to be a sprint to the end. You can't really think about the prior two hours and 20 minutes. You've just got to think now about how you're going to attack this last portion of the race. Yeah, I think that's where strategy goes out the window. you got to have to want your best drivers in there, get the, the setups and the adjustments that you need. And, you know, thankfully for the Torque Pick Racing, we've seen them in a few little calamities earlier, but the car's pretty much clean, and... I guess the nice thing about Phillip Island is that there is so much grass and runoff area that there hasn't been a lot of like major collisions apart from that last caution that we saw with the laps at iRacing team and that huge, huge accident on the front straightaway. And hopefully we don't get more of those. Is pace cars in, Arjuna? Pace car in, lights are off, and we're going to get back to green flag racing then. Can the fifth try be the lucky one? Fiercely forward, Tom Wallstra taking a very, very cautious approach to this restart. He's going to wait as long as possible to get on the power. But here comes the jump, and here comes the challenge from Team RSO behind them. There is that one lapped car, the RSR car, that's now going to have to give way as Hell Racers down the inside into turn number one. Here comes RSO as well, trying to get past and up towards the fight for the race lead. RSO around the outside as one of the cars getting quite wide through turn number one, able to gather that one up, but going to get through turns one, two, and three safely then as we dive down into Honda for the very first time on this restart. RSO is now looking, looking to the outside or the inside of the Hell Racers. He's looking inside into Honda. Who's going to be later on the brakes? RSO, deep and brave. Hell Racers gives them room. But a good job there, Nicholas Schneim. Room still side by side into Siberia. This is not where Angelo Michael wants to overtake, but manages to get it done. That was brave from both drivers, respectful from both drivers, and that's what we want to see here. That's what we're used to seeing here. Super pass around the outside. There's another car off in the gravel. That's the 396 who's had a few issues throughout this race so far. We'll jump back then to battles throughout the field. Look at that gaggle of cars as they dive their way out of Siberia. Three wide in the background. Two LMP2 cars trying to make their way around a GTE machine. As we're watching Kinetic Racing and Quasar Sim Racing doing battle for the race lead. Side by side around Luki Heights. Quasar is going to have the inside into turn number 10. They're not going to be able to get it done under braking though. Kinetic going deep getting that position back but here comes Alpine Stars geodesic racing as well all types of action happening here back in the pack but out front we've already seen diving down onto pit lane I think fiercely forward I'm not sure why they stayed out at that time but fiercely forward going to lose a whole heap of time as RSO back to the pointy end of this field and Angelo Michael now tries to run away with the race lead once again he's got a second gap already back to the Hell Racers treachery number 29 and somehow, the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing car has managed to get up to third as the PND M car diving to the inside of the lap car, the 55. He's trying to move as fast as he can. He knows he has a threat behind the fiercely forward LMP Am car. But yeah, it's been, it's been such a chaotic day that, again, M Miguel Vigo has managed to claw his way back to the front as we go back to GT racing. And, ah, uh, the Ford GT, you, you're, you are making me so happy right now putting this pressure on the Corvette. As much as I love the Corvette, this GT is definitely doing a good job. And maybe with this lap traffic ahead, he can get a good move. And that's no luck EM Sport that's holding up current class leader 
Mark Towers for Kinetic Racing as they dive their way into Lukey Heights once again. We ride on board with the 225 Ford GT. The GT car designed almost like a prototype in many ways. Drives a little bit differently as Kinetic down the inside of No Luck. Two Chevys side by side through turn 10. No Luck, the 313. Going to be forced to maybe give up the position here, but they're not going to make it easy indeed. The 283 has to tuck back into line as we work towards the last corner. This flat out corner where you try and just carry as much momentum as you can. But here comes the run then for the 4 GT. Are they going to split this lapped car? Oh, the yes. 4 GT looks to the, it looks to make it three wide in the grass. This is crazy stuff <laughs> on this restart. They're going to go two wide. Kinetic's going to have the outside line and the superior momentum into turn number two. What becomes the inside as well? Kinetic Racing going to hold on to second here. My goodness me, the Ford, the Kasasim Racing really, really trying his chances in that case trying to get that oh, no, position sorry. with the kinetic car sorry sumo the sister car we're watching the kinetic gt having a good battle but there you can see the sister car the kinetic racing velocity lmp2 car has had an issue coming down into honda corner let's take a look at the race bot tv replay involved i think with one of the rsr cars indeed there you can see the 156 for nathan block down in the braking zone what's going to happen here sumo a car's going to be spun around which it is facing the wrong way almost and rsr esports by g performance it's been a torrid day for them as well i mean you, you've got a feel for them and uh, i don't know maybe what 30 seconds later snap your finger check your watch there's going to be a protest being filed and oh another issue there for one of the front runners Again. in the gt pro class this is actually with another gt car though you can see manual mayor having to really wrestle that car through the grass to get it back onto track we'll take one more look at this replay as they go side by side almost with their teammate contact made with the rsr by g performance porsche 911 uh, so there is another issue on this initial restart as we get back up the green flag racing action let's jump back to the front of your field very quickly because team rso they now have a 1.5 second buffer over miguel vigo behind them but vigo is a man on the mission now jonathan he's back into that car back with fresh tires and looking to try and make up for some of his mistakes earlier on in this race clearly the damage on this car has not been that bad either he's, he's able to get through and i think the safety car period is help because you can go down pit road and you can repair some of that damage so maybe that car is back up to almost full working order. I'm going to have to see if he can chase some of the RSO car. These are two cars that at the beginning of the day were very, very equal in pace. And it wasn't until we hit traffic that things got a little bit dicey between these two. But it's been a really good day. And again, I'm, again the, the 4GT making me happy. Richard Small. Oh, oh my no. goodness gracious. That is the AOD Ferrari that has just gone end over end. The 321. That's the car that we just saw, and that might be another safety car. We've just come out of one safety car period. You can see, look at the damage to that car as he tries to make his way back towards the pit lane. That's Kyle Clements in the 321 AOD Racing Ferrari as, oh, no, Sumo. Let's take a look at the replay, but this might be another caution very, very quickly. Uh, right. Okay, then. AOD Ferrari. Was that... Co oh, my goodness me. That is huge. Oh, that's huge indeed. That is uh, magnificent if you're a big fan of crashes, but I'm not. So that's not really the best thing in the world. And look at that damaged, battered, bruised, rusty, broken, anything you like to call it. That is what the Ferrari is. The grass. Okay. So if there's one thing that's for sure that those, uh, those, those sort of trenches of sorts that we have right there they make for excellent ramps but what's their contact right here then so he got on the grass for sure no oh, no he lost it all on his own he lost it all on his own kyle clements and oh the and number just 34. got assisted and got taken off well uh i'm racing not top 10 that's the kind of stuff where you see this usually so and wasn't he our am leader as well like that he was in second place i believe that the sister car was was the one leading I think, yeah, he was in the in the fight, but one of those cars that did have to come back down pit lane. We do see the 396 having more issues through turn number two. I do think that one was. So we're back under green flag racing. Fortunately, I managed to avoid a second caution coming out, I think, on very short notice because Kyle Clements has managed to make his way down onto pit road, I think, and is now getting a lengthy repair to that Ferrari 488. Let's take a look then at some of the other... Drivers trying to make their way back up through the field. What's happened then to Delta Sport U4K? We looked at them slightly earlier. 
much higher up in your field. But there you can see Sumo. They're down in 16th place right now. Herbinho is handed over to Alexander Gravry, but a lot of work to do from this point for the 33. Yep, lots of work to do for the Delta Sport car. We saw them doing a good job early on, charging through the field, then being involved in a bit of contact. It's time for them to reclaim their hold on this race, and that's been something. I mean, the, the lead of this race has been a bit of a hot potato of sorts, with it being juggled around everywhere, but can we see this team grab something, grab the race by its horns, and take it forward? There's certainly the potential, I'll tell you that. So we'll see what... The Delta Sport team is able to do. Let's take a look, by the way, at the battle on third on track because PND Racing, well, they're an LMP AM team, but right now on the overall podium, and they've just gotten past the number 29 car to move themselves up into this third and final podium position. As there is a slow car in the background. This is coming out of Siberia, I do think, down on the run to Luki Heights. What's happened here for... Jonas Bodin in the Hell Racers 219 car. He's made contact with Casper Valentin, it does appear. So Casper Valentin in that Talk Freak Racing Ford that we love to see. And oh, they just get stacked oh, up in front of him. where did BMW come from? Let's, let's take an onboard look at this one, Jonathan. There was a white and black beam. I could not see exactly who it was, but it just out of left field almost. For, uh, almost out of actual Siberia. He goes a little bit wide locks it up and then there's just nowhere for these two to go done unfortunate contact there and more drama than at one of the slower corners pit lane is open four stops we jump back to the live pictures as rso and anglo angelo and michael down onto pit lane i do think they're going very slowly as you can see there they're going to pull into the box with the aod racing behind them getting some damage repaired so rso not going to take tires this time around uh, Angelo Mikel going to stick in this car, Sumo, but now he's got himself out to the front on those fresh tires. Let's see what he's going to be able to do back in traffic now that he's had to come down the pit lane. You know, the interesting thing is, hopefully for him, he hasn't pushed a bit too hard on those tires because we saw him do an excellent, excellent job carving his way through the field with such precision and getting to where he was now. This is where the true mark of an endurance racer can be seen. You've pushed hard, you've done a GP driver stuff. Now can you conserve? Now can you hold on to the tires and caress them gently and take them to the end of their life? That's their challenge right now. Let's focus on this battle with the Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, who have found themselves, who have found themselves rather in a bit of trouble early on. Now they are up against the Kassar Sim Racing car with Richard Small behind the wheel of that 4 GT and Jonathan must be quite happy to see them right there, aren't you Jonathan? I'm very very happy, it is, <laughs> I don't know where, I forgot what car they were battling but I believe cycles are starting so that I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these position changes for the lead as we see uh, the Fiercely Ford, Am cars, uh, Pro cars down in pit lane, we see Mantini's also down in pit lane with the driver change so definitely it's going to be interesting for strategy point where an hour and a half to go the GTs only need one more stop as the Geodesic looking outside, looking inside. They're going into Honda. The BMW Brave on the brakes. They're side by side. The GT is going to be able to, Ford is going to be able to get a bit more action as they have the Fiercely Ford and the AODC racing cars. I believe that is also for a position that BMW and that Porsche fighting right ahead of them. So yeah, this is a great battle to watch. That battle in front for 12th on track as things stand we must say kinetic racing marco mogren dived down onto pit lane about three laps ago so now just waiting for the 225 and the 201 to do the same as they head down in towards turn number 10 are they going to peel off onto pit lane this time around they'll require one more stop to go in about 50 minutes time for these competitors there might be some teams looking to extend this run all the way to the top of the hour they may be able to get it done on one more pit stop cautions obviously Going to be a big factor there as we continue watching the top two cars in your class not diving down onto pit lane this time around. And one thing that we really haven't talked about, guys, given how many cautions there are, we talked about there only being three tire sets allocated to teams for this race as the Quasar team down the inside of the Fiercely Forward Am car. Given that we've had so many cautions and they've been totally messing up, I think, for some teams, their schedule for how they wanted to use those tires and indeed use the drivers Tires are no longer a major factor, I would have to think. We've run so much of this race under safety car that I would have to think even in these warm Australian summer temperatures, these tires are still going to hold up just fine over the next 90 minutes.
Yeah, I think that should be fine. That, that shouldn't be a major factor for all the teams. But I think primarily it's just keeping track of where your car is in this particular stage in terms of the strategy because I, I, I'm finding it a bit hard to cope on with what each team exactly is doing in terms of their strategy. So for the teams, they've just got to be aware. And from the looks of things, the Kasasim Racing Ford is also quite aware of all the cars up and down behind them. So he had to get past the BMW, the AM car, which he did, the 222. And now, oh, well, what's happened here then? So what's happened for Pineapple Racing, one of the favorite liveries on the grid, just getting wide through turn number one onto the grass for the 105. And that's going to be a few seconds lost as they have to get back onto track, doing a good job to not swing back out into the racing line as well, despite those rear tires being lit up in the grass. But fortunately, a single car incident for the 105. They're still only about two seconds behind Team RSO as things stand. Some other battles raging on, by the way. It's not just out front. Here you go, Team Hoisingveld. Sentikowski back behind the wheel for the 248, chasing down another one of these GT Pro cars. RSR Esport by G Performance. RSR obviously having a very strong run of things in the Ivory GT Sprint Championship, where they campaign the GT3 machinery, but this time in the GTEs in that Porsche 911 RSR, having to fend off Sentikowski. He looks to the outside as there's a BMW Virtual Motorsports who's gone very deep into the corner there. We'll get a RaceBot TV replay in just a few seconds' time, but watch as Sentikowski looks to try and get the move done, coming out of Siberia, potentially, on the run up to Lukey Heights. So, Virtual Motorsport, that's the 270. Michael Storm still trying to get back out onto track as we watch this battle, Jonathan. That virtual motorsport car was in third place. Is now the Heisterfeld car looking inside, looking outside. He has to let the LMP2s go. There's the HD Simsport. There's a Hell Racers. There's the damaged Team 11. And there's five, six, seven cars. You can throw them under a blanket. Oh, going into Lukey Heights. We make it out alive, thankfully. But, oof, that was dicey. And now Heisterfeld is going to have a good draft going down into Duhon, but he's going to have LMP2s as there's flashing lights. I think it's the button that the LMP2s love the most. They love the flashing lights. <laughs> and that is a battle for class, uh, not class position, track position. Milo Limford in the LMP AM machine trying to fend off TNT Racing in the LMP Pro car right behind him. So there is battling as we continue watching right here. Let's take a look then at some of the RaceBot TV replays. There's been another few incidents. When they come, they come in bunches. There you can see Maniti Racing getting turned by one of the Hell Racers car. And there you see the PND Racing car that was leading your LMP AM category just a few laps ago has had to take a huge time loss there. They've lost about 13 seconds as a result of that incident. Let's take a look at that second incident that involved the virtual motorsports car. And you can see side by side just getting the braking wrong slightly as they headed down into Honda, Sumil. Yep, not working out well for either of them. Just uh, a bit too acrimonious for every single one of the teams involved. Virtual Motorsport, they are the team that we are riding on board with right now. Again, coming up towards Honda, it's left-hand kink at this particular stage. Then comes the LMP2, and then comes all the car carnage that follows. It's It's been a bit of a storm for Michael Storm. I just had to use the opportunity to make that pun. But no, unfortunately for Virtual Motorsport, uh, yet another case of them being bullied aside by LMP2s. And... Uh, we, we, we've run campaigns across the world about saying no to bullying, but you can't say no to LMP2 drivers, right? They're just causing too much damage. And Hell Racers, going, going through the deepest and darkest of gravel traps in this particular circuit, sliding away and losing time and positions. And now we see a few more takers down onto pit lane. The RSR by G Performance 156 is the car. The stationary in the box. So who's leading? This class right now, the Team Hoisingvelt number 48. They've been out there for a while. They owe us a pit stop. They're 21 laps into their stint as things stand. So we'll see them down on pit lane in a few laps time. More RaceBot TV replays to look at. There's always action happening out here at Phillip Island. What happened to Nomad Sim Racing? Getting on the grass as they come towards the final corner and that car snaps viciously on them as we'll try and take an onboard look at this one. But Jonathan, this was just a self-inflicted one and you know, Nomad Sim Racing, they've been through the wards and they almost clipped the Virtual oh. Motorsports BMW there. Just being very, very careful, trying to re-enter the track and then almost uh, almost the first day forward car gets into them as well. So yeah, look, the 322 checks up and then a little bit of a panic, I guess, from the Nomad Sim Racing. This is a car that's, fortunately, to its name, has been nomading around the, the grass here at Phillip Island, taking some exploration trips, but then right here and i'm very for virtual motorsport that's very very fortunate for them that they didn't get spun around and hit into the outside wall hard we've already seen one major accident coming out of this last corner 
Yeah, watch this view of that contact as it's being made. Virtual Motorsports does make contact, and you can see a little bit of damage done to the right front side of the bodywork for Nomad Sim Racing. So, Simon Underhill had a few issues that he's now going to have to overcome. Look at that damage on the right front portion of the clip as well. So that's number 122 LMP2 car not going to be in the most healthy of states. Just taking a look at my timing screen right now, the 248 Heusingveld car continues to apply pressure on the 255 RSR by G Performance Porsche 911. This is the battle for the net race lead once. The Quasar Sim Racing and Alpine Stars geodesic racing cars come down the lane. Sentkowski to the outside, trying to use the VEC Porsche as potentially an opportunity to make the move happen. Team 11 is also in the mix, but they are not for position as the VEC Porsche is going to block Sentkowski. Headlights being flashed, very irritated from the German driver, but he's lost about a full second right now and continues to lose time behind the VEC car as they work towards Luki Heights. That car does not want to give, make it easy. Sentikowski finally gets the move done as we work in towards Luki Heights now. There is this narrative of both drivers trying to make up positions while not losing time and you can often see them get on the edge, just be on the very edge of their, let's say, tempers in this particular case because they are emotional people. They want to drive, they want to win and in this case keeping a real good control of your emotions is going to be what's the defining factor now then the Porsche closes up on the Corvette once again with a couple of LMP cars coming up behind this should be interesting nice and clean then once again thankfully which is something that we shouldn't take for granted here yeah absolutely not it's starting to calm down just a little bit I think in terms of the on <laughs> you jinx it, Arjuna. <laughs> I'm knocking on all the wood around me I hope you can't hear that as well as I'm frantically trying to find free portions on my desk to knock on wood but now we're in 20 minutes to go then. We can finally start saying the racing action is delivering out on track right now. Watch TNT Racing as they chase down Andreas Olsen in the number 19 Hell Racers car in front of them. This is the battle for second place on track. Both of these cars, 19 laps into their stint and owe us a pit stop in the next few moments' time. It will be interesting how this... Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, TNT has had a really solid day and they've been in trouble. Like, we haven't mentioned them much in the cast. We mentioned the Hell Racers car. We mentioned RSO. TNT has quietly been just putting together a really solid good day. And then see currently behind the wheel and they, they are a factor right now. They are a factor indeed. They might even be potentially looking at a race win here given the strategy and how it's all playing out. There's also, obviously, we can't, can't rule this out, guys, because we are... We've already had five cautions to, uh, in this race so far. Both our club sport races and endurance race season openers had last hour safety cars that changed the story yeah. of the race. So I, I, I'm trying not to get too excited right now, knowing that the racing action is starting to level on track because we know that everything could be muddled up once again if we get one more caution and there is a very likely possibility, I would think, that that's coming in the next hour or so. Uh, how many though? That's a Torque Freak racing car that's gone off. Again? Torque Freak has not had an easy run so far. And that's down into Siberia, just losing it on the outside potentially for Joshua Wolf, who now has to get back onto track, get back up to racing speed in ninth place as things stand. And he's got the RSO car coming up behind him as well. Jump back to the live pictures. In fact, we're not going to jump back to the live pictures. We're going to jump back to another replay because... Casper Valentin in that Torque Freak Racing Ford has had an issue. This is coming in through Honda Corner. He's going to lose it all by himself on the grass. Don't rejoin into the path of others. He's going to get right into the racing line. And fortunately, they're not collected by the Rusty Spatulas. Let's take a look at that race spot replay in just a second. But the Rusty Spatula is doing a good job to avoid contact there. Certainly aren't Rusty with all driving skills right there. That was a 10 and it's an avoiding job and heads up driving and the rusty specialist team being i think one of the best at being heads up that's why we were they were second at spa we were just keeping on our trail and being a heads up driver look at this Oof, right on the brakes using that outside line using that little curbing to avoid it lost a place or two in the process but you know was able to continue on and that car doesn't have a lot of damage for being so far down and out 
Oh, and more disaster for the Virtual Motorsport team as they try and send it down the inside of the Hell Racers car. Take another look at this one, but this is an optimistic pass potentially here, Sumo. Yeah, optimism has been something that uh, all the teams and drivers have not been short of today, unfortunately. Uh, and th that up to optimism can work well at times, but unfortunately it's not been the case here today. And Virtual Motorsport, yet again, unfortunately being involved in another incident, and they, come, they are coming up towards the Hell Racers car. They're trying to make something out for themselves, as they should be doing, but perhaps not at this stage of the race. Perhaps you just have to wait out and see the light at the end of the day. And... And the rate, at which, the rate at which it's going right now seems unlikely that most of these teams will. Well, an hour and fifteen minutes. You need to knock out more wood. I think <laughs> uh, that's what I was going to yeah. say. An hour and fifteen minutes to go. I should find some more wood to, to knock on. But let's jump back then to this battle between second and third place. Lindsay Benjamin Lindsay has closed the gap to Andreas Olsen in front of him, and as they work down in towards turn nine, ten, this long left-hand sweeping corner. Gap continues to close right now. And this is a battle for the podium positions. But once again, these are drivers. They're going to have to come down onto the pit lane in a few laps time. So, Sumo, we are looking at it's going to be a two-lap stint. Uh, sorry, a two-stopper to the end of this one for the LMP cars. And I just wonder which of them has been playing the tire strategy right. Hasn't been using maybe some of the tire sets given how many cautions that we've had earlier in this race. And I wonder if some of these teams have got a uh, a ticket ready to go, a golden ticket in the form of a brand new set of tires ready to be whipped out for the last hour of racing action. And it's going to be quite interesting, Arjuna, because uh, in case we do get a safety car or something like that to switch things up, there will be certain teams having that extra ace up their sleeves trying to use it to their advantage. And we saw the RSO team, how, how quick they could be on fresh rubber. And that, I think, is going to be a significant factor. It could just end up being that one defining thing that... Uh, Basically, let like the rabbit in the hat, essentially, that you pull out and use to scare the other people or frighten them or surprise them in this case. And right now, the Hell Racers team are doing just that. They are fighting with the TNT team who just want to make that explosive move, which they are making right now by going to the inside, block passing them and getting it clean. What a fantastic pass that was, setting up the exit of Siberia Corner, getting the run down into Luki Heights and giving no option for Olsen other than to let off the throttle around the right-hand sweeper and give the second place up to number 81 car. We are entering pit lane window time. We saw that battle happening for second place in your class. Well, someone who's just come out from the race lead in GT is the 225. Down and off the jacks he goes. Back up onto the pit lane speed limiter for Richard Small. 31 seconds spent in the box, you can see trundling down at a very pedestrian 60 70 kilometers an hour as he waits to hit the button to get back up to racing speed you do have to use that longer pit exit there you can see using that left hand portion of the track and he's now going to rejoin at full tilt down into turn number one <laughs> full commitment there fortunately not on the colder tires that might be a bit more of a challenge for some of these teams to deal with but number 225 has come back out in some clean air there are full 70 seconds as things stands in front of Miniti Racing and the 278. So, Quasar Sim Racing in their Ford, Jonathan, looking good. I'm sure that's putting a smile on your face. Yeah, the only issue is right now is that, you know, they've been able to go about 50 minutes on the stint. They're going to have to pit again towards the end of this run or maybe even try and split the stints evenly halfway. Assuming, again, there is no safety car. If there's a safety car with 50 minutes to go, then in the GT class, it's game on. So one hour and 12 minutes still to go here then. In second round coverage of the Ivra Endurance Series, the four hours of Phillip Island. My name is Arjuna Kankipati. I'm joined for this one by Somil Aurora and Jonathan Burke hey. as we work towards the last hour. Sorry, Somil, did I finally say your name right? Perfectly. <laughs> Perfectly. Wow. It, it only took Hold about, on. what, four months of us working together and me hearing <laughs> you say it a bunch of times, but glad I finally got there. Uh, um, uh, my... Eyes literally shot up like, wow, this. I got surprised for a second, but nevertheless, uh, let's take our focus back to what really matters, which is the battle on the track right now. Yeah, and let's take a look then at some Race Spot TV replays once again. What happened to the Maniti Racing 278? They went off track, getting a bit onto the grass as they entered Luki Heights. 
Oh, don't go into the gravel. Don't go into the tire barriers. Fortunately for the 278, Johnny Verhoff has managed to collect that car before they made significant contact with the tire barrier. But Verhoff has lost about 14, 15 seconds as a result of that off. And Beniti Racing, who have been so strong here in Ivor competitions, now have to face the fact that Kinetic Racing Speed are right on their rear bumper, looking to try and get past once again as we jump back to the live pictures. Let's take a look at one of the cars that we've been trying to follow as they try and make a run up through the field. The Team RSO number 97. They're about 35 seconds behind your current race leader. However, Team Hoisingvelt, the number 48 that does lead in LMP, is due for a pit stop in a few laps time. The Team RSO car, on the other hand, came down the pit lane about 14 laps ago. So there is the potential, I think, for that gap to come down maybe in that final pit stop window, but... Like we've been saying, pit stops aren't the only factor here. Safety cars, an inevitable concern as the number 19 Hell Racers car down on pit lane, getting a driver change as well. Magnus Valstrom going to jump into that car and take it over for the next 70 minutes or so. And I think that concerns me most about these LMP2 cars is that where, where in this fuel window can we fit and where is it going to work out for them to take fuel and tires i mean we're talking about like 35 40 minutes of stint well, that only means like from here if you pit from here you have one more stop or so hmm. so it, it now now like the the big thinking caps and the big strategy caps can come back on if we ignore the safety cars for now because we've yet to have a full green flag stint and this is gonna be the first time these teams are going to be in this territory honestly so i tell you what let's quickly run down then the order across all four classes. Only two classes shown on our graphics as Hell Racers back up to racing speed. And off the pit exit they go, joining right in front of the Team Hoisingvelt number 48 that continues to lead the way. They've got a six second buffer over the rest of the field. Before we run down through the order though, let's take a look. There's been an issue for one of the I liveries car, Lewis Klinkhammer currently driving that machine, the 141 LMP2 car that's still trying to get back up to racing speed. What happened to Klinkhammer? It looks like it's potentially Siberia and indeed as we take a look at the replay this was contact potentially with pineapple racing as you go down into a very tricky section of the course and just light contact from the rear turns around the 141 Jonathan yeah they're not gonna be treating pineapple racing like a pineapple princess today there's gonna be a little <laughs> bit of screaming about that one from the Swedish team I believe that was also for position if I'm not mistaken so trying to be defensive, he gave him a little bit of room on the inside, gave him a peek, and Pineapple Racing took it, and fortunately that is where the collision is. Not a lot of contact though, so it would be okay, but definitely a huge loss of time. So let's run through the order then very quickly. Team Hoisingvelt number 48 is leading in LMP Pro, but right behind them, seven seconds down the road, it's TNT Racing and Benjamin Lindsay trying to claw back that gap. Third place, as things stand, Delta Sport U4K, 12 seconds behind the race leader, 5 seconds behind TNT Racing. A little bit of work to do for the Delta Sport crew as they try and get back towards the pointy end of the field and claim their first ever Ivra Endurance victory. Then in fourth place, let's look at the battle in LMPM. Adequate Racing and Neil Middleton currently leading the way as they dive down into turn number one, but just two and a half seconds behind them. That's the Team Vikings car, the 102, currently running second in that class. You then have to go back to ninth place for third place in the LMPM class and that's the car that just got involved in some contact pineapple racing the 105 they're about 50 seconds behind the net race leader and as they dive down onto pit lane they were about 40 seconds behind their class leader obviously things will change now that they're down on the pit lane let's walk you through GTE Pro then very quickly RSR Esport by G Performance currently leads but Jan Senkowski right behind them in the 248 Hoisingvelt machine, putting all sorts of pressure onto the 255 right now. And he wants to get back to the position where he started this race. Senkowski led us to the green flag after taking the pole position. When is he going to be able to get the pass done now out on track? 10 seconds behind them, a third place car. 284 Fisher Motorsports, the GT Pro car. One, another car that was leading or helping to lead parts of this race. They weren't out and out in the race lead as you see PND racing now down onto the pit lane as well. But 284 in a good spot, I think, as we work towards the last hour of this one. Their sister car, Fisher Motorsports GTM, leads the way then in GTM. 
The 385 has only got a three second buffer to VEC Sim Racing right behind them. The 372 currently runs in second place. And just two seconds behind them, their sister car, the 324, completes the GT and podium. So four podiums to look at, and we've just walked you through all four of them out on track. So pit stops are underway. Team Hoisingveld, the number 48, down onto the pit lane. Talk Freak Racing, the number 61, is also down on the pit lane, getting tires, as you can also see, is the 48 up on the jacks. They've already been stationary for about 51 seconds as things stand. There you go, finally off the jacks they go. 56 seconds is the total pit, st uh, pit stop time. By the time they get back up to racing speed, what is gonna be the total pit lane loss? About 75 seconds once again for the 48 car. So Sumo, one more stop needed then for the number 48 and it will be a slightly shorter stop compared to what we've just seen them take. Yep, this just means that they can go hard and push in the final one. They've got that confidence behind them. And for that final stop, well, they'll just be hoping that it goes cleanly until then. Because as it stands, well, they are slightly sticking out in comparison to the other ones. But nevertheless, you could either look at it as them being out of the cycle in a bad way or a good way. It's all about how they can make it work eventually. And more takers on to pit road. Delta Sport, U4K, TNT Racing and Adequate Racing all down. And that's going to hand the lead back over then. To the team RSO number 97. There you can see making the way down into turn number one. Down the inside of one of the Quasar Corvettes. Around the outside now of one of the Hell Racers BMWs. They're back into the race lead. But 19 laps into their stint here, Jonathan. So we're looking at maybe around five, six, seven, I think. Maybe laps for the number 97 before they're down on pit lane. So that next, that next and fight, rather the final stop for the number 97, not the next stop, is going to be slightly shorter then what we're going to see the rest of the cars that have just come out of pit lane are going to have to do. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see like where they put their final stop in comparison to the others. It looks like the LMP2s are trying to like math it out exactly to where like 35, 30 minutes to go, they'll be back out on track. As we look, RSR and Team Eichenfeld continue to fight for the GT lead, for the GT Pro lead. As we've had several takers already down on pit road that may need a stop. If you can stretch it out maybe to the 50 minute mark, might that might be their last stop but i don't know how feasible that is for either of them i don't think it's about getting to that 50 minute mark anymore i genuinely think you get to the top of the hour you start thinking about the possibility of a safety car as the team hoisting felt 248 putting pressure once again on the 255 as they make their way through turn one in towards turn number two this is where you try and swing out to the outside of the corner and and much like sunset bend which i was commentating a race at just a few hours ago that turn number two has about a million different lines that you can take and you know so, uh, Sommel, uh it's one of those corners where you never take the corner the same way two times in a row you know and yep. it's it's one of those corners where you really find yourself having to be very conscious of as you make your way through um every single lap because you can't afford to make a mistake there we've seen on a few occasions cars burying themselves into that tire barrier yeah that, that can happen so many times i mean i remember we had a formula 3 race right here for another series i was commentating and there were so many drivers struggling with their lines and yes on one side the camber can help you take that corner similarly but it's just tricky because you're coming across a very very quick run from the dune corner and you're, you're full of adrenaline and then just breaking at the right time, so many different lines as you mentioned. And just the fact that if you go even slightly wide, you can end up just drifting out into the grass. So th there are so many different ways to take this corner, as the same can be said for all the other corners here at Phillip Island. It's just the nature of this track. It's so flowy, it's so fast, it's so uh, naturally easy in the way it's designed that there are multiple opportunities, multiple different lines, and I think that is one of the reasons why you can see a bit of ambiguity in terms of ambiguity rather I should say in terms of what drivers should do or not do in terms of traffic because there are so many different ways look at this the Porsche going wide and still not losing time and you might be thinking here yeah, but they went wide right they should be losing time but no they took this corner more like a V rather than a U and that's just the way this track is there are so many different options to choose from there really are. It's such a fun track. As there's carnage in front, there's a crash oh, no. in front. Who is that? That's one of the uh, fiercely forward. That's the 34 car. Their LMP Pro entry has been turned around. We'll try and grab a look at this one, but drama in front of your GTE race leaders then as the number 34 goes around. And here's the race spot TV replay. Uh, Jonathan, walk us through this one as it's the number 97, the race leader trying to go down the inside here. 
34 was just trying to stay on the lead lap, just fighting for it as much as he could, and fortunately for him, just gets caught out. Maybe a bit brave by the RSO car. He was a bit far back going into Honda, and I'm wondering if he just impatient. Yeah, very brave, very far back, and I don't think Fuel Stay Forward was expecting that at all. Well, let's see then if we can take a look on board with the number 97 and Angelo Mikel as he works his way down in towards Honda Corner. Sumo, Sumo, just talk to us about this. This is a late braking opportunity as we watch this in slow motion. Yeah, uh, LMP2 drivers naturally have been very, very keen and on their toes to make a move. And Honda Corner is that opportunity. But again, another case with the lines, right? The Fiercely Forward team naturally being on the outside. So the 97 thought that there was a chance. But the chance, well, as we all know with hindsight, didn't exist. And so they naturally came back onto the same piece of tarmac. And we know when you have two landlords with the same piece of tarmac, it doesn't quite end too well. Man, you just talked about having two landlords, and I had a bit of a shudder go through my body. The thought of having two landlords is, is just terrifying, but nevertheless, 50 two seconds... Two tenants, rather. Two tenants, huh? That's the right word. Two tenants also sounds very, very terrifying as a potential uh, <laughs> property owner. I don't like the sound of that one at all, but 40 seconds to go then until we cross off one more hour. So three hours done, almost. One hour to go here. The second round of Ivra Endurance Series. Four hours of Phillip Island. The number 97, Angelo Mikhail, just got involved in contact, but continues to lead the way. And you're watching coverage here live on RaceBot TV. Follow us for more sim racing action across our YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch at RaceBot TV for more racing action. More racing action happening out on track as well. Lewis Klinkhammer, I see, having more issues. What's happened here? This is on the exit. There's a car off in the background as well. There you can see VEC Sim Racing. So this is coming out of turn number 10. And that iLivery's oh, car no, is... Oh, no, he's... He is beached. beached. He is beached, and this is going to be a caution. This will 100% be a caution flag flying, just as we were talking about the one-hour mark coming. He's trying his hardest. He really is. You can see the wheels spinning, the desperation in the driver, the wheels turning. I don't think there's much really you could do here besides maybe... Yep, there it is. There it goes. Yellow flag is out for the sixth time today. So race control is going to have a very, very busy day. There you can see the rear tire is still smoking. I've done this myself, not at this track, but at the Nürburgring Nordschleife where the curbs can be very tall and you can beat yourself on those curbs. And there you can see Clint Hammer finally going to get permission to reset from race control. Let's take a look at a RaceBot TV replay. What's happened here? You can see the VEC Porsche in front of them. Has had an issue very, very early on in the corner. And so actually, if we're going we're to have to take a, a, a closer look at this one on a number of occasions because there's two issues involving two different VEC cars who were both on the podium in GTE Am just a few moments ago. It looks like their sister car was off in the background. And, oh, that's, yeah, that's a hard, hard impact. And then the Porsche gets going again. And then when, yeah, when the LMP2 tries to get back on the track, it just doesn't work out. So we're riding on board. So here you can see no VEC uh, car parked midway through Lukey Heights. So there's going to be two issues involving these VEC cars. That's the first one. Nowhere for the 141 and Lewis Klinkhammer to really go. And he's going to get himself beached then as he tries to rejoin safely. He does a good job here. You can see he's waiting for that opportunity. It's just the misfortune of him trying to then get back on. And you can see here the car just bottoms out. Nowhere to go. And clink hammer is stuck and stationary what happens then in the background for the second of the vec sim racing porsches oh just around the outside as you see that's the delta sport u4k car i think who just got involved in some contact as well let's go watch this oh, one no. on board with them as they come up on the scene of the incident they're going to see the porsche 911 spin in front of them but but sawmill you'll see it as well further contact being made with the 33 in just a few moments time yeah, exactly. Delta Sport had quite the stint for once they came back out. And oh no, when that Porsche spun, they had very few places to go. They chose the right one. And then, how did they get hit from behind by that Corvette? I hope not for them. It's a big We're, lockup going in down there big, in the big lock corner. Up. Yeah, exactly. That was a huge lockup. Uh, it reminds me of what Carlos Sainz did recently in the Imola race weekend in Formula 1. Just, just getting out of it by the skin of his teeth. Good... Good awareness by Alexandra, right? Alexandra right there. I think he's just gotten away with one. There was slight contact made with the Quasar Sim Racing Corvette there, Jonathan, but I do think 
The number 33 car might just have managed to get away. They saw their death happening right in front of them on two occasions as they check up in front of the number 33 as they slow for the caution once again. But I think the number 33 car has just put themselves in a position here to potentially come home and take home the race win. We must also talk about caution flag with the last hour. It's also mixed up the strategy that little bit more. And we see a lot of cars now not able to come down pit road just yet. But I have a feeling we're going to see the vast majority of cars coming down this time around to make that final stop as short as possible, potentially. Even in the GTs, you might be able to get away with this being the final stop if you do a little bit of fuel saving. Mm. Yeah. So for, for the GTE and Pro and Am, this completely throws your strategy out the window. Like, this, this re, redoes it almost. I think they can make it through without a lot of fuel saving as well because the last I remember, GTEs, they could do around an hour, an hour and sometimes in certain tracks even an hour and three or four minutes. So I think they should be just about fine. It'll, it'll level things off, obviously. It'll level the playing field, nevertheless, but... So, caution flag back up in the air. And guys, just correct me if I'm wrong. Is this the sixth or is this the seventh caution that we've had today? Sixth. I'm, I'm very confident hey. about six. <laughs> well, six times the charm, then. Let's hope this is the final caution. Unfortunately, Jonathan, I'm going to put this blame on you firmly on your shoulders because we were talking um at the start of this we were talking about the number of cautions that we might expect and well didn't you say eight uh i don't recall i don't i don't, I don't recall to saying a certain oh. number I, I said four seemed low for, for your <laughs> expectations uh I, believe me, I'm, f I'm trying to find all the wood I'm, I have in here and knocking on it as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is your fault because you said eight cautions and we're right on track right now. Two per hour. So just two more to go if you're going to follow the trend out. Hopefully, we don't end up with those cautions. Let's run you through some of the retirements. We started with 54 cars taking to the green flag this time around. Unfortunately, one car misregistered. So just 54 instead of the full complement of 55 that we expected. And I am now counting one, two, three, four, five, six retirements as things stand. So RLR Abruzzi Esports, the number 14, the most recent retiree from this race. Then you've got the likes of AOD Racing Ferrari. We saw them flipped end over end. They've been trying to get some repairs for about 40 minutes right now. Uh, so they're probably done and dusted for this one. We saw the laps at racing team, the 169. They brought out a caution slightly earlier on. Heard word in the league discord from team representatives that that car actually was so damaged that apparently iRacing just refused to even put any more repairs to that car so clearly no hope for the 169 to get back up as you see cars diving down onto pit lane the number 51 world of sim racing iZone performance lmp2 car also a retirement from this race alongside the 205 phoenix racing esports we talked to one of their drivers about an hour or so ago about the incident that took them out of this race and final retirement the number one torque freak racing we saw dirk van tolden getting involved in a whole heap of incidents throughout today's action unfortunately they were the first retirements from today's race and in fact they've been stationary in the pit lane for about 103 minutes as things stand so they've been trying to get some repairs for about two hours at this point. So there's your rundown of the retirements from this field as things stand. So still looks like we've got 49 cars out on track and 49 cars that will prove to be a interesting challenge, I think, in terms of traffic for the last 50 minutes of this one. Now we're going to see some of the strategy playing a part here. Almost every GT car was down on pit road, but a handful of LMP2 cars down on pit road as well. So, interesting to see like, what they do. RSO, Hellraiser's Treachery, Nomad Sim Racing, RSR, Rusty Spatulas. These are all top guys that were running in the Pro and Am categories for the LMP2 class. And now, like also with the GT cars, are being, you know, similar. you said it, you, we can make it, they can make it to the end, but there yeah. are some that still stayed out. Uh, maybe they're banking on another caution, perhaps, in this particular case? Or maybe they were just down as well. Well, I mean, yeah. let's just be honest, yes. Uh, the, the, the prospect of another safety car is not the most unlikely situation <laughs> that is going to play out. If anything, the most unlikely situation, you two tell me if you disagree here, 
is that we nope. go to the end without another caution. I think that's the least likely of all the situations that we have in front of us right now. Yeah. No, that's for sure. That, that, that's for sure. And it's going to be tricky. I mean, they've certainly rolled the dice in this case. Now, we did see the last in being slightly, I mean, I just say slightly, but only slightly more cleaner in comparison to the ones that we had early on. So who knows, perhaps we could see this thing being the last final stin being a lot cleaner but nevertheless uh the one thing that we often say in oval racing arjuna cautions beat cautions and that could very well happen right here why did you say it why did you say it <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there is there a somewhat of a provision to eat your words back once again yeah we'll I, take it back in a <laughs> I think we need to go hit up the race bot time machine and try and rewind time and make sure we haven't placed a commentator's curse on this one 50 minutes to go then lights are still on the pace car so expecting at least one more lap under caution lots of interesting strategy here you know and I'm trying to just play this one out in my mind in the LMP2 category guys because with 50 minutes to go Let's say we get two more laps under caution here. So that's about five more minutes that we're going to lose in terms of race time. You start to open up the possibility that one more caution and you definitely only need one more stop to make it till the end. And there's been a few cars. You look at the likes of Team RSO. Nils Benedict has just gotten back behind the wheel of that machine. Now down in 14th place for the previous race leader. So there's a lot of interesting strategy here in terms of how do you want to play this? How are you thinking about this? next 50 minutes in terms of the potential safety cars and well to be honest where do you want to be do you want to be out there at at the front even if you might have a little bit less fuel than you expect or do you want to come down the pit lane to play your pit strategy the way you want to do it even if you sacrifice a bit of the track position so a lot of deter uh, a lot of decisions having to be made by these teams very quickly under caution right now And really, like, I think for the LMP2 strategy, this caution is probably the worst thing in the world because this really throws a wrench in what you're thinking. Do you want to split the stint halfway? Do you want to short stop and go long on the last part? Do you want to go long and go short on the last part? Like, it really, it's really going to be a huge conversation between all the teams in their discords and in their chats about what, what they want to do. VT cars, it's pretty straightforward. Most of them, I think, can make it to the end. We saw a lot of them down on pit road. And thanks to one of the Alpine Stars geodesic racing team members who has just informed me through our YouTube chat that we've officially been under caution for an hour and 12 minutes of the just over three hours <laughs> that we've been here broadcasting the racing action. So, 48 minutes to go then on the clock. 48 minutes and 55 seconds. In fact, as cars come down in towards Lukey Heights, let's see a replay. What's happened here under safety car? Did something happen to the Team 11 car, or is this just the queue of cars all just checking up as they reach the back of the queue? That's what it is. You see the lights flashing. It's sometimes you get caught out. We saw the VEC Porsche getting spun around as a result of checkups coming down the start-finish straight under caution, but it does look like, though... Lights are off on the pace car. We are going to go back to green flag racing this time around. Fielding control this time of Benjamin Lindsay for TNT Racing. And he's going to get a great jump off the last corner. Rockets out to a already a five or six car length gap. And you see in the background two and three wide as we come across the start finish line once again. PND Racing forced all the way to the inside of the corner with Pineapple Racing. There comes one of the RSR cars as well. All types of action as we work our way down into turn number one on our sixth restart here in the Ivor Endurance Series round number two from Phillip Island. We've already had a car off the road. Stephen Freibhaus in one of the I Livery's cars, I think that is, being forced off the road. But here's a battle on the edge of the top 10. PND Racing having to hold off Pineapple Racing as Pineapple Racing is going to look to the outside around Honda. Deep under braking, they're almost going to make contact with Torque Freak in front. But Pineapple Racing going to get the move done and move themselves up into P11. Good move right there. Lots of good, hard, aggressive racing that we are watching right here at Phillip Island. All the teams and drivers after the restart obviously being pumped up, having all the adrenaline. And that adrenaline does sometimes lead to mistakes Ooh. like that one. That was almost a monumental contact between 
the eye liveries car and that VEC Porsche. That Porsche just stopped on the middle of the track. Race Spot TV replay up on your screen now as side by side they go into Honda. There it goes. Wow, that Torque Freak Racing Ford really sent it down the inside. Forces the 324 off into the gravel. But watch here. Watch the rejoin and watch how close eye liveries comes to a monumental impact with the rear end of that Porsche. This is a, a, an incident that reminds me of a crash that we saw at Daytona a few years ago, guys, where a Ferrari just got collected by a prototype from behind. Fortunately there, Ferdos not collected, and the 324 continues to fight another day. I can see that entire group that, that went by. There was like five or six cars that had split him. There was a lot of panicking right there. As we see now, the fiercely Ford LMP Am is currently leading an Am, and he's under pressure from Hellraiser's Gluttony, but he doesn't want to give up the position. High Caliber Autosports is right behind as well, and those two are racing for the Am category. Again, there is Pro and Am, and now the question is, does this 134 let Hell Racers go, or does he just keep them there? Well, this is the portion of the race where you do not need any friends. You just need to hold on to that race lead if you're in the 134 fiercely forward. Matthew Crisp currently behind the wheel for them. They've had uh, a bit of a driver lineup change across their three entries in this series. They've got an entry in LMP Pro, LMP Am, and in GTE Am. Some Late-minute call-ups, uh, one of their drivers competing in the iRacing Rallycross World Championship today had to sub out, and they had a late replacement come into that car, but right now, LMPM lead, just separated by about one second. High Caliber Autosports and Simon Jacobson in fifth position in this overall standings looks to try and close the gap. As you look at Hell Racers, not trying to force the issue right now. 45 minutes ago, you do not want to get a late race penalty at this stage and really consign your hopes to the trash, trash pile. The last thing you need is a big bit of contact and a big bit of incident is now the Hellraiser's car getting a little impatient going down the inside of the Fiercely Forward 134. And this is unfortunately going to put him into the clutches of Simon Jacobson in the high caliber esports car. There he is behind Fiercely Forward defending on the inside going into Siberia. Good, good defending. But again, the Hellraisers are probably going to get frustrated because they want to go after the Delta Sport in the TNT racing car. They do not want to fight an AM car. Looking to the inside then through Lukey Heights, the 19 is going to send it, forces the 134 to concede the position, but now the 134 feels the pressure from the 131 machine right behind. This is the battle then for the LMP Am lead. They are slightly split on the strategy. Last time down the pit lane for Chris was 29 laps ago. Last time down the pit lane for Jacobson though, just 18 laps ago. So slight split strategy here. Be interesting to see which one plays out better. Out front, by the way, TNT Racing and Benjamin Lindsay. Lindsay is an LMP2 competitor that has competed in top level sim racing events in the LMP2 car for many a year now and trying to make a mark here on the Ivory Endurance Series. Gap now, two seconds, but Delta Sport U4K have a lot of work to do here. This is a team that's been making an impressive stride up the iRacing ladder, as it were. They started with a very impressive run in the iRacing special events for 2020, both in the Daytona 24-hour race as well as the Bathurst 12 hours. Here they are in Ivor competitions, a few new additions to their team. And right now, Alexander Gravoui in that 33 car, two seconds behind your race leader. There certainly is potential, but it's all about translating that down to the track at this particular stage. And can't be a harder job than that one at this case with all these cars surrounding you. And then the Alpine Stars geodesic one is also the one that we are focusing right now. A big train of LMP2 cars. Ralph van der Linden behind the wheel of that pro machine. It's had a bit of a chaotic day so far, but who hasn't? What can they do in this last 45 minutes? Again, when it's all said and done, it's about where you finish, where the checkered flag drops. 45 minutes to that, can they hold their nerves? Can they hold their composure and carve their way through and get the positions they really want to? Great shot down the start finish line. Look at that snake of train of cars right behind this main group as well. As they almost look to go three wide down into turn number one. That's Team RSO almost looking to go through the middle of two LMP AM cars, but thinks better of it. And right now, Niels Benedict is getting caught out from those two cars who make contact in front. And Team Vikings, the 102 gets sent around. And 102 makes contact with the PND Racing number 182. And more drama here as we look at another incident going through turn number two. Yeah, just two guys fighting hard for position, the PND and the Team Viking, and uh, again, time's running out. We're going to get more racy. I'm not going to be surprised if more and more of these incidents don't start taking place. 
But one place where they haven't started to kick off just yet is this battle for the LMP Am lead. You see Simon Jacobson trying to close in. Gap now, two tenths of a second here. So right now there is a battle here that's starting to develop for this LMP Am lead. You see on the inside is Fiercely Forward diving down onto pit lane. This time, yes, making their intentions well and truly known. And that means high caliber Autosports gets promoted into the LMPM race lead. They've got about three seconds behind them now to the adequate racing 158 that continues to try and chase them down. Let's go and talk about GT just a little bit. Look at the gap between new race leader and the 255. Neil Sent uh, sorry, Jan Sentkowski has managed to get behind the wheel of that car and make the move stick after the restart. He's now got a 1.5 second advantage and your pole position winner back out front and Jonathan back out front and trying to pull away in a very strong performance right now. Heischkenfeld did not have a good outing at Spa. There was the, the jumping start incidents. There was calamity throughout the day, and they didn't finish where they wanted to or where their pace was. And right now, like this is definitely a good showing, and they're gapping that Porsche, and this Chevy is going to be fast. And as we look back through the field, here's you know third place Fisher Motorsport. Oh, he's gone. Now he's back again. You know, two second gap and Fisher Motorsport has been one of the faster cars this weekend at this track in both the Pro and the M categories in GT. And it looks like they're, they're running strong right now for a podium and maybe, maybe they can track down that RSR eSport machine. 40 minutes to go. Still a lot of racing action then to take place. There might be still the possibility of an extra safety car that comes out to shake up the field. Let's look at the GT Am battle as well. So we've looked at the three top classes then. LMP Pro, LMP Am and GT Pro. What about this battle raging on then in GTM. There you can see the 334 fiercely forward leading the way then as the sister 134 car was doing in LMPM until they dive down to pit lane. They've got about a three second buffer over the Torque Freak racing forward, but we did see that contact that was made down into Honda corner with the 361 sending it deep on the inside on the braking. I wonder if race control is taking a look at Casper Valentin and that pass, so maybe the 361 going to come down the pit lane. Well, right behind them. They haven't had much luck in terms of car contact, but they're having great luck in terms of track position right now. Paul Van Loan back behind the wheel of the 313 No Luck EM Sport car. And, and Sawmill, this has been a car that has really been through the wars. They've been hit by, I think, the top five cars in LMP2 and still managing to be up here in third position in class. But they do have a challenge from right behind them. The Vector Sim Racing car looking to try and get the move done for the third and final podium position. I think as vanilla as it may sound, never giving up in an John race situation does make a huge difference. And it's not just minor John Cena fan that's saying that, honestly. But no, for the no luck EM, uh, for the eSport team, for them, they've been hit, they've been bullied, they've been kicked, punched, whatever you may like to call it. But they still are keeping it on the track. I mean, I know certain teams and certain drivers who have just called it quits right in the middle and saying, yeah, it's not worth to continue on. Let's just leave this race. But they haven't done that. They still kept on fighting and they still have kept it on the track. Good stuff. Good stuff indeed as we ride on board with 305 as he tries to hunt down the 313 for that final podium position. Let's go ahead and take a look at some Race Spot TV replays as I try and now uncover some incidents on my timing screen and we dive into exactly what happened first. What happened for the Pure Sims Esports? David E. Baker getting forced off into the gravel from one of the Torque Freak Racing LMP2 cars. That's going to be some heavy contact then for Baker into the tire barrier as they go in towards Siberia Corner. Another incident to take a look at, and it's someone that we've had a few looks at so far today. Furtos heading down through Luki Heights once again. This is where we saw him getting involved in contact. And here's going to come a send from one of the LMP AM cars, and we'll take a closer look at that one. But that's an incident that we've seen on a few occasions. Deja Vu and the LMP, sorry, the GTM get spun around by the LMP car. Yeah, that... The run down in the last corner of Lukey Heights, it's, it's not a good place to pass, especially since it is a blind corner as you head downhill. This is where you get the best view, and it looks like it's the one, I can't tell if it's an O2 or an A2, the one O2 diving down the inside, a risky move, and then, oh, the Fisher Motorsport car getting into him and spinning around, that's not good, and the hell is getting involved, it's a big mess into that corner. Yeah, let's try and take another look then at the after effects of all the contact as you see in front. That Fisher Motorsports car just gets sent around and they were running so well for so long in this race. That's going to be a podium position potentially ripped from the 385's hands as they continue to struggle, in fact, to get back onto the racing service. 
So that it's one a lot of, of damage to on the rear and the front. It is, and I'm looking through my timing screen. A whole heap more of incidents. So let's look at these replays then. This is going to be for HD Simsport. Nicholas Domino just losing that breaking point and just going deep onto the corner. So fortunately, they're not going to make contact with any other cars. What else happened in the last few moments? This is coming down all through the start-finish strike. And that's a big crash for the German Sim Racing .de car. Three wide, they tried to go across the start-finish line, and that did not work. Let's try and take a look at another replay here. Well, then he comes back onto the track, and then all of a sudden, there's two LMP2s that go out, and I, just, I wonder if he had contact with that kinetic racing car and then got boosted into that. I believe that was the PND 81. And there was just nowhere for him to go. He was just like a pinball in a little machine. So let's watch this one back from the last corner there. There you'll see all three cars. The BMW looks to try and get out of the way for the kinetic racing LMP2 car and then just tries to jink back to the right hand side and oh I don't like placing blame on drivers themselves for mistakes but that might be a self-inflicted one there Jonathan interested to hear your thoughts on this one I, I think he was thinking that both LMP2s were going to go right and then they both went <laughs> one went left and one went right and he was trying to leave room for both it's not much there was not much room between them and the wall the kinetic racing car brave to go Ooh. right there it was just for, for the German Simsport driver, Miguel Egers, it's it's just really hard for him to predict where those two were going to go. And more incidents on my timing screen to take a look at. I have a feeling that Egbert just missed that kinetic car in the background of your shot. Oh, that's a big incident. That is a big one that you've just took tail end of. Gabriel Roos has just been collected and the back end of that car up in the air as the number 83 car breaks for a corner. Let's jump up a little bit further back and try and look at this replay, but last 30 minutes of the race and the two kinetic cars side by side out of Siberia corner. What happens now for the number 83 and Gabriel Roos? He looks to the inside. It looks like the Team 11 hits Ooh. the Mantini racing machine and then... Oh, this is right in front of the, the leader as well. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my word. That is a big, big incident. One more look then on the RaceBot TV replay. We'll, oh, try and no. grab, we'll try and grab a better look at that one because uh, Sommel has just rejoined us in the virtual commentary booth. And Sommel, just talk us through this one because this is a disaster. So many cars get involved, in, including the TNT Racing leading car. Accordion effect gets pushed out the Maniti car. Kinetic comes back again. Boom! Gets bumped behind by the Porsche. And all that you see is just pure, pure pandemonium. What is about to create more pandemonium is not the direct results of this crash, as we see. It's from the perspective of TNT Racing. Are they going to get involved in this case? You know what? They actually just escape. No, yeah, they're just about. Just had to slam on the brakes in an emergency measure. But now, this should be a fun one because the direct result of this crash is a caution. Well, more interesting here. Look at that position then on the lower third, on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. TNT Racing, previous race leaders, now down to third. Delta Sport U4K and Hell Racers Gluttony have managed to sneak by as we go under caution for a seventh time today with 30 minutes left to go. Let's try and take a look then at what happened that brought out this caution flag. It wasn't the incident that we were just taking a look at. It might have been something else that involves one of the Team Vikings car. Here you'll take a look at the tail end of this one. We'll try and get a better look in just a few moments time, but oh no. Oh no. That is... Okay, I I'm going to refrain from making any comments until uh, we actually see this full incident then. So for the 102, what happens here? What happens? This is coming out of turn number one. They're already compromised. So I have to assume this is after that initial contact that we just saw them, uh, that we just saw. So what's going to happen here? Down in through Big Ben, they're going to go in towards the Honda corner. So Teelgard is going to lose out. Something's going to happen down into this corner. That's going to force him off the track. And then he's going to come back onto the track in a very bizarre manner. There you can see. Okay. No luck EM Sport and uh. the 221. That's L1 Esports get involved in some kind of shenanigans. We'll take a look at that in a second. But watch this replay now. What is the 102 doing? Kinetic Racing kind of trying to come down to the corner. and uh. Uh, uh, I, I will refrain from making too many more comments other than saying that is shocking from the 102 car sent the kinetic racing machine to Siberia and then the ooh, that was a uh, <laughs> that's that's a uh, 
I don't know if you can say anything virtually out the window, but I'm pretty sure that is what that kinetic <laughs> racing machine was parking to do. Let's see the Team Vikings gets back underway. You see TNT Racing, the overall leader at the time, go by. Oh no. Just tags the kinetic racing machine, who gets sent off to Tasmania. And now, Team Vikings car is beached, and here comes the kinetic racing machine. You won't. And stops Mate, alongside for a brief sec. We'll take a look exactly. at that in one second. I just want to take a look at this initial contact then between No Luck EM Sport. Another runner in this GT Am podium battle, Victor, Vector Sim Racing, the car they're battling right behind, is for that third and final podium position, and they both get involved then in the fisticuffs that take place. Now we'll take a look at what happens to the 283 car here. Jonathan, you noticed something. Just walk us through this. It's tagged a little bit right there, gets sent to Tasmania, hard contact into the wall, and then comes back to the beach, and I'm assuming is going to take, is going to park himself right next to the, yep, right there. <laughs> but waiting to get back on track, at least safely in that manner, so fortunately not going to be an unsafe rejoin. There was something that happened under caution, by the way. Racebot TV replay up, Again. up on your screen, and it's more just careless driving. The Samba Racing Team, who've managed to get the front end of that car replaced, have, well, their driver the, currently behind the wheel has been fortunate not to get more damage to that car. Uh, just careless driving under caution, unfortunately, here. Man, at this rate, someone's going to drive straight away into New Zealand. What are they doing? <laughs> okay, well, one more reset then. Seventh caution of today's action mixes up once again this pit lane strategy guys because once again you now have no idea what is actually going to be the big winner in the strategy battle i have to think someone like an adequate racing we take a look at them they're just three laps into their stint as things stand so they're unlikely to need another stop compared to the rest of their runners but everyone in front of them is at least 15 laps into a run as things stand so, what does that mean? Probably we have to assume that the top 13 cars in LMP have to come back down the pit lane, wouldn't you think, Jonathan? Yeah, they're probably going to have to come back down, and you can at least make it from here. So, if anyone was very like anxious or nervous about making it on fuel, well, if you pit here, you can make it. But if those that just pitted, this may be a blessing in disguise, depending on how long the safety car lasts. We've had a few that have lasted up to 10 minutes, so... How much fuel saving can these guys do? And Jonathan Dance in the Adequate Racing Machine, only three laps in, could inherit the overall race lead and the AM lead. Some more drama then here. At the end of another one of these Ivor Endurance races, the safety car always has to make an appearance. It's just at this point tradition. If you would, let's run through the order then quickly again under caution because well we've got nothing else really to do since we've looked at enough replays i think for several 24-hour broadcasts not just a four-hour broadcast like we have here today delta sport u4k then the number 33 car eight tenths of a second is the gap you see the 19 hell races car right behind them but look at the queue of cars tnt racing team hoisting team rso all in one grouping of cars so five of them Still in with a chance, I would have to think, of getting this overall race win. Any one of those five competitors really could take it. Who wants it the most and who is going to be the most sensible with traffic in the last 25 minutes of the race? Look in the rest of your field. LMP Am, let's talk about that quickly. High caliber autosports. They're on a bit of a contra strategy compared to um, some of the other cars that we were talking about. But talking about strategy, out the window. Most of these cars look to be coming down the pit lane now. And Sawmill, I think this is going to open the door for some of these drivers, potentially adequate racing, for example, to jump out to the race lead as basically everybody peels off down onto the lane. Exactly. This is the chance where the window opens for quite a few people. Do you choose track position or do you choose fresher rubber? Most of the teams have chosen fresher rubber, but there are a couple, remember, we do see them outside on the left-hand side, as we saw them briefly, choosing to go for track position. Now, this may just be a good idea, because Phillip Island is a narrow, tight, twisty circuit. If you can defend your line in certain places, it can work. But, that said, it's going to be a tricky one, because Ivra, as a series, they have said consistently, we would prefer not to have any cautions in the last half an hour. We will try and make sure that we keep it going green. Who knows? 
There is some confusion here on the exit of Pit Road because the order has changed. You can see that's the Delta Sport team that's trying to make their way out onto track potentially, but Pit Lane exit finally open. The Delta Sport team now down three positions. So RSO going to get the jump. So is the number 19. So no, that's number 29. That's the Hell Racers number 29 that's going to get the jump there as you see them making their way off the pit exit. So there's been some changes then on pit lane as a result of this final caution. And, and Somal, I'm going to pass it back over to you now. This Delta Sport team, they're behind Team RSO. RSO being the team that has had so much pace throughout this race so far. It's in a very delicate balance, I would think, because... RSO is probably in one of the stronger spots throughout the field, but then you look at someone like a Raf van der Linden. Once again, a late race caution has brought this Alpine Stars geodesic team right into the mix for a race win. However, nine laps into his stint, he will have slightly older tires. He might potentially have to do a little bit of fuel saving. I, I don't think so, but there is a little bit of strategy to be played here, and now there is a difference between your top three in terms of your LMP category compared to the rest of the field that came down on the pit lane. I think I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to pass this over to Jonathan because he also has a, a few pieces of crucial information that will help out with this very same argument. Yes, the Alpine Stars hang out, only nine laps into their stint. It's, it, it's going to be tight, but they might be able to make it without having to come down again. It, it's going to be something to see. And then those, obviously, those two AM cars ahead, Fiercely Forward and Adequate Racing, both only a few laps into their stint, both may be able to make it to the end with this caution. So this has really jumbled up the field. And also, some of those GT cars that stayed out, well, now it's even a, for those three compared to where the LMP2 cars finished out. Because all the GT cars could already make it on fuel. They didn't need to come back. So let's talk quickly about GT then, as you see more cars getting off the pit lane before that exit's going to close once again. So, Team Hoisingveld, the 248. There you can see it in shot. Four cars behind the pace cars as things stand. They do have the challenge from the Alpine Stars 201. The BMW is just right behind them in that train of cars. And unlike the 270 and the 225, no cars, no LMP cars in between the 248 and the 201. See the rest of your field there. Maniti Racing. The 278, despite major contact on a number of occasions, still up in 5th place. Fisher Motorsport, the 284 in 6th, with Hellraisers and Kinetic Racing, the rest of that class. We do have... I was just looking at my timing screen. There is a car that's gone off the track and going slow. Let's see if we can grab a replay of what's happened to him. That's Tony Baird in the Nomad Sim Racing car, I think. So maybe just coming down the pitch straight once again. We've had some more fisticuffs, potentially. But here's the RaceBot TV replay, and Jonathan, talk us through it. Oh, yep, stacked up. <laughs> we get a little bit of a Constantine effect, and takes to the pit road exit, but doesn't get all the way into the exit, and comes back out on track. So just a, just a hairy moment, able to keep it clean, though. Fortunately, able to keep it clean. So when we go back to racing, if we go back to racing this time around, we're looking at about 21 minutes on the clock left in terms of racing. Just waiting, though, to find out if race control needs an additional lap to sort through this entire uh, safety car process. And, of course, race control going to be very busy, I think, as they take a look in, as they try and reflect on this race, uh, Sawmill, because we talk about Ivra liking to do unique things. However, this is a unique challenge that I think a lot of the teams maybe haven't prepared themselves for in the right way. In terms of that mental attitude of recognizing that traffic is going to always be a factor that you have to be careful of. Yeah, that was inherent. I think uh, coming into Phillip Island, I was initially a bit surprised that Phillip Island for multi-class racing and... It's possible, Arjuna. I know you've done this yourself in your driving days that we can hold an endurance race over here by keeping things clean. But yes, I think it's just about adjusting yourself mentally because physically it's possible to go clean over here. It, you can still go side by side. Yes, people will end up losing time. There is going to be lots of stuff happening, but it is possible. So just doing that mental adjustment, I think, is something that, that we've been missing today. But with 22 odd minutes, I think we should have a fun one. So here we go then, 22 minutes to decide the second round of the Ivra Endurance Series. Adequate racing, getting a nice jump, but they do have to defend 
from the 134 fiercely forward car behind them. Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing, though, looking to get that track position away from the LMP Am car and get themselves out to a nice, healthy lead over the chasing pack behind. Let's look at that chasing pack as well, because they're having to make their way through the GTE traffic as the 62 car is already setting sail. Clean air in front of Vigo now. Sorry, in front of Van der Linden and the opportunity to claim his second consecutive Ivra Endurance Series win here. As we all work our way down in towards Honda, you can see RSO putting the pressure on the Team Hellracers car, trying to look to the outside of some of these GTE machines. One of those GTE machines, that's the Fisher Motorsports car, I think, trying to take an opportunistic move around the outside. One of the Quasar Sim Racing cars, as we see through Siberia. LMP traffic managing to make their way through safely this time around. Jonathan, 20 minutes to go now. This is going to be crazy. It's going to be chaotic, and there's going to be less give and take. These, you know, it, it, There has been a little bit of issues with traffic, but there, there's been some guys that have been very kind and very nice. As much space as possible. Now with 20 minutes to go, the packs all constantine together. Like, look, it's all on the line. It, it's going to be tight, and we're going through the end of Lukey Heights, and somehow, very, very minimal contact at the moment. <laughs> Around the last corner they go RSO down the inside of one of those GTE machines as he tries to close back that gap to the Hell Racers car in front of him. This is the battle for second place in the LMP Pro category as they've fallen a little bit way behind. Not just a little bit, they are eight seconds behind Raf van der Linden out front. Van der Linden has a very comfortable margin now to protect. And the Alpine Stars geodesic racing car knows that he's going to hold on to the gap that he's got. Delta Sport U4K, about three seconds behind this battle that we're watching right now. So they're about three seconds behind the third and final podium position in your classes. We've got an issue. We've got an issue. That's the Nomad Sim Racing car that's had to reset to the pit lane. Let's take a look at a replay here. But we don't expect this. Cars resetting without permission from race control. But there's a big issue there for Tony Baird. Like something on the hardware is just exactly. gone or something. No, his front front end seems to be damaged even before that has he had a bit of contact early on seemingly he well, has let's take a look then winding this back to one lap before as they head down into lukey heights jonathan walk us through this so tnt right in front of them again i was saying like they're all concentrating down in the end of lukey heights there's two lmp2s so we're all checking up uh, uh, a little bit i mean we we survived <laughs> it seemed like there's contact I think they're going to get spat okay. off maybe here into the outside. Just watch this side by side with the RSR by G Performance. Oh, no! Oh. Ooh, that's the Hell Racers GTE that spun in the last corner, and Tony Baird had nowhere to go and no time to react to that one. Talk about a shocking incident. Look very, very similar to that long 14 minute safety car period we had, and oh, just. Nowhere for him to go, and oh. I believe there is, there are designated reset zones marked on the track. I know they go over this in club sport as well as here in the endurance series. So maybe that far off into the distance area that he was in is a designated reset zone. So why I, no safety car would be out for that one? Well, the one thing is that none of these drivers actually know about those zones. Those are. That is protected information, if you will. Race Control does not want to give that to any of the competitors to have a competitive advantage. What's happened, by the way, to Garrett Thompson in the Quasar Sim Racing Ford? He's fallen through the field and has been off track. Racebot TV replay then as he works down into Honda Corner. There you watch the cars behind him, and he's going to get contact mm. there as oh, N-Race and RSR tried to go side by side three wide into Honda, and that 225 just gets shoved off the track, Jonathan. Not what you would have wanted to see. No, my heart hurts now. <laughs> it, like <laughs> they've been running such a good race, they ran very well at Spa. Just no fault of their own. Again, I said like Pins is wearing thin. A driver's gonna get aggressive. There's gonna be aggressive moves as we now ride on board with the Fiercely Ford machine. He's looking at Jonathan Dance. This is for the lead. Fiercely Ford won in the LPM last time out in Spa. Adequate racing finished well down the order. Jonathan Dance, driver I'm very familiar with. He runs actually in the 2K World Cup side by side. They're going into Siberia. Matthew Crisp looking inside, looking outside. Dance doing the best he can to be defensive, but how much longer can he hold against a very aggressive Matthew Crisp? Well, he's got his dancing shoes on right now. He's up for this fight. He's up for not just an overall position, a podium finish rather. He's also looking at the LMP Am win. Fiercely forward, trying to put the pressure, trying to get a second one of these Ivor 
Uh, LMPM wins as well. Getting a little bit loose off the corner is the one, uh, 158. That gap between them holding steady about four tenths of a second as they run down the main straight once again. More issues happening. There's once again that VEC Porsche that has just had miserable luck down through Honda Corner. What's happened this time around? Racebot TV replay. Samuel, talk us through this one. Okay, VC Sim Racing just going in a bit too hot at the corner and ending up on the grass. So thankfully, not having an oversteer moment and losing traction, but still, this battle is raging on. Matthew Crisp, he can be fast. He's well loved among his team. Can he get the position? He couldn't make it. Jonathan, you've just noticed this in our chat. Down from the race lead, Raf van der Linden to the pit lane. The number 62 car got that gap, but not able to make it on fuel and now falling down through the order. And this is going to be a bit of a heartbreak as well for the Alpine Stars Junior Desert Racing. They won at Spa. They have a nice points lead. But now they're going to sit in pit lane for much longer than they need to. Now the overall race lead and the LMP2 AMR lead it's going to be this fight, Adequate Racing versus Fiercely Forward. Adequate Racing had an okay outing at Spa, like they wanted to do better. And then Fiercely Forward obviously winning at Spa. So it's going to be a tight battle to the end. We are just about at 16 minutes to go. And let's walk you through quickly the battles for the race lead then. We're just, un just over a quarter of an hour still to run. Virtual Motorsport Ooh. have recovered here, Sumo. They're up back into this fight for the race lead. Just two seconds behind the team, Hoisting Velt 248. Right now, Michael Storm, you talked about him being in a storm slightly earlier. Right now, he's really got to get that pedal to the metal and close the gap to Sentkowski out front. Well, the interesting thing is that oh, stop that we saw sorry. right there. That's a big issue. Adequate racing off into the grass and fiercely forward LMPM has slipped through into the overall race lead. Race Spot TV replay of what's happened as they come through turn number two. Sommel, sorry, talk us through this one. Yeah, once again, fiercely forward goes down the inside, a classic block pass, but then again, it makes that slight touch, slight touch, a slight contact with the adequate racing team, and they find themselves on the grass. Far from adequate, that, if I may, but nevertheless, we take a look at this replay. Coming up, fiercely forward, Matthew Crisp using all the momentum and the draft. Look at this, he's like a hungry beast behind, but there is a bit of contact coming up through. Towards the Duan corner, he is committed. Half of his car is in there. Brilliant, brilliant side-by-side -side racing until this cutback from Matthew Chris. Fantastic till here. Backs off. Very respectful. And just a gentle kiss towards the end. Just a, help, think, uh, just a helping hand there. Exactly. I I'm going to say racing incident. Well, one thing that wasn't a racing incident, we just got word from one of the Alpine Stars team members. Jonathan, tell us about that penalty for the number 62. There's a penalty from issues way earlier on involving some of the lap cars it was a stop and go penalty and unfortunately for them that's heartbreaking it puts them towards the end of the field again those, those little mistakes we talked about them at spa the spinning on those safety car restarts as now we see well, adequate racing just take that position immediately back from the 134 that was Im impressive i didn't I, didn't I thought that it was gonna get left behind but no adequate racing saying i'm not done yet so this battle going to rage for the next 13 and a half minutes as we work our way towards the checkered flag here from Phillip Island. Battle then for the LMP Am lead, raging at the front of the overall lead. But they do have the Team RSO number 97 hot on their heels. And remember, this is not a battle for position here. The number 97 in a separate class, separate points. If you are the 134, if you're the 158, what do you do when you see Niels Benedict behind? You probably want to just move out of the way, potentially, and try and follow in the tracks of that German. Benedict trying to close the gap, trying to get a good run, because he's also got the number 29 Hell Racers car trying to chase him down. Watch out front as well. There's the move to the inside, four fiercely forward, side by side through turn one once again. But around the outside, Adequate Racing holds onto the position and more contact, more contact made. Adequate Racing is going to get forced off the track and RSO down the inside, sneaks by into first place. And Somil, you talked about that being a racing incident a lap before. I don't think that one is as much of a racing incident. Fiercely forward, trying to fight this one back though. They're being very aggressive at the late portions of this race. What have we just seen here? What are we just witnessing here in the LMP2 category? Let's take a look at this replay once again and nudging, nudging the adequate racing team. And the RSO just pulls a little sneaky. That 
I think it's just the pressure of the battle at this stage of a chaotic race coming into picture. Nothing but mental. This is nothing more but mental stuff. And unfortunately, they oh. just get together as they both try and set themselves up on their individual lines for turn number two. We are getting word, by the way, from team manager Ollie Slade for Fiercely Forward that the 134 gave up the position because they didn't want to get that initial move done with that contact. So they gave the move, they gave the position back to the Adequate Racing team. Unfortunately now, Adequate Racing down in eighth position and fighting for the third and final podium position in that class. Let's try and look at some of the other battles that are taking place right now. See the Delta Sport team going side by side with Hell Racers down into turn one. Over under attempted from Alexander Gravoui. He's gonna try that over under once again. The number 19 is gonna wash up through turn number two. Cuts back to the inside of the corner and gets the momentum done. So the 33 car still fighting for what is going to be the third and final podium position as things stand. Hell Racers currently second and third with the 29 and 19 getting two podium positions. The number 48 team hoisting belt machine also trying to get in on the action. Let's take a look at GTE very quickly. Team hoisting belt in pro up to a three second advantage now from Michael Storm. So Sentkowski back to the front of the field and once again showing why he had that pole position four hours ago. Meanwhile, in the GTM battle, it's about four seconds separating your two leading cars. Fiercely Forward does lead in that cat category. George Streetly, that driver who's had to jump in on very short notice into the 334 Fiercely Forward AM car. The gap extending to almost four and a half seconds to No Luck EM Sport behind them now as we work towards 10 minutes to go. So all of these battles are starting to become very well defined in terms of who is in front and who is in the prime position to try and make this happen. It's going to be all about planning your moves. Just you have 10 minutes. This is now a sprint race. You can throw all the endurance out the window, but you can throw the last three hours and 50 minutes out. This is where you bring home the money. This is where you, you get home the wins. As pro car is fighting, you can see the kinetic racing car that's been through the war is getting a little bit racy. You see the lights flashing. If these guys were up in, you know, America and in Europe, they would love, you know, this time of year. Christmas lights are going up. The light shows are on. <laughs> Well, you see the damage to that kinetic racing car still running in sixth as things stand. That BMW behind them not for position. Instead, the car that they're worried about is the car behind that BMW, the Fisher Motorsports GT Pro Machine, the 284, that's chasing down the 283 in front of them. David Baker for the Pure Sims cars had a big off. That's coming out of Siberia. That's the second time we've seen cars having that kind of an issue. Fortunately for Baker, he's going to be able to gather this one up. But let's take a look at a race bot TV replay. What's happened coming out of Siberia then for the number two machine? He's following one of those LMP AM cars fairly closely. He almost follows it into the wall. Unfortunately, he mounts that little barrier there, Sommel. And oh no, disaster late in the race for Pure Sims Esports. Just the grass, man. What, what is it with the grass here at Paul Ricard? Uh, and it just happens in the real world too. It's all so slippery. It's it's almost like walking into an ice rink with your regular flip-flops. It's not going to help out. And he just gets one wheel, or maybe two. Uh, we'll have a look at this replay once again. But all I can say is not much. And it's a uh, one-way trip to the Marshall Post. What have I just noticed on my timing screen? What have I just noticed just as David Baker was having issues? What has happened for the 134 Fiercely Forward car? Oh, He's been turned no. from the LMP AM lead by one of those LMP Pro machines. Very, very clumsy driving there from the Hell Racers number 29 car. Let's take another look at this one. And you can just see that 134 being patient behind the Vector Sim Racing Porsche down in towards turn number 10. And well, the car behind him not as patient and now watches Matthew Cripps down in ninth position has fallen to the third and final spot on that LMPM podium. You can see adequate racing rejoining right in front of him. So that battle gonna reignite, but disaster for the 134. We'll take a look at more replays as well because something happened to the Kinetic Racing teammates. First, this is for Gabriel Roos in the LMP2 car. So a little bit of an issue as he tries to get the power down. What happened to his teammate though in GT? Marco Mogren, three wide into turn one. Contact with the Fisher Motorsports GTE. And Kinetic Racing gets lost in that no man's land between turns one and two. Mogren has to find his way back out onto the track. There you can see doing a bit of rally cross action as he makes his way back onto the gravel. More race spot replays to look at though. What else is happening here? This is N Race Esports, the 199. 
getting sideways through turn number two. We've seen that on a few occasions. What happened to Elvis Banello as well? We've seen this 396 go through the wars. Is there another issue with one of those Hell Racers LMP1 cars? No, fortunately not in that instance. But we do have more replays to take a look at with 10 minutes to go. What's happened here? Magnus Valstrom in the number 19 Hell Racers oh, car. And that is third place in your LMP Pro category. He has just been forced off the road. That's what we're taking a look at with the RSR by G Performance Porsche 911. So much drama in the last 10 minutes of this one. The one car that isn't having too much drama to deal with, Team RSO and Niels <laughs> Benedict in the 97 Sommel. I finally can take a breath and let you guys talk for a second, but we've just witnessed basically all of our LMP podium results being changed in a matter of about four minutes time. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. Well, what's your take, Jonathan? I, I've been a little speechless in these last few minutes. I, I did say, however, it was going to get crazy. There was going to be no give and take, and it, it it's gotten crazy. <laughs> that That's for sure. We have... Again, LMP2s, they're going, they're no! splitting, all of a sudden there goes TNT hard through the southern loop. Oh, what a chaotic and action-filled race this one has been as Benjamin Lindsay is going to drop down all the way from where he was running into 10th place. Maybe even be 11th now as that's one of the uh, rusty spatula car that's going to make his way down the inside. Indeed, one more position lost as there's been a big crash, big crash at the Honda Hairpin. There you can see adequate racing oh, involved in man. this one with the Quasar Sim racing car. And Fiercely Forward 134 is involved in this one as well. What is going on here? And I am losing my breath and I am losing my mind. Race Spot TV replay then for Quasar Sim racing on the 225. Samuel, talk us through this. Ah, uh, it's just impending disaster. Oh. He clobbers him from behind. I'm, I'm sorry, what was this, that? What? He just I, clobbered him from behind. Let's take a look then, as Matthew Chris is the one that makes contact. Crispy, no. First gets squeezed by adequate racing. What is this, though? There is no logic behind that move. And that, quite frankly, I know Ollie Slade is in our YouTube no. chat and won't want to see that. But that, quite frankly, is disgusting driving there. We'll take a look at a replay once again on board. But there is no excuse for absolutely sending a car in a battle for a podium position like this. Watch this replay, Jonathan. Oh, man. And you see... He was told clear if he was not told clear, but he's going into a, a, a heavy braking zone, and you can't just be that close. And Jonathan danced at nowhere to go. There was nothing he could do. And then the poor, that poor 4GT that has been through the war is just... Like, looks in his mirror, and all of a sudden there's two spinning LMP2 cars right behind. There's nothing he can do. I am at a loss for words as things stand because the drama is just unbelievable here from Phillip Island. Four minutes to go here in the four hours of Phillip Island then. And drama all the way till the end. Fiercely forward, the 134 currently sits second in LMP Am as things stand. Let's try and take a look then at the battle once again for various class leads. Team RSO continues to have a very healthy buffer. Three seconds. Almost four seconds to the number 29 car behind them. So looking very comfortable for the RSO German-based outfit to get this Ivor Endurance Series win. We'll then take a look at PND Racing because they're running in third. Another strong performance for the LMP Am crew. They're going to take home another win as things stand, but they're going to go down the inside of the Virtual Motorsport. Another mm. risky pass. What are you guys doing? There's three minutes left in the race. You've got so much time behind you. Fortunately, the 182 is going to get through safely as he comes out through turn number three in towards Honda Corner, but he's got about a, a 10 second buffer to the Fiercely Forward car. The Fiercely Forward car now in second place and having to fend off the charges from the 131 behind them as well. So potential disaster for Fiercely Forward. Not just losing positions maybe from that penalty. They may be relegated to third place on the track. Let's look at GTE very quickly as well. Team Hoisingveld, 248. Three seconds is still the buffer, so it's been holding fairly calm. So a few laps left to go for Sentakowski to take home the race win this time around. What's happening in the GTE Am category? There you see your current race leader. The sister car of the 134 with a 3.3 second buffer over the rest of your field. So two laps to go then as Niels Benedict is going to come across the line to start one more lap. Oh boy, guys, let's just take a breath because right now things are a little bit relaxed in terms of the top end of results. You still have battles like we're seeing here between TNT Racing and Torque Freak Racing, but the battles for the race leads have all quietened down. 
However, we've talked about what a busy day. This is oh, maybe not quite and down right there. Is TNT racing forcing Quasar Corvette a little bit wide? But I have a feeling race control going to be very busy now, Samuel, as TNT looks to try and get past the Torque Freak car. Yep, he looks to the outside line, trying to get something done very cleanly in this case. That is a bold move. That is a fantastic move. That is a superb move, committed right from the very beginning. But coming back to the whole point about this race, keeping it clean is a bit like trying to start your air conditioner by banging your head on the wall. It's just not going to happen. Well, still good fighting happening further down in the order than one minute 50 seconds still left on the clock more issues by the way there's been a whole slew of cars off the track the most recent one was the torque freak racing ford gte casper valentine having a bit of an off losing about 13 seconds as things run tnt racing now past torque freak racing and looking to pull away let's take a look once again though back at this battle for your second position in lmpm and we're still in a bit of shock about what's just happened between the 134 and adequate racing in terms of contact being made they're still fighting now though high caliber autosport simon jacobson behind the wheel for the 131 team jonathan one minute left to go though we're looking at just a few moments left and a few more opportunities for the 131 crew to make this move happen to the outside they look down in towards turn number one the fiercely forward 134 may be suffering with a bit of damage has to concede the position high caliber autosports now up to second place in lmpm well, the thing that also concerns me is that, you know, with all, with all this contact in the last few minutes, like, a lot of these decisions can't be made before the race ends. There's going to be a lot of post-race and a lot of adjustments, so we should point out that, like, the, the, the official results may not be for a little bit. We're going to see, like, unofficial results. Right now, Fiercely Ford sits on the podium in LMPM, but they could be delegated down several places. They really could, but one more lap then for Niels Benedict in the Team RSO number 97 as he comes around turn 11 for the penultimate time, 20 seconds left on the clock. We were so close to this being the white flag lap, but one more lap then and one more opportunity for some of these teams to make their way up through the field. Let's run through your leaders as you see a car diving off pit lane due to a penalty. That was on the end race Esports 199. The one battle that is raging on here, though, second place in the GTM. As I'm taking a look, this might not be um, done and dusted just yet. Where is the 334 falling off my timing screen? What's happened to George Streetly? This is now the battle for the race lead, guys, between the 313 and the 326, because the 334 has just had to come down and serve its own penalty, I believe. So all sorts of drama then as we work on the last lap of the race. He's fallen off quite quite a bit. I, I was looking and I was like, wait, whoa, 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 what happened to the Fiercely Ford? And all of a sudden, it, it's these two that are fighting, and these two guys have been through the war. No, no Luck Esports has hit almost every single leader of the LMP2 Pro. They're side by side, a little contact going into do on the Quasar Sim Racing car. Sends it down in. There's a slower LMP2 car right ahead. He's going to have to check up. And now it's going to be down to the run down to Honda. Can the No Luck Esports car manage a good draft with flashing of the headlights? It's going to be all the way down to the line for these two. And that was the 34 fiercely forward car that was going slow. But checkered flag is out then. And for Neil Benedict, the race win in LMP Pro. Difficult race for the Team RSO team, but ultimately coming across the line out front. And they'll take a very healthy five-second gap to the cars behind in this class. Let's run through the rest of the classes then. Because for PND Racing, just a few corners to go then. In fact, no, to PND Racing already across the line down into turn number two. So PND Racing takes the win in your GT, uh, sorry, your LMP AM category. So 182 takes home a second consecutive race win here. In GT Pro, it's going to be the team hoisting belt 248 across the line and appears to already be out of fuel as they go side by side with the 270 car that finished in second position in this class. Let's jump back then to this battle for. What was your battle for the GTE race lead? Unfortunately, Paul Van Loan has been forced off the track once again. I'll try and take a look at a replay in a few seconds. But Yoni Walters then for the Quasar Sim Racing Corvette going to come home and take home the win in GTM. Let's take a look at this replay. And it's just losing the rear end of the car as he tries to set up a move coming out into the last corner, Sumil. An unfortunate one there for the No Luck EM Sport car, but unfortunately as well, they're going to drop, you see there, the AOD BMW sneaks through on the inside. They're going to drop down to third place in this class. They've just not had any luck 
half day today. They've just gone through everything, literally everything here today. And just to have that in the final moments of the race, I think that is cutting. And so many other teams must be feeling that very same thing. Just feeling gutted after this one. Well, what a chaotic four hours of racing then. And we can finally take a break and a breath up here in the commentary booth. As a second round of Ivra action in the Endurance Series comes to an end. You see all the cars there making their way back to pit lane. Let's take a look then at the final race results across our four classes of competition. For Team RSO and Niels Benedict, race win here in the second round of the Ivory Endurance Series. They take the win by over five seconds from the Hell Racers number 29 and Marcus Simonson. PND Racing, what a fantastic result again for Ivan Ferrari, taking home the third and final overall podium spot but taking home the race win in LMP Am. Delta Sport U4K, the number 33 car, they'll be in fourth with Team Hoisingvelt, the 48, coming home in fifth. Hell Racers, the number 19 car, comes home in sixth while looking good at one point for a double podium position. The rest of that LMP Am podium, Simon Jacobson for High Caliber Autosports will take home second with Matthew Crisp in third. We must point out there are race control decisions to come down that might affect some of these results. So these are unofficial classifications as things stand. Ninth place, TNT Racing. With 10th place, Torque Freak Racing. Jonathan, run us through the next 10 cars then in the LMP field. Uh, so Esport by G Performance. The 156 finishing decently. Pure Sims Esports has been through the wars. Rusty Spatulas mentioned much, thankfully, you know, Keeping out of trouble, Fiercely Forward Pro, unfortunately for them, further down than they want. Pineapple Racing, again, further down than they want. The Alpine Stars Geodesic with Rath van der Linden. A huge penalty coming at the end. Adequate Racing, they were in the fight for the win. They were doing so well and huge contact with the Fiercely Forward T HD Simsport. Well, another car that was through the wars and end race esports. Never really got up into the field much and was fortunately part of some of the late race calamity. So let's look at the last, last eight cars then in this class. A lot of drivers not making it to the end here. RSR Esport by G Performance, the number 55, 21st. iLiveries Vibe Sport, 22nd. Nomad Sim Racing, Team Vikings, RLR Abruzzi Esports, Laps at Racing Team. The world of Sim Racing, iZone Performance, and Torque Freak Racing not making it to the completion of the four hours of racing action. Let's look at GT very quickly then. Before we get into talking to some of our race winners and for the 248 and Jan Sentakowski, redemption as he takes home the win after the pole position coming for a second consecutive race but this time actually being able to convert it into the race win. Virtual Motorsports and Alpine Stars Geodesic Racing going to close out your uh, GT Pro podium before you look at the rest of your cars. Maniti Racing, Fisher Motorsports. The Quasar Sim Racing Team, the 225 Ford that had a strong run for much of this race. The Hell Racers 219, the Marco Mogren driven 283 Kinetic Racing Car, all in LMP, sorry, in GT Pro. Let's look at GTM very quickly then. And it is Quasar Sim Racing and Yoni Waters that will take home the race win. One lap down from the GT Pro leader. AOD Racing BMW sneaks right by. The No Luck EM Sport to take home the second step on the podium. And Paul Van Loan will be feeling rather glad that despite all of the action in that race, he'll still be standing up on the podium. Rest of your field and Usagi Racing, Torque Freak Racing. RSR Esport by G Performance, the 255, the fiercely forward Sister Car 334 that was looking like it was on for that GTM victory until a late race penalty. VEC Sim Racing, the 324 in 16th place. L1 Esports in... A 17th place with Vector Sim Racing, Fisher Motorsport, and German Sim Racing .e, DE rounding out the top 20 cars in this class. Look at the rest of the six finishers then. Fuck Autotech Sim Racing, the 396, 17 laps down. The Samba Racing Team, the 258 car that was blindsided by contact in front and lost the majority of its front end, had to take some healthy and lengthy repairs to that BMW. Team 11, the 211. 23 laps down after winning race number one in GT Pro. Not the result they would have wanted. VEC Sim Racing, the number 372 in 24th. AOD Racing, that Ferrari that we saw launching itself end over end coming out of Siberia Corner. That's going to be down in 25th place with Phoenix Racing Esport in 26th. 
So, that is the results then from the Ivory Endurance Series and the second round of racing here at the Phillip Island Circuit. Let's take the time then to start talking to some of our podium position finishes in this race. And I tell you what, why don't uh, Somal Aurora, you're st you are standing by then with the RSO duo of the number 97, Manuel Sudau and Niels Benedict. Manuel, I'll start with you with this one. How are you feeling after that? That was, it's a fairly chaotic race, wasn't it, towards the end? Um, can I can I just pass this to the man who's just really deserving all this? Why not? So Niels, <laughs> and speaking for Angelo too, amazing drive. Let the let the guys talk. I will tell you my my situation later. Yeah, what should I say? It feels great to win this. It was quite hard at the end because of the yeah the load safety cars that we had, but yeah, feels great. <laughs> <laughs> and Nils, I'll actually come to you for this one. Uh, all the chaos, all the safety cars, we saw you as well. Uh, you guys also been involved in all that for a couple of moments. Th what was it like behind the wheel of the car? Because there was chaos everywhere. Yeah, it was super hard uh, to pass the GTE guys. But also the LMP2 guys with the older tires was quite hard. Sometimes I felt I was going to die the next uh, corner because oh, it was... I, I can't say because... On the outside, you either you're gonna win or you're gonna die in this race. <laughs> well, there was quite a bit of the latter. And uh, Manuel, from your perspective too, in, in terms of how everything went here today, there was so much drama. We saw your team falling back with pit stops, then coming back up. Do you think just your overall pace in terms of fresher tyres was just something that gave you the edge? Because we saw you guys make some awesome moves, honestly. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we, we really try to learn as as much as possible from Spa mm. and uh, so we really extended our strategy board and we went through so many possible uh, ways and I think in the end we ended up like I don't know plan X or something <laughs> like, <laughs> we really changed it like 10 times or something because so many safety cars were deployed and you know I mean even for you as a broadcasters it was super confusing all the time and it, it was, was the same at the strategy board because would stop and you feel like it was absolutely the right decision but suddenly you find yourself back in P20 uh, but then you just check the the strategy board and and you just see like okay yeah you know like the four cars in front of you they're gonna stop in the next five laps it's okay so technically we're like I don't know P4 it's all all in and then you know everything we tried to do was play strategy as good as possible for the last like hour 45 minutes so we kept calm tried to to stay in our position we had the pace we had the drivers I mean you mentioned the chaos uh, to have some some drivers in the team able to to be that calm and really trying to avoid most of the things i mean honestly there's still a lot of things pending from from race control so exactly. not sure about if this is affecting something but you know in the end we really think we we try to drive as patient as possible we only have eight inks so it, it really shows that um our drivers did a perfect job and um you know what yeah. for the moment celebrate the win because it doesn't happen to to us often and and i really am so proud of the of, of the two guys and of the whole team behind it if I just may mention uh, Tino, Luca, uh, Niels Kassens and, uh, and myself um, for the team who are working on the LMP2 for months now. And it's just amazing just finally uh, get this thing out, out for a victory. It's really, wow, awesome, awesome job, Niels, awesome job, Angelo, awesome job, team. Great evening. Well, drink it all in, guys. You deserve it. Congratulations, Manuel. Congratulations, Niels. Thank you so much for joining us right here. Thanks a lot for having us. Thanks and, a lot, uh, guys. For the great broadcast and for all the replays. It's really a good coordination. <laughs> Cheers, folks. So that was your overall race winning duo for the Team RSO team. It's, it sounded like a lot of stress there, Subil, about uh, yeah. how, just how stressful that was in terms of strategy there. Very, very. Could have gone, it could have swung either way. Uh, could have gone left, right, and center, and it really did. Man, this was quite something. That was quite something indeed. So that was your LMP Pro winners then. And now Jonathan Burke is standing by with our LMP AM finishers in the 182 car. Evan Ferrari and Stefano Conte of PND Racing. Welcome. Evan, I suppose I should start with you. 
Did you think, with 20 minutes to go, you and the 182 team would be on the top step of the podium? No. Absolutely not. I, I was angry at the word after 20 minutes, after we flipped over. And I thought, okay, that's the end of it. We are going to get uh, like 20 minutes of repairs. And okay, we are done for today. I thought that. I thought that. Honestly, I thought that. Then we stepped in the car and then we saw it was only a, a minute and a half repairs. So that cheered us up a bit. And uh, the main thing then was getting the lab, the lab back and uh, it happened. Uh, after it happened, uh, we knew that uh, we everybody was gonna win. Everybody had a chance of, of winning, so we too had a chance. And then we just uh, put the hammer down. We tried avoiding collisions, uh, stuff, uh, and tried to be as fast as possible. And then the win, the win came. The race came our way. Even though after the last AC car, we thought, okay, that's gone again with the last minute safety car as happened in Spa in the first race. But uh, the two drivers in front uh, collided, uh, they battled uh, and they went off. So we, we collected the win. Obviously you guys were you know, sunbathing a little bit at the end of Honda that caused one of the early cautions. And obviously this question for both of you, how hard was it to navigate through the traffic and just pick out the strategy? At all, uh, really hard. We had some, we had some moments. Okay, now we pit. We don't pit. Uh, what do we do now? Uh, we start from the back of the line, having paid it, or we stay out. Uh, there was tense moments, tense moments between us, and with uh, Fabio also. There was the disaster driver that he helped us today with strategy and stuff. So. And then, uh, Stefano, obviously you were the one that was upside down a little bit in Honda. Did, uh, take us through, like, how did you think, like, you guys were able to come back from that, like, mindset-wise? Uh, uh, I, think, I, think, I think that was totally on me because it was my fault that we were right in the action in that moment because I totally, uh, I totally screwed up the qualifying. I had a easily p4 p5 in my category and uh, some bad luck with a slipstream with dirty air of cars in front and uh, i didn't manage to get a single lap together and that's my fault that's one of my uh one of my biggest faults uh, overall and then it happened uh, we were upside down and um what do we do now yeah we we told we hoped for the to, to stay um, to stay in the, in the pits for the least time possible. Only three minutes. Uh, we were one and a half lap down, and I, I just pushed and just pushed through the traffic, to, through everything. And luckily, when the leaders pitted, uh, the safety car uh, safety car gifts safety car uh, gifts and. <laughs> And uh, take his, takes it from you in this in this championship. Uh, it's like a, a god, the safety car, <laughs> gives gives to you and picks for you. So uh, we were back on the lead lap, and when I'm put in a situation of when uh, when when we are put in a situation where where we have nothing to lose, when we have only to recover, that's our our best situation and. I think uh, the penultimate stop, one hour to the end, I said to Ivan, so let's stop, let's stop now. Uh, what if a safety car uh, is, is called now? We pit, we were into the pits with our service and the safety car was called. <laughs> so that pushed us uh, pretty much forward. We were unlucky with the last safety car with the same uh, happened to uh, two of our uh, rivals. But then they battled and they 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 fall they fell back and at that point uh, there was nothing to separate us. <laughs> Last time around in Spa we felt a bit unlucky. This time I feel that we 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 deserved it totally.
Alright, well, thank you so much, guys. Pleasure watching you guys race, and congrats on the victory. That was PND Racing, the All Italian Team 182, taking home your win, PM. I completely forgot they were belly up in Honda at the beginning of the race. I, I, did, I made that realization mid interview. I was like, there's been so much going on, I did not remember they were they were the ones upside down. Yeah, that was an impressive fight back there from the PND racing team to take home a second race win here in the Ivra Endurance Series. Let's talk to then the GTE finishers as well. We've talked to the LMP uh, winners in both classes. It's now time to talk to the Team Hoisingvelt 248 guys. And Sumil Aurora is standing by with Jan Sentakowski and Mats Hotzfeld. Uh, Jan, firstly, what what a chaotic race this was. How, how did it go from your perspective? There was, I think, the early warning that came in for the incident at the start of the race and all the drama, all the crashes. Can you just sum it up? For what, what was it like for you? Uh, it was chaotic. Yeah, I think that's the right word. Um, at the start, yeah. Another infringement there. I think I just accelerated one or two meters too late today. So after starting too early last time, yeah, no, the opposite. Um, yeah, then quite a good first stint. And then go over the car to uh, Martin and it all went wrong. And he got four, hit from behind four times, uh, mm. spun around three times uh, by that. Um, yeah, and then we well, had some damage at the rear. was a bit twitchy, the car, out of the corners. Um, especially the fast ones, like uh, second to last corner. Uh, when the car was in front, it was sometimes a bit snappy, and, and I, or we had to work really hard uh, to to not lose the back end of the car. Mm. Uh, but yeah, overall, the the expected tire degradation wasn't here, so yeah, we just used two sets of tires today. Um, so yeah, I think that maybe saved us some time. And the last end, uh, even with the old ones, I think the car behind us uh, had some fresh rubber, uh, so it first tried to pull away a bit. And then just backed off to to save the tires to not get a yeah drop off at the end. So yeah, really really happy with the result. P1 didn't expect that after being nearly a lap down <laughs> in the middle of the race, but yeah, safety cars can change a lot. They really can. And Matt, uh, a question to you about the safety cars: just how much did they impact you? And finally, how did you come back and get this win? Because it got a bit too scary at certain points. Yeah, I think uh, Jan said it all. It was really, really a mess for me in, in the second stint. Um, fortunately, the car was still intact and we could yeah, keep our pace. And yeah, some other incidents uh, that brought out the, the safety car played in our, into our hands. And so, yeah, with a decision not to change tires twice um mm. we were able to fight to, to to still fight for for the win and yeah Jan did, did a great job um saving tires saving fuel that we could get to the end uh, with the last uh, after the last caution and yeah great win in the end and yeah really good and Jan uh, just to come back to you finally what a win it was for Team Hosting. Well, it got very, very tricky at certain points and it must be very satisfying, isn't it? And who would you like to thank for this one? Any team members, any family members, sponsors? <laughs> well, uh, definitely Matt for, for running the race today with me. Um, I think he just started to, to run the GTEs after a long time uh, at the beginning of this week. So yeah, put in some time, uh, some laps. Um, did a yeah, good job today. I mean, he got hit, unlucky, so... Yeah, just didn't went the way he wanted, um, though. And uh, yeah, another thank you to, to the rest of the team, uh, to Marcel, who's managing all the events. And uh, yeah, Heusingfeld for, for making this possible to participate. And as well to, uh, yeah, every one of the series organizers. And I really feel sorry for the uh, race control guys today. They they still have some work to do, so <laughs> quite yeah, keep up the work. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you so much, Jan. Thank you so much, Mats. Once again, many, many congratulations on the win. And we shall see you up for the next round. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And folks, who was the winning team in the, in the GTE Pro category? The Hurstingwell 248. And what a win it was.
And I think that's the first race that I've ever managed to pronounce their team name perfectly the entire broadcast. So <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. But now, Jonathan, you're standing by with our GTE AM winners, the number 326 Quasar Sim Racing guys. Aaron Eccles and Johnny Waters in with me in the booth for the Quasar Sim Racing. And did, did you guys think at the end that you guys were going to come home with the GTM win? You were fighting with the Moloch Esport team who, I don't know if you know this, I think got into almost every LMP2 Pro leader. How, how was it like that up there? How chaotic was it for your guys? Given, given the fact that we, we started decent and we, we at one point we were the last car in the field. And when I was, I had your guys' broadcast up, I was watching the race, Egg and Johnny through, and they said, well, the, the lead, leader was on pit road. It's like, we, we actually got this? Wow. Like, it was such a roller coaster up and down all day long. It was so much fun. And you guys, you know, didn't come home clean. There's a little bit of contact on that <laughs> uh, Corvette. Like, how, how chaotic was it out there for, for both of you guys when you were behind the wheel? And how much how much damage and incidents do you think you guys have racked up during that one race? Uh, I think we walked away with about, I think maybe 12, 14x. A lot of zero x contact, which was good. Uh, not a lot of, not a lot of cutting of uh, damage to the car itself. We still had great straight line speed. Johnny put in one hell of a stint at the end to put us in that position. Can't thank him enough. If he can get his mic working, God love him. <laughs> Yeah, you really did put an end. Uh, that's an end. You said, uh, Johnny, Johnny, your uh, mic not working properly at the moment. <laughs> no, this is the first time trying to use TeamSpeak, so it's uh, been a been an interesting go trying to get this to work. And then. Uh, talk us through like the strategy, but there was so many safety cars, uh, and obviously towards the end it became really easy with that safety car with about 50 to go. Strategy was out the window, but you know how beginning at the start of the day, how often did your guys' strategy change? Uh, we tried to stick to it the best we can. We, with only having two sets of tires to change there for the entire race, it made things a very interesting. But safety cars really worked out to our in our favor, especially at the end there. We we were really close to having to make just a splash and dash at the end and that safety car literally saved our day which was fantastic for what happened all right anyone you want to thank any team members any other sponsors out there all the team all the team drivers uh garrett the team owner richard johnny of course did a fantastic job all day everybody on the discord in the chat egging us on and congratulating us it's it's pretty cool to be a part of right now Congratulations! I was, uh, I'm glad you guys were able to get home the win. I was in and hoping for that, uh, <laughs> that four GT. It's, it, it was my personal favorite. It's one of the only GTs in the field. But thank you guys so much. No, thank you guys. You guys put on an awesome show. All right. That was the. Is our sim racing drivers Aaron Eccles and uh, Johnny Waters? Fortunately, Mike not working. And they were the winners in your GTM category. So winning interviews then done and dusted. Team RSO in the LMP Pro. PND Racing in LMPM. Team Hoisingvelt, the 248 in GTE Pro with the 326 Quasar Sim Racing Corvette coming home in the GTM winning position. So guys, an exciting race then. Four hours of action done and dusted. Let's take a look at our Race Spot TV schedule here for the Ivory Endurance Series. We've got a little bit of a break now. November 7th, we've just finished the four hours of Phillip Island. But, Samuel, we go from um, what was a very entertaining slash chaotic race uh, to uh, an equally chaotic track. We go to the Barber Motorsports Park. Uh, very old school, very similar in terms of the amount of runoff area available <laughs> for our competitors, aka not much at all. And an even shorter race that I think is going to make the stakes that much higher for all of the teams. Well, we, we commented on a lovely IndyCar race that we had here at Barber, I think around a couple of months ago. And if there was one thing that we learned from there, it was that good driving is actually possible at Barber. Even though it may be IndyCars that are much, much faster than this one, 
it is possible. So uh, apart from the debacle that we had here today, don't you worry folks, Barber may be tighter, it may be twistier, it may not be the best circuit in the world for LMP2s, but it is possible. And after the race of tonight, that's the one thing that everyone would want to hear. And I mean, let's just expand on that one, Jonathan. You look at the rest of your schedule, you've got four hours at mid-Ohio, which I'm sure is going to be equally chaotic in terms of the amount of runoff available. But then we go for round number five, the five hours of VIR. And not just uh, your regular layout at VIR, we're going to be using the Grand West layout, which I like to often describe it as the Nürburgring Norschleife uh, <laughs> of the US. And you've got this great infield twisty segment, but I think that we saw a lot of trouble with traffic this time around. That round, especially five hours of action there, is going to be just as interesting from a traffic management standpoint. It's a bit longer of a circuit at least, and not a little bit wider in some areas, not so wide in other areas. So traffic management there at VIR are going to be key, but then we look at those final two rounds, and something we noted at the beginning, about uh, unique about anything above six hours, well, there's double points involved. At Imola and Montegi, there will be uh, points given out, halfway points through those races. So as you know, key as some as this middle winter stint is, that spring stint at Imola and Montegi going to be really, really, really crucial. And of course, you're pronouncing it correctly, the Montegi. For those who are unaware, uh, Honda built and paid for the Montegi circuit, so. Uh, uh, a fan name for the circuit, Montegi, will head there for 10 hours of racing action. It's not an uncommon track here on the iRacing service for endurance racing. However, going to be a fun race to close off this Ivra Endurance season. The eighth season of competition for the Ivra Endurance series. Before we go, one final reminder. Follow us live on RaceBot TV for more sim racing action can catch us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Twitch. And we'll be back in just over an hour's time for another broadcast here live on RaceBot TV. If you aren't already subscribed, do do that. You can also hit the bell button to keep up to date with our various broadcasts across all of the various series that we cover here live on RaceBot TV. So that's going to be it then as we wrap up our coverage of the second round of the Ivor Endurance Series and the four hours of Phillip Island. An entertaining race filled with caution. Seven interruptions to the racing action. But here we go then as we finally wrap up the coverage. For myself, Arjuna Kankipati, I've been joined for this one by Somil Aurora and Jonathan Burke. TV cameras, as always, provided to us by Istvan Ballo of Track Cams 22. And additional car cameras provided by our very own Tyler Maxson. Live timing and scoring provided to us by our partners over at timing71.org but for now we'll see you in a few weeks time don't miss the Ivor Club Sport Series as that returns for round number two on November the 21st but until the start of December the Ivor Endurance Series say so long and enjoy the rest of your weekend <laughs>